I'm the kind of guy I like telling people what I'm doing. I'm just gonna keep buying more supercars, I'm gonna just keep buying more supercars, like all these things. It's like, I like telling people I'm gonna do this and that and then actually make it happen. Go, go to a foreign country. I don't know, just have fun. Rent a car, rent a fucking BMW in Colombia and just drive around like a psycho. Try and sell some drugs. You know, get involved in the coke game. Do something, do action. Dinosaurs didn't exist. <laughs> hey guys, my name's Craig, and in today's podcast, we're gonna be doing an interview with Hassan, AKA Mr. Overpaid. We're gonna be going into his background, what he did right in the beginning of his like online business journey, yep. what he came up, did on the come up, position he's in now, what he's gonna be doing in the future. So Hassan, where did you originally grow up and how did you originally get into online business or business in general? Yeah, what's up guys? So I'm 23 years of age. I was born in the Midlands in England. I've lived there my whole life um, until I went to uni. I went a bit north. I went to Loughborough University. And then after that, I got kicked out of uni. And then I was traveling the world for two years, two to three, two and a half years. And then I basically now found myself in Dubai. I've been here for six months and now I'm, I've li I live here now for basically the last six months. So, and I see myself being here for the foreseeable future for sure. So like going back to uni, got kicked out of uni. How and why did you get kicked out of uni? Was uni good for you? Was uni super bad for you? Did you want to get kicked out? And kind of how did your family deal with that as well and friends? Yeah, so I got kicked out of uni for being into a, in a fight. By the way, this is super weird talking in the microphone, guys. I'm normally used to just doing voice notes. But yeah, I got kicked out of uni for getting into a fight in Freshers, and then they didn't tell me that I got kicked out of the fight all the way until the end of uni. So that whole year was effectively wasted. So we'll get onto that later, why that affected me and why that annoyed me, all that kind of stuff. But yeah, it was just a fight in Freshers. You know, when you just, you've had a bit to drink, you have a scuffle with someone, and then one thing led to the next, I punched him. Well, it was just a fight, right? I punched him. Four of his teeth came out. I didn't think too much of it. So I went back to the dance floor and then I told, I'm gonna miss a couple parts of the story out, but I went to the dance floor and then after that, I said to my friend, this is gonna be a bad night, let's get out of here. What happened is we were walking outside of the club and the security pulled us in. Long story short, they had to call the police. I actually stayed in jail that night. So yeah, that's quite an interesting part. A lot of you guys don't know about this. But then I remember staying in jail for the night and then I didn't think too much of it. I was like, all right, let me go back to uni the next day. I didn't think too much of it. And then what ended up happening is seven months later, they used that basically to get me out of uni. We can maybe go back to the story later on in the podcast, but that's the overall reason. But you being kicked out of uni obviously has worked out very, very well multiple years. Yeah, so I got kicked out at the end of first year. And then I would have been in second year, placement year, and then fourth year. So I, they, they saved three years of me being at uni. So it was the best decision ever, 100%. So after, um, after being kicked out of uni, you said you went traveling. Were you working while you were traveling? What did you do? Did you get a retail no, job? No, no, no. So I, I, didn't, I didn't travel after uni. I traveled before uni in the gap year. So I had a gap year after school, before uni. After uni, as soon as I got traveled, my mindset was I need cash flow. A lot of you guys who've already been following me for a while, you know my mindset's always cash flow, cash flow, cash flow, cash flow over anything else. I don't care how much money I have in the bank as long as I have cash flow. That was always my mindset. So. Not as much then as it is now. Now I really understand it's about cash flow. But back then my mindset was, okay, I just need to get any job to get some money coming in. So my plan was to just get a job at Tesco's, right? So you guys in America, Walmart's or Wendy, Wendy's? Walmart, same shit. America's, supermarket, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, supermarket. And my plan was to just get any easy job at the cashier, just scan, scan, scan items, 300 pounds a week, just to get some money coming in. Because if I have money coming in, I can invest it in books, courses, mentorship, something like this. That was my plan. So I was, going for a sale, I was going for a supermarket job. I couldn't find any, but I was just in the middle of applying for jobs. And then my friend one day came back from hockey in uni and he told me, look, I have a sales job for you. I'm like, okay, cool, what are we selling? He's like, boilers. I was like, boilers? And then he walked me through the process. He said, yeah, you just sell boilers. It's a government scheme, this and that. And I was like, okay, it's better than nothing. And also at this point, I'd heard loads of people say, get in sales, get in sales, get in sales, get in sales. I heard so many people just say, get in sales. Even Tate, right? Tate used to say this all the time, he's like, get in sales. I was thinking, okay, I might as well try this. It's better than nothing. So then I started off with this and for a while I was just making no money from this because I mean, how much detail should I go into in these questions? I can talk for hours. A lot of you guys know this. I think you should touch on the topics, try and provide value because obviously there's a lot of younger guys watching 16, 17, 18 in a reasonably similar position. Maybe they're like, oh, I'm not sure what to do. I'm not sure. Should I get a sales job? Should I leave uni? Should I stick with uni? Like. Do you regret any of the decisions you made back in the day when you obviously got kicked out of uni? Did you, like, back in that moment, should you have gone back into uni? Like, do you regret anything back about those beginning kind of couple of years when you were 
like um, around 18, 19. I mean, I can't regret, I mean, I don't regret anything really, but I can't go back in the whole uni thing because it was, it was a fight on a random night out. I can't really change that. But the only thing I would have changed going back is I wish I just moved quick with everything I knew. I wish as soon as I realized that sales was good, I should have gone even harder onto that thing. And at the time I knew nothing about online business. People would always tell me, oh, online business this, online business that. I knew nothing about online business. When I say I knew nothing, I mean I knew nothing. We can get into that later as well. I don't know, like I said, I don't know how long you want me to talk on each point. But I remember as soon as I got kicked out of uni, I had so much frustration and so much anger because think about it, I had the gap year. One year just basically partying, going gym, just having fun. Then that whole year in uni, I went to basically zero lectures. I went to like, in the whole year, or maybe I went to 10 lectures, maybe 15, whatever. The point is I went to basically no lectures. And then got kicked out of uni. I remember just thinking, what the fuck? Two years of my life have just been taken away like that. I was just super, super frustrated. And also I learned, to, I learned a lesson being kicked out of uni. I learned that no one actually gives a fuck about you, right? When I was in uni, everyone was your friend. I was super social, everyone knew me. I felt like, I felt cool, right? But then as soon as I got kicked out of uni, no one's really checking in on you. Because at the end of the day, you're a full grown man. I'm not expecting people to cry for me, but I was expecting people to say, yo, Hassan, what are you working on? What is it you're doing? But people are just so focused on that party they're going to. Where do they get their next joint from? Where do they, where's, you know, where's the next bit of fun? I literally had the same thing in, in kind of high school, secondary school as well. Like there was some problem with problems, I got in some trouble and then all my friends kind of left me and you kind of realize, it's good you realize that at a younger age though, some people don't realize that until they're 25, 30 that really no one's really your friend, right? Things like this, especially in school actually. I think it's just that as a guy, it's like you're only, you're only really liked when you're very valuable or when you're useful. So if you're going to the parties, you're fun, you're providing entertainment, you're providing fun, you're gonna be liked. But then when you get kicked out of uni and now you're not allowed, because I wasn't even allowed back on campus, they put like a restraining order on me from going to that campus. So I couldn't go back to the campus, it was pretty fucked up. So I remember just being super frustrated because I'd be on Snapchat and I'd see all these people having parties. And I remember thinking like, what the fuck? Like, I used to go to these exact same parties. And now it's like, I can't go. So I remember just being super frustrated thinking, okay, I have to make money now. Like, I couldn't sleep. I couldn't sleep. I couldn't talk to anyone. I didn't want to do anything. All I want to do was just make money. And I knew nothing about making money back then. So things can change quick. So it's really a complete and utter blessing in disguise. You oh, it's the best thing that ever happened to me. If I was in uni right now, I'd be, I think I would have just finished uni. I think okay. it would have been three years. Yeah. yeah. I would have just finished uni in June, 2022. Yeah. And yeah, I would have been what? 30K a year, 35K a year. So from being kicked out of uni, I was just gonna say one more point, my bad bro. I was gonna say one more point. I was gonna say, I always said to my mum in the gap year, I said, I'm not gonna finish uni. I said that to her all the time. I said, I'm not gonna finish uni, I'm not gonna finish uni. And it wasn't that I had anything against uni really. It's just, I had this feeling I wasn't gonna finish uni. Because I kept saying it, it ended up happening. Now the way I got kicked out, I wasn't expecting that. I thought I was just gonna drop out. But then being kicked out forced me to then make money. And then also it kind of taught me how in the real world there are just consequences for your actions. In school, you could do anything and be fine. I remember people would sell drugs from time oh, to yeah. time and it's like, they'd get away with it in year nine. But out here in the real world, it's you punch one guy because all I did was punch him once. And that's what in the end saved me from going to jail because they said there's only one punch, you've not got anything on your criminal record. So it just taught me that things have real world consequences and I was like, okay, I gotta, I gotta be serious now because I'm 20 years of age now, I gotta, I gotta fix my life up. And my mom was super worried about me for a while. She's saying, oh, are you gonna reapply to another uni? I remember thinking, fuck this. Like I just had a gap here, then I had a first year of uni. It's just a complete waste of time. So yeah, let's move so on a bit. So you got kicked out of uni, then you started selling boilers. Yeah. What kind of led you to traveling around while you were doing that? Like what? No, so that's what I'm saying, traveling. bro. I was saying I traveled after I'd already been doing the whole boiler thing for like a year. Okay. Yeah, so 2019, September was when I started selling boilers. And then 2020, July to September time was when I started kind of traveling more. So for that first year, I was just in the trenches learning as much as I could about online business, offline business, selling, marketing, speaking to people, all that kind of stuff. Trying to meet as, much, as many people as possible. So in 2020, February, I met Tate. The month later, the whole COVID thing happened in England. Remember when that happened? It was like March what? March the 20th. Remember, yeah. I remember being with a chick in the car, we were going for a drive. And I remember she was saying to me, oh, do you know tomorrow like, the whole COVID, the lockdown thing's happening? I was like, what, what do you mean? like? She's like, yeah, they're gonna lock you inside your house. I was like, what do you mean lock you? I'm not like an animal, I'm, I can just leave. She's like, no, no, they're gonna lock you inside the house, you can't leave. I was like, how do you buy food? She's like, oh, you can go to the supermarket. I was like, you can go to the supermarket, but you can't go see people? So it didn't make sense to me anyway. I just kind of thought she was joking. Then I checked the news there and then on my phone. And I actually said that we were locked in. 
So that whole two, three month period was just at home and I couldn't even knock on boilers because our sales manager said to us, you can't knock on boil, you can't knock on the doors because it's like against the government scheme, blah, blah, blah. So those two, three months, I was just trying to learn how to make money online. But it was like six, seven months after that, that's when I started traveling because I'd, I'd been making a bit of money then. And in the summer of 2020, I was affiliating. I affiliated a bit for Tate. I made like nine, 10,000 American, which is good. Back then that was super good. I was like, I'm rich. So it's cool. Well, how did you end up working with Tate? How did that change your thing? Did you get no, so with Tate or you're affiliating? Yeah. Yeah, just affiliating. It's very easy to affiliate for someone. I wasn't close with them. It's just, it's very simple. Okay. So today you've got five supercars living in Dubai. How did you go from like English guy selling fucking boilers to multimillionaire in Dubai? Like what, what is that journey? Like that's a big jump. Yeah. So for a while I was just selling boilers as an average salesman. And this is where I really learned all my business lessons. That's why all of you guys are my free telegram channel. It's free. Go click on the bio in Twitter, the link in the bio on Twitter. I always say this all the time that I learned so many of my business lessons just from just from those door to door sales days, man, of me knocking on the doors personally, because I was doing all the hard work, knocking in the rain, knocking in the cold, knocking in the winter, knocking when it was dark. A lot of times I'd wake up at 11 a.m., 12 p.m., midday, right? And then I'd go out by the time I'd reach the destination, it'd be like 1 p.m. I'd knock for three hours, then it was dark outside. These are the times when I learned all these business lessons. So during those times, I learned that I was never gonna get rich being the one doing all the work. Then I really learned about the power of systems. And this is something Craig and I talk about a lot, right? You always tell me with your e com store system, system, this. And it's completely true. If, I, if you guys are just sat there at home, just doing all the slave work, basically, you're never gonna get rich. And I learned this lesson because every time I'd call my sales manager on the phone, every single time, I'd just hear ping pong in the background, just playing table tennis. I was like, what the fuck? Like, I'm <laughs> knocking on all these doors and I'm getting paid like 100, 150 pounds a week. And initially at the beginning, if we didn't make a sale and there was no installation, we wouldn't get paid anything because it was only commission. It sounds so fucked saying this because I actually haven't made that point in years to anyone because that just sounds so fucked. But we wouldn't even get paid installation. Sorry, we wouldn't even get paid um, any wage. It would just be purely on commission at yeah, the beginning. Yeah, yeah. But so many jobs were falling through for whatever reason and we were getting nothing. So some weeks at the beginning we were making zero. But again, this is another thing I learned. That promise of it's going to be better in the future. It's going to be better in the future. So our sales manager became, oh, not became, he was very good at just telling us, the future will be better, guys. If you stick it through now, you're gonna be rich in the future. And after a while, like so many weeks were going by, I was like, I'm never ever gonna make money here. So that's what kind of created the change in my brain. Like, okay, I need to be the one in the position where I have people underneath me selling boilers for me. Because if I just sit here all day, knocking in the winter, knocking on doors, like, yeah, some weeks I made 250 pounds, 300 pounds. You know, if you, if you sold like, if you sold a boiler and underfloor insulation to like a five bed semi, the bigger the house, the more money you'd make. What, I'd get 300 pounds, 350 pounds. Later on, I negotiated for a pay rise, whatever, whatever, that's later on. The point is I was getting paid so little for all the work I was doing. That's what really taught me how business works. There's the people at the top, they win. Everyone else at the bottom, they're the classic nine to five workers, they don't get paid much. So that's what started that mind frame. And then after that, I created my own sales team, basically just recruiting people from uni, recruiting people that I knew, friends of friends, like that, it was very simple. At the start, it was just small. I mean, even now, it's not big. I have like, what, nine people in my sales team at the moment. My brother manages it. It's not a massive operation, but it was good income at the time. It got me started. It allowed me to travel, meet people, do all these things. So how do you manage that team? How did you manage to scale up that team? Like, you must be very young. Are the guys older than you? Is it difficult to manage the guys that are potentially older than you? Is that, is that a complex relationship? Or not like really, because I knew that just like I was in that position, other people were going to be in that position. Like just how I didn't know anything about sales and I didn't know anything about you know, paying people arguably less than they're worth. I knew other people wouldn't know this. A lot of you guys right now, you're working jobs that you think, yeah, they pay me 300 pound a week. You're getting paid 300 pound a week because you're bringing that company in 30,000, 3,000, 1,000, whatever. So what I realized, the reason why I really realized I was getting fucked, bruv, is because I was just sat there and I was getting paid 100 pound a week, 200 pound a week. And I found out from the surveyors and the installers, the ones who actually install the boilers, because I became good friends with a couple of them. That's how I actually started putting two and two together. They were telling me, yeah, well, you know, when the company, when we do one of these boilers, it's like a few grand, the whole yeah, it's a operation money, yeah, deal, whatever you want to call it. And I was just thinking a few grand, I'm getting made a hundred pound a fucking boiler on like a regular three bed semi house. So that's what really just made my mind think, what the fuck? I was getting paid like 2% total revenue of each sale, like one fiftieth. In a normal company, maybe you get 10% commission, 15% commission, whatever. 
So that's what really just made me think this is fucked. But yeah, in terms of how to manage people, the same way you manage, like, I mean, you know, you have a bigger warehouse, it's pretty simple. You gotta be, you always gotta be working harder from the front. I realized that if I was gonna answer the phone instantly, if I always responded to messages, you know, people would take me more seriously. Even now, I'm very, to Craig and I, business partners, I'm always telling them, reply quicker, reply quicker, because I reply like in three seconds. If you message me, you guys, you earn new money, you know, I reply instantly. And the reason why I reply instantly is because I learned this from door-to-door sales. If you don't reply instantly, the people who work for you or with you or whatever you want to call it, they're going to lose respect for you. They're going to be like, I'm always making the effort to chase him. He's not chasing me. I'm not even chasing me, but it's like, I'm putting in X work, he's putting in this work. I would do the same thing. So when I, whenever I would have new staff members in the warehouse, especially around Q4, because we'd always have loads more staff members at Christmas, I would always, always get in before them and leave after them. Even if it was like five minutes, I wasn't fucking doing any more work than them. I was just trying to show them that I'm fucking working harder than them like the whole time. Especially because they were always older than me. They're earning minimum wage, they're 30, 40 year olds. So they're kind of weird dynamic, a 20 year old is their boss. So I'd always push that I'm working fucking harder than them. You have to, otherwise people don't take you seriously and they think like, oh, this guy is young, he doesn't know what he's talking about. That's the thing in business, man. Business, you always have to like impose your will on what you always have to like lead from the front and show people like you deserve that position because people in life are prone to doubt you, right? People want to doubt you. People want to think like, yeah, this guy is only like at the time. When did you start your warehouse? What age were you? I was probably 18, 19 when I first kind of had my first staff members. Well, my first staff, staff member, I was probably like 18 and a half, like something like this, like 18, almost 19 maybe. Right, so people want to look at you and think, oh, this guy's 18, 19, like, he doesn't have much life experience. Maybe he is smart in warehouses. Maybe he knows something about e-com. Excuse me, guys, I have a lot of hiccups because I've drank a bunch of Red Bulls and a bunch of drinks. So, excuse the hiccups if I hiccup. But yeah, I mean, people are just naturally prone to doubt others. So I realized if I always responded to messages, if I always you know, answered calls, if I always made the effort, if I was always the one making more effort, then they'd appreciate work with me. And then also, it's easier to sell the future and say, yo guys, we're gonna turn this, something, turn this into something big in the future, we're gonna make more money in the future, if I'm the one working the hardest. If I'm always on top of everything and always answering everything, it's very easy to say, guys, we're gonna make five times the sales in the future because I'm adding this system in, this operation in, we're gonna talk to this company and then we're gonna, you know? But it's like, if I'm hardly active and people can't get a hold of me, they're gonna think, oh, all this work is for nothing. And it's very easy to motivate people when they're actually making money. But the thing, the reason why it's so hard like leading a team or leading a bunch of people is you're gonna have bad days, you're gonna have slow days. So during those slow days, how are you gonna motivate someone to knock in the rain when you're just sat there yes. in your room or traveling the world? Because for a while, a lot of you guys might know this, but now my brother helps me manage the team, he helps me with a lot of my businesses. Because I have a lot of businesses, that's not the only thing I do. And like, we're just traveling the world, we're having fun. So for a while, it was just me traveling the world, having fun whilst doing all of this. You can't actually show them, yeah, you're on a beach in Mexico, because I went to Mexico, LA, Miami. Yeah, it despise always... you, it completely despise you. Yeah, man, I mean, you probably get this a lot, but it's just like, you gotta show people, you, you can you show people only what they need to know, and just lead from the front, that's it. You don't need to tell the people who work for you every single thing, because they're just gonna end up resenting you. And also, they don't understand what it is to be the guy who's leading. They have no idea. You yeah, know, we were no talking about this before. And stuff like this, they, they, they have no idea. Like you see on Twitter, a lot of people complain that some CEO is getting paid three, four, five, ten million 10 million a year, and that they're paying the lowest workers minimum wage, and people are complaining, they don't understand what really goes on behind the leader's kind of facade, I suppose. People always underestimate how much work you've done, but they always overestimate what work they've done. Because they make, they knock on let's say X number of doors per day, but then they don't see all the phone calls you've done or the managing you've done or the paperwork you've gone through. They just see like, okay, I've done this because they don't see how much work I've done, right? If you know you've done this much, unless you physically see how much work someone else has done, you're just gonna assume you've worked harder. On the topic of work, what, yeah. what kind of stuff do you do day in, day out? Like obviously you said your brother manages and helps you manage a lot of stuff, which is an interesting relationship as well because family can be interesting to work with. Yeah. Um, but what, what do you actually do day in, day out? Like what time roughly do you wake up? Do you have any fucking, do you go to the gym every day? What, what's your routine every single day? So the last five, six months, I've just been working nonstop. It's been kind of crazy. Obviously I've been in Dubai, it's been fun, but I've just been working nonstop. I don't have a certain bedtime. I don't have a certain wake up time. I don't really believe too much in that. I just believe you should do what you need to do and you know what you need to do. A lot of you guys who follow me already know this. It's like, I just don't think that stuff is important. I think I just focus on the big needle movers and that's what I focus on. 
And so recently I've been focusing on building my group New Money. I've been focusing a lot on the relationships I have in real life. I've been working with a lot of influencers in real life. That's another one of my businesses. You and I have been talking a lot, probably talk to you one or two hours a day. Yeah, definitely. So those are the main things. But yeah, a lot of you guys know I'm very serious about building my private network New Money. I've said to Craig many times, it's gonna be the biggest thing. Like I believe it's gonna be like as big as Mr. Beast, bigger than Mr. Beast, bigger than Nelk, bigger than Sidemen, bigger than all these things. So it's like, that's my plan. I've been putting a lot of work into New Money. And also like a lot of you guys know this, don't know this, Craig and I met from New Money. So, and now we have multiple businesses together. We can well, go, we can go back to, to that. New Money is super interesting. Obviously a lot of people have probably heard about it. A lot of the viewers are probably inside of New Money, but where did that idea originally come from? Like what, what in your mind, like why did you want to start that? Where did that idea come from? Yeah, so as I just said, as I was traveling the world, I was basically just traveling the world by myself for a while. My brother at that time was still in uni. I remember just thinking to myself, I need people to travel with because everyone else was in uni, right? So all my friends were still in uni. I had some friends who just after school went straight to work, but they were busy with work. They just didn't have the time to come with me or they didn't have the money to come with me. So I was thinking like, I'm traveling to all these places, Mexico, Romania, Dubai, Bali, Thailand here, this place, LA, Miami, Vegas, all these just different places all over the world. And I remember thinking no one's here traveling with me. So I had the idea like, okay, I'm already meeting a couple of people on Twitter because I was on Twitter just consuming content. I thought, okay, let me just start producing content. So I started interacting with a couple of people and I, start, I met up with a couple of people from Twitter. And that's actually how I ended up moving to Dubai because one of the guys I, I talked with on Twitter was called Sammy. And then Sammy told me about Dubai, how it's amazing, blah, blah, blah. He said, there's a supercar rally in two days. This was December, 2020. I'm, I'm jumping between points, but you guys are gonna have to just fucking deal with it. So Sammy, I, went, I met him for dinner in London. He was saying to me, yeah, bro, you need to come to Dubai. And that's what gave me the idea to come to Dubai. And yeah, ever since I've came to Dubai, it's been the best decision of my life, but that was just to visit Dubai. So I've kind of jumped points, but to go back to the original point, I had the idea of, join, of creating new money just because I was just traveling by myself over and over again. I was like, this is bullshit. No one has the money to travel with me. I was thinking I need to create a group because like I said, I met a couple of people from Twitter, but I was like, imagine if I could just create a community. I know everyone thinks like me, it'd be amazing. Yeah, where you can meet new people, make new friends and they actually have the ability to fucking be your friend in a different country and stuff like this, rather than sticking with your kind of hometown friends, which are always gonna be somewhat in that box of just a hometown friend. Yeah, so for lo so long, I was just, the group was just 50 people, 80 people. It was very, very small. I wasn't really promoting it. I remember just thinking, okay, this is perfect for what I need. I want to be able to travel with. And then I started thinking, okay, this group's amazing. The, the energy we have inside this group, the culture we've created is absolutely amazing. Let's make this huge. So around July, August, 2022, when I decided I was gonna stop traveling for a while, that's actually when I decided I'm gonna fucking blow this up. Because up until July, 2022, all the way from like September, 2020, two years straight, I was pretty much just traveling. So that's when I really started focusing on it. And then from like July, 2022, all the way till now, March, 2023, it's just been crazy. The growth's been like this. We now have 900 members. We've kicked out over hundred people. So we're doing what's, well what's your time. plans for the future of the group? And then how do the, the plans for the future of the group align with your own personal goals for the next kind of five to 10 years, the kind of longer term goals? Yeah, I just feel like it's gonna be huge. I've said this many, many times, New Money is gonna be like a multi-billion dollar organization. There's gonna be many businesses under the New Money banner. So it's gonna be New Money, like it is right now, but underneath all the guys who are in New Money right now, I wanna give every single one of them an opportunity. I want them to own equity in lots of other businesses that I like, we all collectively own. So I wanna be in like, I wanna sell everything, like this microphone, why don't we sell this, you know? If you have enough people who are competent and you have everything managed well, have, sell microphones. Sell fucking, be a middleman for luxury watches, you know? help people move, relocate to Dubai, set up people's companies in Dubai, you know, get into the fight promotion game, get into the music game, record labels, all that kind of stuff, clothing, everything, food industry, everything. So that's kind of how I see new money. I believe it's gonna be a multi-billion dollar organization. And the reason why it's gonna be a multi-billion dollar is because we're gonna have all the guys inside of new money actually helping manage all the operations. And we're gonna have multiple businesses inside. That's how I kind of see the group. It's not just gonna be like a membership group of a bunch of young guys traveling the world and trying to make money. Because at the moment, that's what it is. A bunch of young guys who are starting businesses together, working on businesses together, traveling the world, live calls, all that kind of stuff. But eventually it's gonna become a huge, huge operation. And every single person inside of New Money is gonna get equity of all these companies. That's how I see it. How much of your own personal time is going towards building New Money versus kind of managing the other kind of plates that you're spinning, the other businesses that you have running? Yeah, because people say that to me, bro. They say, because what, what do you find? You obviously have a decent Twitter account. 
Five, six it doesn't 000. take that much time as long as you actually like have employees have systems in place to help you manage the other businesses and also the kind of everything else and your life's optimized it really doesn't take that much time to be honest yeah people say to me like oh you tweet you have all the other businesses you have you put voice notes in your telegram channel and it's like it's because i don't think about things even this podcast i actually have no idea what craig's gonna ask me this is my first podcast as well so i'm a little bit I don't know which point it's to make. It's a bit different to a voice notes and to tweets and stuff like this. Yeah, it's quite different. Because with my with my voice notes, obviously many of you guys have heard them. I have an idea that comes in my head instantly. So I'll just be thinking about a point about sales or I've just had a conversation with Craig about managing staff. And then I'll just make a voice note called managing staff and just talk about managing staff. But this is like, I don't know what questions are coming up. I don't know what points are coming up. Craig just got a few questions from the new money boys. I have no idea what's coming up. So. It's kind of different, it's kind of weird, but we're getting through it. But yeah, man, it doesn't take long because if you just do things without thinking, like Craig and I had this idea to do a podcast. We didn't prepare it, we just like, fuck it, we'll do the podcast. It's like, if you just keep doing things without spending hours of time analyzing, I think you'll be all right. Like how much time do you spend building a Twitter account in a day? Really not long, to be honest. Maybe 30 to 60 minutes a day. Not really just Twitter, but just everything, managing that whole side of things, like 30 to 60 minutes a day. Obviously this is gonna take an hour, but it's yeah. fun as well. It's really nice to meet new people, especially from, from Twitter and from New Money. I kind of count it all as one thing, you know? Yeah, because even like with me, right? You're saying, how much time do I spend growing New Money? I focus on New Money, right? But it's like, there's so many benefits that come from it. Right now, we're friends because he joined New Money in August, right, last year. Yeah. And now we have multiple businesses together. You can talk more about the business we have because he's the econ guy. But I've just invested a bunch of money into him just because he knew what he was talking about. We spoke every single day when he was in Dubai. So we met in a Five Guys restaurant. But yeah, There's Five Guys in America, right? Yeah. Yeah, we met in New, like Leicester Square, Central London, Five Guys. There was like 10 dudes, New Money Guys. And then um, you were there, a bunch of other big guys inside of the group were there as well. And um, I don't know, we just kind of, we chatted a little bit, didn't really talk that much. And then I came to Dubai, we met for dinner like once, and we spent like two weeks together like every day, pretty much. Just ta talking about business, a bunch of random things, really. And exactly, because Craig came to the first meetup when we were in London, that's what made me want to go see him in Dubai. It just shows if you just do things without thinking. Now I've invested a bunch of money into him, now we, more, we own more e-com stores together. So it's like, so many businesses can come from just meeting new people. So many of you guys are just sat there like, oh, I don't know what to do. Craig was doing well, but now he's doing better. I was doing well, now I'm doing better. It's always good to add more businesses onto your plate. And it's just from meeting one person. Like, that's how simple it is. It was is. like luck and chance, and obviously, you like, know, the harder you work. Yeah, like, I just took the train into central London, an hour and a half, like three hours of my time to get there. I probably spent more on the train than actually talking. Um, sure. And then obviously it worked super, super well. I think- I mean, even a couple other new money guys were there and I've become friends with them as well, as well as you. Yeah, 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 for sure. I think a lot of people are scared to network because they think it's a big time commitment. What do you think about that? Like, is it a big I time commitment? Is it worth it? How do you manage if it's I worth think it? I think if, you, if you're if you trying to split your focus, it's difficult, right? So if you're in like 25 different networking groups and they're just a bit shit, or you're doing kind of traditional networking. The way I've been to so many networking events and so many corporate events where it's all very like, oh, here's my business card, here's what I do, here's what I do. It's not really kind of like a, va it's not really value exchange, it's more just kind of pitching. Whereas something like new money is you're trying to find value within each other. And that doesn't actually just have to be like, I, I want to make money for, for you, you want to make money for me, this kind of thing. It can also be friendships as well. I think that's incredibly valuable because I think a lot of people, especially in my hometown, my friends that are from my secondary school and stuff like this, um, I'm still close with them, but I can't talk about business with them. Like I just can't. It's I just can't. It just, just changes like the, the, every income level you go up, it becomes harder and harder to relate to the old people you used to relate to. It's just a fact. Like, cause I remember when I was- And you shouldn't want to, yeah, exactly. to a certain degree, because if you're continually relating your life to them, say they're earning five grand a month, like 60 Gs a year, that's, that's rich in the UK, that's class. But by on average, this class is rich in the UK. And you're earning 10, you're gonna feel like the biggest G ever. It's gonna fuck with your ego. You need to be put. <laughs> Like you need to not be like put in your place, but kind of put in your place to a certain degree. You need to always be looking up, looking forward. And if you're just stuck in your hometown with your average, average sounds mean, but average friends, you're not gonna push forward. You're not gonna improve your life to my, my experience, to be honest. It's just about what you want because I've seen so many people 
But let's, let's, let me give you an example, right? So, so many times I'll be like at Tesco's, at the supermarket with my friends. We were buying drinks, we were buying food, whatever. And one of my friends would make a comment like, oh, you see this guy behind this till. No, let me, let me, let me tell you another story actually. Let's say you see a guy and they got a picture on Instagram and they're all dressed in designer, right? They're the kind of guys who spend all their money on designers, but you know they work at Tesco's, right? You know they work in the supermarket, but they spend all the money on designer and you know they drive a Mercedes Benz C class. So what they've done is they finance the Benz and they spend all their money on designers and they work at Tesco's because they're actually broke to make one, two K a month, I don't know, right? Now, I respect that. A lot of people say, like a lot of my old friends used to say, oh, this guy stupidly does that. But that guy, I respect him. I'll tell you why I respect him. Because a lot of you guys know this. I'm a big believer in just spending a lot of money. Especially when you don't have a lot of money. I believe the best thing you can do is just spend a lot of money. Because you're broke anyway. You need cash flow. If every day you had $100,000 coming in, every day you had $20,000 coming in, $5,000, $1,000, you can just keep spending more money. Let's say every day, this, all right, this cup is how much money you make per day. You pour it all on the floor after the day's done, right? Because you spent it all on clothes, on going out, on food, on your apartment, on your assets, whatever, stocks. But tomorrow it's gonna refill the whole cup. You'll just keep drinking, right? It's like, that's the kind of analogy I like to use. It's just gonna keep refilling. That's what cash flow is. Money in the bank, money in the bank is like, this is how much money you have in the bank. You're gonna be scared of spending any, any of it. Even if this is a million, if you start spending 10K, 20K, you're gonna be nervous like, shit, I only have 980K yeah, yeah. left. Like, fuck, I'm... The thing is, if you're... One sec, sorry, let me go back to that point okay. and then finish the story. So, that point, the reason why I respect him is because that guy, he's got a Benz at a young age, he's having fun. He's dressing good, so he feels good about himself. People are gonna take him more seriously. He's got a hot girlfriend as well because he looks good, he's dressing nice, he feels good about himself, he's gonna attract good people in his life. He's got a hot girlfriend as well. So he's driving a better car, has a hotter girlfriend than you, feels better about himself, people take him more seriously, and he's working at Tesco so he has no money left over. You. You work some bullshit job, you maybe save 1,000 a month because you're not spending the money on the clothes in the car. But then people don't take you seriously, you don't feel good about yourself, and you only have 1K, you're not gonna get rich on 1K anyway. So I believe, I'm, I'm that kind of guy, I'm the kind of guy who'd just rather spend it all on that stuff. But I've always just been the kind of guy actually who spent it all on courses and mentorships and all that kind of stuff because my logic was, if I'm that guy, cool, it would be okay for a little bit, but then now I've got no money and I've just got some nice clothes. So my plan was always spend all my money on like mentorships and courses and all these things because that can actually give you ROI. That, how much ROI is there from wearing a Gucci t-shirt? It's limited. Very limited. But then this guy, I, I fuck with this guy the least. I think this is the worst. What's your opinion? Uh, I think You're different. See, uh, Craig's different. I'm super humble. I'm not really into that kind of stuff. I, I've no, I'm saying the guy, I'm saying the guy who's... Well, working at Tesco, spending all his money. No, I'm saying the guy, no, this, that's that guy. I'm saying this guy, he's the guy who just works a normal job. He has 1K left over. He's just like scared. He holds on to that 1K. Like, I can't spend it. I can't spend it. I think it's pointless to do that. What, how are you going to get rich? You're not, yeah, you're not going to get rich. I don't think, even if you don't want to be rich, you're just not going to be happy, I think. If you're always living month to month and you're always fighting or like always scared to spend that extra little money, like you're just not going to be happy. That's always going to be hanging over your head your entire life. And I just don't think that's a good way to live. Especially as you get older, like one thing that I always think about is I'm building a life now, I'm making sacrifices now with my time, putting a lot of time and effort into my businesses for my future children and for their children as well. So I don't know how you could do that. I don't, th I don't know how you could just work a nine to five and just like not want anything more. Like that's just not in me personally, like to work a nine to five and just not want anything more. Like I've worked nine to fives before for like 10 months, I had a nine to five basically and I just yeah. felt myself getting depressed. Like I was just getting depressed. Like one thing that really shot, like that I remember vividly is I wasn't getting up like the alarms. Like I would always be getting up for the first like six months I would get up for the alarm. Like I was having fun, I was learning new things. And then like nine, like eight, nine, 10 months, I was just wasn't getting up. I was being late continually. And it was just kind of my own body, my own brain telling me that it's just not for me. This is the thing. So many people though say, what would you say to those people who say like, oh, nine to five is not for me, but they've not done shit. Like I hear this all the time. Yo, bro, I don't think nine to five is for me. Nine to five is for fucking nobody. Who the fuck is nine to five for? No one wants to work a nine to five job. No one wakes up in the morning and when they're like 10 years old, they thought, what do I want to do? I want to help this company get bigger and not do anything with my life and just be a fucking wage cuck sat at home doing fuck all with their lives. No one wakes up and jerks off over that idea. No one gets excited by that idea. But just sitting there doing nothing and your money's all taxed away, you're doing nothing. No one wants to do that. So I believe like you, if you're just sat there right now and you have a job, I respect that. We all had jobs. But what I'm saying is if you're just sat there and you have zero plan on how to actually escape that job, 
That's the kind of guy I don't fuck with. Because when I was broke and when I was selling these boilers, every day I'd come home with my brother, we'd make a plan like, okay, how are we going to make more money? So let's say a lot of weeks we're making 200 pounds each, 400 pounds a week. We're like, imagine we made four grand a week. If we can make 4K a week, I'll tell you guys a story. This podcast could be on for like three hours, by the way. Yeah, this is why it's weird, cool. boys, because I can speak for seven hours uninterrupted, but I'm trying to include Greg into this. It's difficult. So the thing is, we would be driving to work every single day, right? And we'd see a hot tub on the side of the road. And the hot tub, it said, the price of it was like 5,000 pounds. I said to my brother, if we make four or 5,000 pounds a week, we could buy a hot tub, cash, in that week. And it's like, we've lost no money. Yeah. It's free, the hot tub's free. It's like this analogy, if the water bottle keeps refilling, if the water cup keeps refilling, we, we're fine, we can buy a Bugatti today, a house tomorrow. If the, if the money keeps coming in, we can keep spending, right? People say, oh, Hassan, how do you keep buying supercars? Because the money keeps coming in, I have like, I have unlimited money, basically. It's yeah, like, it's, I, free. it's free, it's free. So we kept seeing this hot tub every single day. We're like, if we could make four or five K a week, we'd be so rich because we buy the hot tub this week, then we have it in our garden. Then what do we buy next week? We have another 4K. Do we buy this t-shirt? Do we buy a watch? Do we buy our first Rolex? What do we buy? So that's when I really understood how important cash flow was. But we were always thinking, how do we increase our cash flow? We were never bothered about money in the bank. We were always like, spend the money in the bank to get cash flow. What was your mindset? Because I've Craig's a bit more risk averse than me. I'm always like, I'll spend every penny I have to try and meet this one person in Bulgaria to try and get a business opportunity. Because I'll tell you guys some stories. I'm super there. risk averse. I've always focused on- But that's your business on, model. Yeah, no, that's e-commerce. Because my business model is all about like commissions and just selling. Your business model is about, it's we made a million. Up, building but- up, building up, building up, yeah. So I've always focused, I've probably to my downfall to be honest, not downfall, but to my detriment, I've never really focused on the cash to a certain degree. Because yeah. I've always known that Oh, I can make a couple hundred K, I can make a couple million. It's not that significant in the grand scheme of things because life's like, it's life's long. long, like life's long. I'm going to yeah. be doing this for a while. So I always thought, a lot of people still, don't I'm think doing, like still, still I'm doing, right? Like just learning, learning new skills. Like I've done so many different things in e-commerce. I've learned so many different things. I'm definitely focused more on cash now to a certain degree with certain businesses, but I'm still doing businesses where I'm just like learning. Like I just, I, for me, I'm not doing business for cash. I'm doing it because I enjoy it. Obviously, money's fun. Money brings you amazing things, but I'm doing it to learn and grow. And that's just kind of, it works very well with e-commerce, just like learning, 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 growing, growing the business and either I think exit or just cash flow comes in. Yeah, I think that's why we get along well in business because I'm all about cash now, cash now. We can't wait one day. It has to be now. Like, I, cause I just learned this yeah, from door to door. Because I learned from my sales manager, the one time he would call me, motherfucker, he'd call me and say, how many sales did you make today, mate? And it discouraged me because I made, let's say, zero for the day. I'd be like, zero? He's like, oh, all right then. I was like, mate, you hadn't answered the phone all day. Maybe if you answered the phone, then we would have made a sale or maybe because the extra energy, the extra conviction. It's nice to have someone in your ear saying, keep going, mate. Especially when you're an amateur. When you're an amateur in business, you just need someone to say, keep going, right? If you play sports and your football manager says, Keep going, you're playing well, just keep your head up, you're nearly gonna score. It just pushes you. So, yeah, we're very different. You're all about building for the future. I believe like, I don't know. I think, I think a lot of you could do better with my mindset and I'll tell you why. I, 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 I agree. Because Craig's mindset definitely works if you're actually that guy. But most of you just use that mindset and say, oh, it's fine, I'm building. You're not building anything. You're living with your parents, you're doing absolutely nothing with your life and you're just sat there doing nothing. My mindset is like, did we make money today? No, well, you fucked up. And you can only go to sleep so many nights having made nothing, saying, I fucked up, looking in the mirror, saying, I hate myself, I fucked up, so many times before you actually fix your situation. So I believe my mindset is better for most of you, but if you're a builder like Craig, then good. But Craig's successful and like he's been doing, he's had that mindset his whole life, so. I've been doing it for years, it works well yeah, for me. I think, and that's what I find enjoyable, right? But yeah, I, I completely agree. I think most people would work super well with your kind of mindset compared to my mindset. It's just aggression, right? It's like if every day you wake up saying, what tasks do we have to do? Then you ensure that before you sleep, this, 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 and this are done. With your mindset, it's very easy to just go to sleep having done nothing. Yeah. Completely. So how do you prevent that? Because you're obviously successful. I don't know. I think, I think having responsibilities helps that. Like having employees and knowing that like, if I make a mistake, if I don't keep pushing the business forward, these employees are gonna fucking lose their jobs yeah, or yeah, yeah. like people that rely on me personally, like everything's on me, that they're gonna lose their jobs and it's just, it's not gonna keep pushing forward. One thing that I, is always in kind of the back of my head is like, 
I want to make the most of life. I don't want to just waste it away. Like I think a lot of people do. Like I've seen so many people just do a nine to five for like 30 years and it's just kind of depressing. Like they just retire at 60 and that's just, they just kind of chill around till they die. I don't really want to do that. So I always want to keep pushing. And for me, money's fun, as I said, but learning is like really fun for me. I really like new, learning new things, learning new skills, growing the business in different ways, finding different ways to do it and mastering that craft. Like I just fucking enjoy the shit out of that. So I think I always want to continue learning. Like that's why I hate, to, I hated that nine to five is because after nine, 10 months, I'd learn everything, basically learn anything. I, I've learned 90% of the shit that I could fucking learn in that job. And it was just, it was done for me. And that's the thing I say to you guys all the time. It's like, if you're going to have a job, at least have a job where you're learning something. That's why I chose the sales job over the supermarket job. Even at the points where I was making 150 pound a week, 200 pound a week, I was thinking, if I get a job at Tesco's, I'll make 300. But I'd rather lose the cash flow for and now. And you're going to learn something. Yeah, and become amazing at sales. And then it's like now as well, people are saying, Hassan, how did you build such a big community like New Money? How are you keeping on top of everything? Because I'm so good at managing a team already. New Money is effectively one big team. It's effectively one big, not sales team, but one big. I mean, in the future, it's going to be a huge ass sales team, really. When we have all these businesses underneath, it's effectively one huge ass sales team. So... Yeah, man, skills translate. If I was just working in the supermarket, in Tesco's, what would I be doing now? I just, that's the thing. Say I was earning 3,000 pounds a week at Tesco's, which is impossible, right? But let's say I'm earning 3,000. Fuck it, make it 30,000 a week. What, what, like, I would have no skills. Yeah, okay, you could argue with 30,000, I'd have so much cash, but that's just impossible. It's a pointless example. You're not making 30 grand a week in Tesco's. Never, obviously. That's, that's over a million a year, right? So let's just say, even if I was making 500 pounds a week, 500 pounds a day in Tesco's, 3.5K a week, which is impossible, let's just say. What would I have done with that money? I'd still be in the same position. I'd be more comfortable. I would have bought some nice clothes. You'd be way more comfortable. That's the thing with a 9 to And I would have never got well. to this level of income. 9 to 5, you get so used to that comfort, that, that comfort level. Oh, I get a little 10% bonus at the end of the year. You just get so used to it. And I think a lot of people make the mistake that I find really frustrating because I see other people do it, is they always stretch themselves. Like they'll get a mortgage and they'll stretch themselves slightly. So they're just fucking locked in. They can never leave that 9 to 5 because they're stuck there because they're stretching themselves on all their like overheads. And I don't spend money, but... I spend a bit of money, but I don't spend money. But one thing I always do is keep my overhead super low because then I have so much freedom to like take fucking huge risks if yeah. I want to. Like I could go back down to zero right now and my overheads are very, very minimal compared to the money that I'd be able to generate in like literally a month's time. 100%. I think, I think a lot of people just get nine to five jobs because they say, oh, my parents made me. Your parents didn't make you do anything, right? You, you allowed that excuse to actually matter because I, I made this video on Twitter like one or two That's days ago. I said... Your parents didn't stop you from having your first cup of alcohol. Your parents didn't stop you from having your, your first joint. Your parents didn't stop you from having, you know, sex without a condom. They said, oh, have a, you know, put a condom on. They, they, your parents didn't stop you from doing anything. Your parents didn't stop you from playing PlayStation when you didn't do your homework, but you still played PlayStation. So your parents didn't stop you from anything. You're just saying, oh, my parents want me to go to uni and become a doctor. My parents want me to stay in school. My parents want me to work this nine to five job because it's security. Your mom and dad want you to do well. They don't actually know what is good for you because things have changed. How you make money now is so different, right? I've just invested a bunch of money into him and now he's got some e-com stores. We share some e-com stores and that's making me money. Every couple of days you're saying, yo, it's doing well, blah, blah, blah. It's like, if I said to my mom, I can just give money to a stranger six months ago. Yeah. Now he's a very good friend of mine, but six months ago he was a stranger and now I can just make money passively she was like what the fuck and she says this to me now we had dinner the other day she was in dubai she was saying hassan are you sure you can trust these people you know i just say i meet people online all this stuff are you sure you can meet these people are you sure they're not just giving you money and then they're gonna take your money back i was like what no it's just say like we sold a product we sold this we sold that like this is how this business model works this is how that business model works she's like yeah are you sure it's legit are you sure you're doing something legal i'm like yeah mama i'm sure so it's like your parents are never going to understand anyway. My biggest regret actually, looking back in that whole time period, is I wish I just lied more to my mom. I wish I didn't tell her like, yeah, mom, I don't want to go back to uni. Yeah, mom, I'm going to start this online business. Yeah, mom, I'm going to start this sales team. Yeah, mom, I'm going to start this. Yeah, mom, I'm going to affiliate online. Because they don't know anything about that anyway. All you're doing is bringing stress into their life. It's so much better. It's so much a better strategy to just focus on yourself, meet new people in real life, get paid, start making money, and then say, look, here's my new Rolex, here's my new AP. I completely agree with that, yeah. 
Like even, like I've spoken to some people in New Money as well to give them advice and they're like, oh, I'm telling my mum, my mum's not allowing me to do this. My mum's not allowing me to do this. Don't tell them. Like they just want you to be happy. They want you to be successful. And things are so drastically different to 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago when they were a kid, right? Like they don't really understand the world. They just want you to be happy. They want you to be safe. Yeah, man, your parents, your parents just want you to do well. That's it. So when you guys say my parents want me to become a doctor, they don't want you to become a doctor necessarily. They just want you to not get into trouble. They want you to be able to provide for your future kids. That's it. But yeah, man, we've talked a lot about that point, but. but going back to kind of family dynamics, yeah, I yeah. think this is something that's super interesting because a lot of people ask me questions about like working with close friends and family members. And I've done, I've like, I've worked with my mum. My mum still works for me. I've had to sack her from some jobs in the past. I've sacked my dad in the past. I've sacked my sister in the past. I used to employ a lot of close friends as well. But you work closely with your brother. How does that dynamic work? Does he have a similar mindset to you? Um, and how did that originally start? And how do you think it's going to progress in the future? Yeah, so I live with my brother at the moment. My brother's obviously very close to me. He's only 18 months younger than me, so he's one and a half years younger. And he's certainly not the same as me. I'm very, very aggressive. Like, we have to do this now. Like, I'm very aggressive when it comes to business. He's not the same. He hasn't got that same motivation for money. I remember he used to say to me, like, if we could find a way to make 100 grand a year, he'll be happy. He's like, what can you not do on six figures a year? I was like, quite a lot, bro. <laughs> but he was very happy because he's not materialistic at all. And not just materialistic, but he doesn't care about... Like, I want to flex a bit on people. I kind of want to flex. Not in like a, I need validation from random people online, because that's certainly not the case. But even in real life, right? When you walk into a room, it's nice to know that the local people know you. It's nice to feel important. It's nice to have all these things. So my brother always said, yeah, on 100K a year, you can do everything. I always disagreed. So my brother's nowhere near as ambitious as me. But having said that, since we've made way more money... He couldn't imagine making less than millions and millions a year. Like, you couldn't imagine making two million in a year, three million, five million. Like, it's just such small numbers now. It's like, it's nothing. So, that's the biggest thing. But in terms of how we work, it's very much like, I say we have to do X, Y, Z, and then he just helps me do X, Y, Z. It's not, and then he has a couple ideas for me, but it's always like, I think you need one person in charge. He lets everyone else know. And people prefer it that way anyway. People like listening to other people who they trust. Because then you, it removes the thinking. I don't want to compare my brother to a fucking girlfriend at all. Or I don't want to compare anyone on my team or staff members or anything to a girlfriend or to girls or to a child. But it's almost like if you said to your girlfriend, where do you want to eat? What apartment should we book? What hotel room should we book? They won't know. They're just going to be like, ah. You decide. Or and they kind of get it. a bit repulsed by it. So it's kind of the same with everyone else around you. If you guys want to be the rich guy, you want to be the millionaire in your family, you want to be the big boss, then you have to be the one saying, look, guys, do this, do this, do this. You do this, I'll do this. We had a bit of a technical problem, so we're gonna get back into it now with the first question. Craig's phone started ringing in the mouth. The, fir the first question, well, ah, oh, fuck, no, I'll say it again. Fucking no bloopers. Okay, no bloopers, whatever, I fucked no up. Edits. Not the first question, but getting back into things. So what do you think, so say you're earning a bit of money, what should you spend your money on? Like say you're earning yeah. five, 10 Gs, 15 Gs a month, what are you spending your money on? I always say this, right? You should spend money on things that increase your reputation or teach you something. They're the only things you should spend your money on, right? Increase your reputation or give you more knowledge. They're the only things. People say, oh, but what about fun? But it's like, why have fun when you're at 20 when you can just have way, way more fun? Way, way more fun at 22, right? If you get your shit together at 20, at 20, you start getting your shit together. At 22, you're going to be a millionaire because that's how things, that's how fast things change nowadays, right? So you just got to get your shit together ASAP. So I'll say spend money on courses, spend money on mentorships, join you money, join Craig. Craig is a thing as well to help you make money with e-com. Spend money on things that are going to help you make more money. Then you can also spend money on things like clothes, watches, supercars, living in a nice apartment. All these things are going to give you more energy. If you have more energy, you're going to feel better about yourself. Then you're going to work harder. A lot of you guys say, Hassan, how do you have so much energy? Right now, what time is it? I think it's midnight. This podcast might be on for another three fucking hours. It's like, I've been up for the last two days. It's like, I have so much energy because I drink these. And also it's because I'm always looking forward to things. And also I have a nice lifestyle. If I'm always driving a supercar, if I'm always meeting new people, if I live in a nice apartment, I've always got things to look forward to. I've always got nice things around me. So spend money on your apartment, spend money on nicer food, spend money going to the nicer gym. People are so cheap on little things like the gym. They're like, oh, I can't spend $300 on this gym or $200 on this gym. What's the alternative? You spend, what, how much is a normal gym? $30? Right, $30. And let's say an expensive one in Dubai is 200. Yeah. 
Banus is a very good gym in Dubai. What's the difference? $170. That $170, divide $170 by 30. What's that? $6 a day, $5.8 a day or something. Who gives a fuck about $5.8, $6 a day? Who cares? You're so much better off spending that $6 a day. Now you have networking opportunities in the gym. Now you meet new people. You see nicer girls in the gym. You feel better about yourself. You have more energy. You have more energy, so you push harder in the gym. You make more gains. You eat better food. You sleep better. You feel overall better about your life. Because if you're on the come up, you're not going out clubbing all the time. You're not having that much fun. So your fun for the day can be in the gym. Your fun for the day could be going to a nice cigar lounge. We met and got to know each other really by just going to loads of cigar lounges over and over again, had some drinks, had some cigars, smoked, had fun, right? Just chilled. Nice environment. We felt better about ourselves. If we just met in the fucking slum, slums, we'd have felt shit. So I'd say spend money on nice things, right? Spend money on things that are going to increase your reputation as well. If you pull up in a supercar, people are going to take you more seriously. The reason why so many of you guys are listening to this podcast is because I have five supercars. Have you noticed a big change in like your lifestyle or how people treat you with the supercars, with the watches, things like this? Yeah, hundred percent. So I made a good friend um, in the gym, in Banu's gym. Again, like I said, spend more money on nice gyms. You meet better people. So a good friend of mine now, H's Tiki Talk, you know him as well. So I met him in the gym and he saw I had this gold AP on. So when I was talking to him, I was actually giving him some business game because I think his YouTube channel just got deleted that day. I was like, yo, bro, you could do this, you could do that. This is how you can market your stuff. And he saw I had a gold AP on. He's actually very into watches. I never knew that. But he just noticed it. And then he said, yo, how did you afford this watch? Blah, blah, blah. We started talking business. So he started taking me more seriously. And now we have business together. We work together in business. So it paid off. You know, and also he saw, he like, oh, I saw you the other day. You pulled up in the Lambo, you know? So it's like all these things make a huge, huge difference. So yeah, it's absolutely made a big difference. People take you more seriously online, offline. It's massively increased my Twitter following as well. You know, so it's 100% worth it. I reckon you should spend all your money on increasing your reputation and things that give you more knowledge. What else are you going to spend on? Money in the bank isn't using your money. And people say to me all the time, have you heard this? They say, yeah, but what about a rainy day? I say, what about a rainy day? Like, why do you need 2,000 pounds for a rainy day? Why do you need 6,000 pounds for a rainy day? What rainy day costs 6,000 pounds? I don't know. I don't believe in that whole risk averse mindset. What rainy day costs nine? What rainy day costs 6,000 pounds or 9,000 pounds? It's just cope, in my opinion. What have, rainy day costs- We have six, very different mentalities. Yeah, right? but what happens? Your tire, your tire pops and you need to pay 100 pounds for AA. Call your friend if it's really that bad. Once every eight months, your tire pops, 100 pounds. If you're so focused on cash flow, if you're so focused on cash flow, you're gonna make so much more money and then you'll be able to pay the 100 pound for the tire. But if you're so focused on saving your three grand, your six grand, then all these bills are gonna eat up at you. And the only way I feel like you really get slowed down in business is when you're so focused on saving the pennies. They say, look after the pennies, it becomes pounds. That's not true in my opinion. I believe you should just fuck the pounds, fuck the thousands, fuck the 10 grand, fuck the 100 grand. We're after the millions. And when you're after the millions, you'll actually make millions. If you're always worried about how do we invest this 5K, you're fucked. And also another analogy I like to use is money is like dollars or pounds are like soldiers. If I said to you right now, who's going to win the battle? Me with a million soldiers or you with 10 soldiers, right? If I had a million dollars just now in the bank and you have $10 in the bank, who's going to win? Me. I have more soldiers to deploy into battle, right? So it's very, very important to think like that about your money. Each dollar, each pound is a soldier. And if you invest it in the right areas, a nice watch, a nice car, a nice apartment, nice clothes, go here, go there, spend it on in, you know, buying new businesses, investing in new businesses, learning new things, books, courses, e-com, mentorships, whatever the fuck, right? Because you used to pay for mentorships, right? Yeah, of course. Yeah. All these things is going to help you make more money. But if it's just in the bank, like, like, why did you used to keep so much money in the bank back when you were on the come up? Um, I didn't really. I was always very risk adverse. I wouldn't buy things that wouldn't earn me money, but I would just reinvest it back into the business, back into stock, things like this. But I wouldn't buy big things for my for myself. Like I wouldn't buy. I haven't bought a car. I haven't bought yep. like any you bought the Rolex. I bought one Rolex, yeah. I basically um, bullied them to buy the Rolex. <laughs> I was like, bro, you have to yeah. buy a Rolex. Completely, yeah. So. Uh, yeah, I just think it's very important to spend money because it just gives you a certain kind of energy. People say, yeah, why do you have so much energy? Because you spend so much money. Money is energy. I remember, I think Tay said this once. He said, money takes hours to earn, right? If you have a normal job, you spend your life earning X money, which means money literally has energy attached to it. That's all it is. So you're basically just getting energy for yourself. You're spending, you're spending, energy can't be destroyed, right? You're just spending energy, but then you're getting it back in what you receive. I'm spending 200 on the gym. I receive all the benefits of these business partners I meet, these cool people I meet. 
I get cool pictures for Twitter. You guys see all the supercars outside of the gym. You're like, oh shit, Hassan, there's so many, Dubai is so nice. And then you follow me. That's cool. I bring more awareness to new money. Everything has a, you know, you have to, you pay to play, right? That's how I look at it. On the topic of cars, what is your dream car? Have you got that yet already? Because you obviously got five supercars. And yeah, I have Bugatti imagine. soon? Or? Yeah, I'll have a Bugatti within a few months. Um, I, won't say my Bugatti, I won't say a Bugatti is my dream car though. Because when I was younger, I didn't think, wow, I want a Bugatti. I didn't even know what Bugatti was up until I was like, I don't know, 14 maybe. Initially, it was very much just like, I want a Lamborghini. That was my dream car. And that was why I bought it as the first supercar. That was my dream car. That's it. Which one's your favorite out of all of those? It's hard to say. It's hard to say. I think my favorite is the Lamborghini Huracan. It changes every day, but overall, it is my dream car. It's the best car, Lamborghini Huracan, yeah. You, it's good for different things. Urus is nice, Porsche is nice, Ferrari is nice, McLaren is nice, but overall, it's the, the Huracan. But yeah, people say, oh, what's your dream car? Just buy all of them. Just buy all of them. If you can't buy all of them, then you're so focused on money in the bank. If you're worried about cash flow, then you can buy all of them. If every month you're making half a million, one million profit, then you can just keep buying them. So that's why I look at it. Switching it up to kind of a more valuable topic. If someone's in that sales That was valuable, right now, you motherfuckers. <laughs> you fuckers. If you're, if you're in sales right now, you've been in sales for a very, very long time. What are some sales tricks, tips, that you can give to people watching right now that are gonna fucking be able to help them and give them some real, real results? Yeah, so in my door-to-door -door sales days, that's when I learned all my like tricks or all my tips that I can give you guys. I can talk forever, like this podcast literally could be eight hours, I don't know how long Craig's gonna let me talk for. But yeah, the first thing I really realized was that you have to know your numbers. What I mean by that is you have to know how many doors it takes for you to get a sale. Because I found that every time I got rejected, I got a little bit discouraged. I was thinking, wow, like that, oh, that hurt. Like fucking this guy just slammed the door in my face. Oh, he just shouted at me because it's 7 p.m. in the evening. He said, why are you knocking on the door so late? This guy's saying to me, where's your name tag? This guy's saying, why is your shoes dirty? Because I'm a broke boy and I can't buy cleaner shoes. Was, you know, just always just problem, problem, problem. I was thinking, this is bullshit. It just discouraged me. Because I started the day with good energy and then I went down. I was like, oh. So I was like, this is bullshit. Like, how do I make sure my energy levels stay the same every time? Because when I'm on point, when I'm speaking with energy like this, I have way more chances of selling. When I'm speaking like this, it's just not very, just don't sound very convincing, I sound boring, I don't sound, because if I was selling something actually amazing, why wouldn't I talk like this the whole time? But if I'm like, uh, you know? So that's kind of what I realized about how important it is to have your energy levels high all the time. So I realized, okay, how many, I asked myself, how many doors does it take to get a sale? And I had all the numbers anyway, because every door you knock on, you write down like, not answering, didn't fit the criteria, not interested, NI was not interested, NA, no answer, blah, 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 blah. And I realized there was like one in every 30 doors. And I would actually get an installation. It doesn't matter how many sales I make, just every one in every 30 would be an installation. So then I knew, okay, if I've been rejected 15 times in a row or 23 times in a row, it doesn't matter because I got seven left. So even if I got rejected 45 times in a row, I'll be fine. I'll be like, okay, in 15 doors time, I'll probably would have made two sales because every 60, I get two. Every 120, I get four. Every so on and so forth, right? So that would keep me encouraged throughout the day when I'd get rejected very badly because sometimes you have a lower day than average. So some days you knock on 90 doors or well, not quite 90 really, but 60 doors and you wouldn't get a single sale. But then some days you knock on 50 doors and get seven sales. So that's one in every seven. Do you see what I'm saying? I see what you're saying. So it's like, it's very important to know your numbers because then you never, get you never get discouraged because then you know every single door, I'm not expecting anything. I'm just gonna do the same thing every single time. And if I get a sale, I get a sale. If I don't get a sale, I don't get a sale. That's kind of how I used to view it. That's one thing. The second thing is realize that rejection is never personal. There'll be people's doors we knocked on, they didn't answer. I can't be like, oh no, I'm a shit salesman. They just didn't answer. If you guys are doing cold calling out there, you're making call, 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 no one's answering. That's nothing to do with you. That's just no one's answering the phone. If you're posting content on social media, no one's fucking with the content. Maybe the target audience you want haven't seen that content yet. Maybe you're targeting the wrong people. It's not a personal thing. It's just you need to make a couple slight adjustments. It doesn't mean you're a bad person. You're never gonna blow up on social media, right? All these things are very, very important to know. So I learned that rejection wasn't personal because I knocked on some people's doors and they're like, ah, oh, can you come back tomorrow? I came back tomorrow. They signed instantly because maybe they had a bad day. Point is something might have just happened and outside circumstance might have happened. 
So that's what I learned. Rejection is not serious. Rejection is not personal. And also, I've had people shout at me like a lot. Because one time, there was this street that took us three days to finish because I was so fucking lazy. Ah, oh, this podcast could go on for five hours, boys. Oh, I have so many stories. Anyway, one time, this street took three days to finish because I kept leaving the street and just messing around. Let's just leave it like that. I wasn't really focused on my daughter at all that day. I was just being an idiot, like seeing this chick in Leicester, I was just fucking around. I wasn't actually knocking on doors. So I went back to that street three days in a row and I kept knocking on this door. Let's just say the door is number 16. No, no answer. So I came back the next day because I was on that street anyway. No answer. Third day, knock on the same door. The guy shouts from the window. He's like, hey, get off my property, get off my property. And I was like, whoa, what the fuck, man? Like, you aren't answering, like, that's why. He's like, yeah, I heard you the first two times the last two days. I was like, I didn't know, bro. Like, you didn't answer that. Like, it's my job to just keep knocking. He's like, what are you selling? What are you selling? I was like, we're selling boilers and underfloor insulation. He's like, get off my property before I call the police. I was like, you can't call the police anyway because yeah, it's, it's, not it's not illegal. It's not illegal, yeah. Right? So he's like, okay, just get out of my property. Like, I was like, all right, mate, all right. Anyway, after the three seconds of him shouting, I left the door. I was like, who cares? Like, do you know how long it takes to knock on one door? that interaction, walk to the next door, because all the houses are next to each other, semi-detached, right? I've forgotten about that guy already. I don't even know what he looks like. I couldn't tell you what any single person looks like from all the days of me knocking on doors, not one. And I had like an hour and a half conversations with sometimes, with some people, because if I saw an old person, usually like the old men, because I could relate to them more. If I got the paperwork signed with them, right? and I thought they were cool. I'd speak to them for an hour, an hour and a half. I was like, it's better than knocking on doors, trying to make one extra sale. I might as well talk to this guy, talk to him about his life, try and get some knowledge. I'll just talk to him like, yo, so how were you like at 20? What were you like at 20? Were you in sales? What did you do to like, you know, if I felt like I had a bit about them. I was always trying to learn new things, like I say to you guys, and like Craig said earlier, you always wanna be learning new things because if you're just focused on the cash now, you're gonna be limited. That's why I believe so much in just talking to people on a higher level than you, better than you being around people who are more successful. That's why new money is so powerful. That's why I know a lot of you new money motherfuckers are watching this right now. Good decision, congratulations. But it's just so important to just be around people who are doing better than you because it just exposes you to new levels of wealth. So my mindset was I'm just a 20 year old broke kid knocking on doors all day. I was like, okay, I just need to talk to this guy here. Maybe he'll give me one piece of information. And a lot of those conversations taught me things. The main thing it taught me, not even too much about business, was just that life goes so fucking quick like so quick, a lot of you guys in my Telegram channel, you say, oh, Hassan, you're very much about like speed, 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 do this, do this, do this, boom, boom, boom. And I'm like, yeah, it's all about doing things now because I've seen these people, they're like 85 and I spoke to so many 85 year olds, 70 year olds, 90 year olds, and they've done nothing with their life. It just went by, they said, oh, I did this and I did that. And it's like, before you knew I was 60. Yeah, everyone says that, yeah. You know? So it's like, it just made me think I need to go so much harder is that what keeps you motivated then? The fact that yeah. you're gonna die and the shit's gonna go really, really quickly? I mean, it feels like yesterday, it was like New Year's Eve when we were at a party and stuff like this, but is that, is that what keeps pushing you even though you've achieved a hell of a lot of success at such a young age? But I don't look at it as success because in the New Money event, quick plug, we have a New Money official event in Warsaw, Poland on this, this weekend. So when you guys might see this podcast, we might actually be at the event, fuck knows. Anyway, it's like at the New Money Warsaw event, people were saying to me, oh, do you feel proud about your, do you feel proud of yourself? Do you feel happy with your success? It's like, not really, like, it's no, like, no. I don't view life like that. I just feel, I just view it like we just have to push hard every single day and then that leads to cool things. And then during that time, there's loads of moments we can look back on, but it's like, Is is there a big figure? Is there a big goal that you're aiming for? Is it just keep going? No, of course, no. What, you think if you have 100 million, you're happier than 62? Do you think you'll keep going this hard though? Yeah. For an extended period of time? What about kind of personal life and stuff like this, like family, things like that? What's your kind of viewpoints in that and trying to balance that with work? Yeah, so, but I, I consider all these things work, to be honest. I consider all these things work. Like I consider everything that improves your life work. So having kids technically in a way is work in my life. In, in my opinion, that's kind of work. So yeah, maybe in two years time, I'll start having kids at 25. Right now I'm 23. Maybe that will be a very, because the younger you are having kids, then the younger you are gonna be when they're, t- when they're 15, when they're 16. And when they have grandkids and stuff like that. Yeah, you'll just, you'll just yeah. be around, right? So I believe these things are all very, very important. But yeah, maybe I won't be so focused on like 
doing this, doing that, doing that, but I'll be focused on doing this, doing this, doing that. Like, I'll just be focused on other things, but I'll be going as hard. I can't imagine just sitting there on the beach in Mexico just being like, this is a good life. Because I've done that as well. I was traveling the world for two years whilst working, and it's like, I wasn't pushing as hard as now. And it's just, it's such a boring life, really. It's like, you meet this person, you meet that person, and you meet this person, and then you say goodbye. You say hello, you say goodbye after two months. Right, so after being in Miami for two and a half months, I met a lot of people, but they need to say goodbye to them. It's like, it didn't really mean anything. It's not fulfilling if you're just always meeting new people. So I kind of have a long-term view on a lot of things. But a lot of people say, how do you manage the long-term view with the short-term view? Because you're so much like, we need money now, we need to do this now, we need to do that now. And I say, you're only gonna get the long-term stuff you want by focusing on the short-term. So that's my mindset anyway, man. I'm kind of chill on that stuff. It's interesting, it's interesting. One thing that's I think is always an interesting question to someone that has a bit of a social media following is like, how do you manage kind of hate and stuff like that? How do you manage a lot of people viewing you and a lot of people having opinions on your opinions as well? It's just, I know there's gonna be some broke boys watching and it's just like, like, they're not to say this in the most humble way possible, but it's like, I'm balling, right? So, cause I'm balling, <laughs> no one's opinion really matters that much in the most humble way possible. I don't know how to say it anyway, any other way. It's like, obviously if I start speaking to Elon Musk, I'd shut the fuck up. And that's the thing about me. I know when to be a bit cocky and a bit, you know, make a joke here and there. But when I'm around people who I know are actually rich and actually doing very, very well, I just shut the fuck up because what can you learn, right? You, you can learn a lot when you're around rich people. When you're around broke people, you can still learn something, but in general, you can talk more, right? There's no point talking so much when you're around someone who can teach you loads. But yeah, I don't care about the opinions on Twitter because they're all living with their parents. They're all young idiots living in their basement. They've not done shit. And they haven't got a profile picture. If someone hated on me and they had yes, a profile picture, a point, yeah. I'd be like, my, my G, like, I respect the opinion. Like, I actually respect all the hate. Like when I make a video and someone re replies saying, bro, I fucking disagree with you, you're a piece of shit, but I can see their face. I'm like, all right, Gila, right. good for you. Like, I'd give him a fist bump. But if it's just some guy with no profile picture and he's got like seven followers, I'm like, he's not a real human. He's literally not real. If you can't see them, they're not real. If you can't see the money, it's not real. Like that's how I view life. If you can't see it, it's not real. So he's not real. That's how I view hate. That's good, that's good. And also you're always going to be judged. Like Ronaldo gets hate. Everyone gets hate. Elon yeah. Musk gets hate. So it's like, if you're not getting hate, you're not really doing much, so. Yeah, that's true. It's kind of how I view Successful it. people don't hate on other successful people. It's always the people that are a lower position, more unhappy with their own life that's gonna hate on someone else. One thing that I think is gonna provide a lot of value to people is like, what kind of routines or habits or things that you do regularly that actually improve your life? Like, is it going to the gym? Does that really help with you? Or is, is there something else that you do regularly that really helps? So yeah, I'm not, in the, I'm, I'm not in as good shape as I used to be. So I used to be like seven kg heavier, way stronger. But I'm still physically capable and I still would back myself in a fight against 95% of guys. Like, I know this because I've sparred a lot of people and I've always just win. I haven't got much fighting experience, but I just feel like that, right? So it's like, if you're physically strong, if you know, like if you spar a lot of people and you always win, you kind of get a certain confidence. And I feel like that helps in sales because especially in door-to-door -door sales, if you're in someone's face and... They're kind of like, who are you? Why are you at my door? But you know, like, you're, you're strong. It just gives you a different kind of confidence. So I believe you should definitely be physically strong. You have, to be, you have to be good at fighting to a degree. You don't have to be a pro, but you have to be able to know you can beat 90% of people up or something. Because if not, you're always going to just, I don't know, I'd be super insecure, I feel, if you're just weak. Like, you're six foot four, six foot five or whatever. So that's good. You don't even have to be good at fighting. You're just big. Yeah. But if you guys are just average height and you're not good at fighting, then you're just an average guy. I couldn't imagine that. So it's like, I used to be very strong. I used to deadlift like 240 kilograms. I used to bench a lot. I used to squat a lot. I used to lunge a lot. I used to do everything a lot. But then that was in uni when all I had to do was just party and go gym. And now all I want to do is just make money. And I feel like if I was this much better shape, I'd rather have two extra supercars. Like I can get the extra shape in a couple months. Like right now I've just been in the last six months I've done nothing but make money and just meet new people. So I, I think you go through different seasons and different chapters. And also it depends on what you're missing in your life. If, if you're right now really, really skinny, you're really insecure with how you look, then yeah, you need to focus a bit on the gym, like balance gym with money. But if you're in good shape, you're pretty confident, you're socially you know, charming, you can speak to different kinds of people, then yeah, focus just on money. Because even if you lose a couple points in talking to people in gym, you can get it back. Like muscle memory is a real thing. How you speak to people is a, a real thing. Like if you go partying every day, you're gonna be more confident in the room. 
yeah, dancing yeah, to the music. Yeah, yeah. Like if I went partying right now in like a uni accommodation, it's just a bit like, whoa, like, it's been a minute. It's been a few it's years. A, it's yeah. been a minute, right? So it'd be different. But well, after three parties, I'll get it back. So who cares? It's not deep. It's not deep. But with, with men, when it comes to making money, it, it takes a bit more time to just make millions. You're not just going to go from zero to millions quickly. But you can go from zero to a lot of fun after going to a couple parties. So I believe money is the most important thing as a guy because the other stuff you can get pretty quickly. But I think it's everything. It's not just you have to focus on making money and going to gym and speaking to girls and all these things. I think it's also how you speak and also your confidence and also your connections and also your relationships and also how you treat your parents and also your family and also everything. It's the whole package. If money's first, what is the second thing though? What is the second, third? What is... No, one second, let me rephrase that. I think money's first if you've got the rest of your life in pretty decent order. If not, then I think it's everything else but the money. That's why it's interesting. You see what I'm saying? I, see saying. I feel like when I was in uni and I got kicked out, I had everything but money. So then I focused on money and forgot everything almost. Yeah, that's interesting. So if right now you're an 18 year old, no, let's just say you're 21 and you're kind of broke, but you're in pretty good shape. Well then for you, money is the number one because you're all right in every other area. And if you learn how to sell, you're gonna speak better. If you make new friends, then you're gonna learn more information. I've learned so much from Craig. And Craig's learned a lot from me as well. I've learned a bunch from the new money guys, and you know, the guys inside of new money as well. It's like, Everything, everything connected anyway. If you put yourself out there more, then you get more opportunities, you get more connections. So I think focus on everything, but yeah, money is number one for most people. How do you look at, what's your mindset around risk and kind of decision-making within your business? Are you a big kind of risk at all kind of guy or are you more careful with your thinking, careful with your decisions, or is it just kind of action? No, but I definitely don't do things that I think are just fuck up this business, fuck up that business overnight, no. But I'm... I'm very risky when it comes to things that don't actually matter. And people might be like, yeah, obviously I am as well, but no, because most of you overestimate the consequences of every action you do. Oh, Hassan, I need to think about what I say on Twitter. Oh, Hassan, I need to think about this email. Hassan, what do I say in the sales interview? Hassan, what do I say in the sales job? Who gives a fuck? No one cares, no one actually cares. Like I said to you about the door to door, I've said so many bad things in door to door. I don't know, uh, I've, yeah, I've said, some, I've said some questionable things to certain customers <laughs> it's like like hot women at the door trying to chat them up and all this kind of stuff it's like like no one cares you know it's like no one actually cares like i can't tell you like i said earlier in this podcast i can't tell you what any of them look like i got a new phone now i lost a lot of their old numbers oh, they don't exist they really. don't exist They're not real humans like where did they live well where did they live you know what was their name what was the even street name and it's like when you start viewing life like this you realize just how indifferent people are to you. A lot of you are like, oh no, Hassan, what do you post on Twitter? How do you write so many tweets in a day? I'm sure people ask you that. Who gives a fuck? I just, when I have an idea, I just write it. Yeah, a lot of people overthink content, overthink things they're doing, but you're not gonna learn until you actually fucking try it, until you figure it out. Yeah, because what's the worst that can happen? I've put tweets out and people will say to me, is the mic good like this? Yes, I can like that. I've had tweets where people say to me like, I've had replies to my tweets where people say, Hassan, I've been following you for two months now and I have to unfollow you now. Oh no. Oh no. Like this is awful. I don't, it doesn't matter, right? It doesn't matter. So when you start realizing that, who cares? Like that guy who unfollowed you, who's never going to buy from you anyway, who's never going to be your friend anyway, who's never going to give you some useful information. Who cares? The reason why I post so much content on Twitter is to find the people like Craig who I want inside my private network. So it's like when you have that mindset, it's like, I call them Craigs. Like I always use the analogy. It's like, you just use the name of, you know? I'm looking for the Craigs. I'm looking for the other Craigs out there. More businesses started, more money coming in. I'm looking for those Craigs. I'm looking for the Craigs. I'm not looking for the Timothy 99 who's saying, yo, I have to unfollow you. Did you ever struggle with that right in the beginning though? Did you ever think if someone's messaging you like, oh, fuck you, oh, um, I'm gonna unfollow you. Did that ever affect you at all? Or are you just super used to it now? I definitely think you get better at it. You get better at everything. Even this is my first podcast. I don't know where to look at you. I don't know whether to look at this camera, this camera. But I'm not really overthinking like, oh no, this podcast, like this and that. It's like, I'm sure in the future I'll have a better podcast. I'm sure in the future I'll know where to look more. I'm sure I'll become better. You just become better. What's the worst case scenario that could come out of this podcast, right? Someone sees it and says, it could have been slightly better. Why was he looking at this camera instead of this camera or that? Yeah, Craig, why was he looking at that window and not this door and this? Like, 
you get better, right? Yeah. You read the comments, improve. But in general, it's like, yeah, I've definitely got better, you get better at everything, but I've never really given a fuck because I had that like confidence anyway. Like I was saying, if you're, if you're pretty strong and you're pretty good at selling and you're pretty good at speaking to people and uni is very talkative, you're gonna be okay. Like you're very good at e-com. So it's like that will always give you a certain baseline confidence. The fact that you put in X hours during COVID in you know, all these things. So what do you think about that? Just, do you think that's worth talking about how like when you have a certain level of skill, you have a certain level of confidence. I think it's right? super valuable, right? It's crazy valuable. And you can't, like, right at the beginning of my e-commerce journey, I was a fucking retard. Like, I had no yeah. idea what I was doing. And then you just keep failing, keep failing, and you figure it out. I think, like, failing super quickly is very, very important and being able to take it, take it on the chin. And, I mean, even when you get to a bigger level, I think a lot of people get scared to fail as well. Um, so as long as you keep in touch with being, having the ability to fail and the ability to learn, then you'll succeed in the long run. Yeah, 100%. I just think as long as you guys realize that the consequences are never that serious, unless you're fucking with the mafia or unless you're like trying to assassinate a president, like who gives a fuck? What are you, what are you actually doing? You messaged one girl, she didn't reply. And like also, I've, I think I said this story to you once. Maybe not, who knows. I remember messaging this girl in Miami because this girl in Miami, I saw her outside of a restaurant the night before, right? Saw her, got her Instagram or number, I can't remember the one. And I messaged her later that day or the next day or whatever, it doesn't matter. The point is I messaged her, she ignored me. I was like, what the fuck? I just spoke to this girl in real life. Like it was a good conversation, like whatever. But again, because I don't think much, I was like, whatever, she's just busy or, you know, she doesn't know me. I just met her for two minutes. So I messaged her a few days later, because I don't give a fuck. That's what I mean, when you don't give a fuck, you get just way more in life. And then she was like super on it. She's like, yeah, 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 like we can go for drinks, no problem. Anyway, just invited around, like didn't go anywhere for drinks, just had drinks at my place and you know, it was fun. So the point is, is like, if you just do things without thinking, you'll be fine. Obviously don't message that chick 10 times. Don't message a potential customer 24 times. No, don't do that. Don't call someone 24 times. In door to door, you don't need to knock 24 times at the door. No, but in general, it's like, just who cares? You guys overestimate the consequences of everything. Like a lot of the new money boys as well, they ask me questions like, yo bro, should I sell AI software or this software? Who cares? You begin selling X software, this one. And then you learn this lesson about sales, this lesson about sales, this lesson about sales. And then you have all these three sales lessons for the rest of your life. Then you're better at sales. Like I would have never thought that selling boilers was something I would have done in my life. I didn't wake up at 10 years old thinking, wow, I wanna start selling boilers. And I didn't think I'd still be doing boilers. Because I remember, you met my friend the other day in person. Yeah. Right? He said to me, actually it was him. He was saying to me, oh, um, you can't sell boilers forever. When I first got kicked out of uni. And now I don't think I'll sell boilers forever. And it's not my biggest income at the moment, but at one point it was, and at one point it was like the thing that got me started with a lot of other businesses, and I still sell boilers to this day. So it's funny how things work, you know what I mean? It's like, don't think so much like, will I be doing this forever, will I be doing that forever? Because so many of you guys are sat there thinking, I wanna be a copywriter, I wanna do this, I wanna do that, but I don't know how it's gonna make me millions. I'm sure you thought this when you first started e-com, like how is this e-com store gonna make me millions? It's only making me $100 a day, but it's like, you learned so many lessons from those $100. Those $100 taught you more lessons than the millions now. Yeah, literally. So don't worry so much about how am I actually making money now. Worry so much about what lessons am I doing and what am I pushing? Like how much am I pushing every day? What am I learning every day? And then by doing that, the money will come anyway. And I know that kind of go get, goes against my point about money in now. I'm saying you need to be very aggressive with implementing changes and implementing systems, but you can't physically create money if you're not good at a certain thing. You see what I'm saying? It's like, I remember someone made this quote once. It's like, you want to be aggressive with the input and then let the output take care of itself. Have you heard that? I haven't heard that, but. And it's kind of just so true. It's like, if you're really just aggressive with like, we need to do this, 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 then the results are going to be amazing anyway. I'm not saying you just have to be really aggressive and pray to God really aggressively. Like, I need money now, I need money. That's what I'm saying. I'm saying be really aggressive with the input. The output will be fine. Yeah, it makes sense. It makes sense. What are some of the biggest kind of challenges and hurdles that you've had getting to the level of kind of wealth you have today? Like, is there a big story where you were like, oh shit, like I'm not sure if this is gonna happen, not sure if this is gonna make it, or is there anything that stands out to you at all? No, it's just like, I feel like the more money you make, the more, oh shit, that must've been horrible on the mic. Sorry boys. The more money you make, I feel like it, the more it teaches you about the world. 
right? The more money you make, the more you learn about how the world works. I think it kind of teaches you the raw reality, the harsh realities of this world, about how life is competitive, about how you can't take everyone to the top with you, about how you have to leave certain people behind, about how you need other successful people around you, about how people don't really care about you unless you're useful to them, or people don't really care about you in general. All the people I saw in uni, the girls, the guys, everyone, who I partied with, everyone. As soon as I couldn't go to the parties, as soon as I wasn't in uni, you almost become not real. Do you see what I'm saying? Now, I wasn't like, I guess I wasn't messaging him that much either. But you know what I'm trying to say? I'm trying to say people don't actually care. No, they don't. Like, I could not speak to any of those people forever and they wouldn't care. Like, maybe one of them died. You wouldn't know. Could be. You have no idea. And like, you almost don't care. I know it sounds fucked up, but you just don't care. Not your close people that you used to know. I'm saying the people who were just like there in uni in the campus. I don't even remember their name. It's like, who cares? And you guys are sat there worrying about like, what do I message this client? Who gives a fuck? Like, I'm very much like that. Whenever I get a question in new money, someone asks me a question. Obviously, half the time I'll answer it. But half the time I'll be like, bruv, shut the fuck up. Like, this is a shit question. Like, you know the answer. They'll be like, thank you so much, Hassan. You're right. You know I'm right. Like, you know completely I'm right. And then they say, wow, I've made so much more progress. Because you just got to throw yourself in the deep end. Now, you don't learn swimming by reading a book on swimming. You learn swimming by getting an instructor and then actually swimming. You know, so that's why I see it. You talk a lot on your Telegram about putting your money to work. Yeah. How are you doing that today? And then how are you kind of going to improve that in the future? And yeah. how would someone get into that? And kind of when should someone get into that? Should someone earning fucking 10 Gs a month do that? Or someone only 100 Gs and above? I really think, I like to give nuanced advice. I don't like trying to say this is the one size fits all answer. Unless it's things that are obvious, like you have to have good people around you. That's why I'm so confident in selling new money because it's a network of people. You're gonna meet amazing people. You're gonna get closer access to me. You're gonna get closer access to Craig. We're now best friends and we met each other through new money. So certain things are a one size fits all answer. Like don't be a fat cunt, that helps. Have good people around you, that helps. Get rid of your loser friends, that helps. But in general, things like spending money, it depends on your goals. If you're very ambitious like myself, then you're gonna be spending a lot more of your money on just trying to create more cash flow. So whatever, like I said, things that improve your reputation and things that teach you things. Now, as you become richer and richer, you can start investing in stocks, crypto, property, businesses, you know, equity in this, equity in that. What other things can you invest in when you get rich? I think businesses is the best way to do it. Yeah, it is, that's what a lot of people... So yeah, I've, made, I've named the main few people. I remember I had a friend once, quick side story. I had a friend called, actually he wasn't a friend. He was someone I knew from school. We're just so used to saying friends, right? Humans are conditioned, they are my friend. When you think about it, you don't have that many friends. Cut the bullshit. So I knew this guy in school, let's just call him John. And John would say to me, Hassan, you need to get in the property ladder. Like he just messaged me one day, like, cause he had my fucking Instagram. He was like, Hassan, you need to get in the property ladder. I was like, what? Like, what do you mean? He said, yeah, 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 he needs to get in the property ladder, property ladder. I was like, what do you mean the property ladder? He said, yeah, man, because if you get in the property, what happens is if you invest like four grand in the UK, I think they give you one grand back. It's like this buy in to let yeah, bullshit, nice bullshit, thing. bullshit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was like, all right, like, okay. It's like, how much money do I need to put up? It's like, yeah, man, you just need to put a couple hundred grand in. And it's like, bro, like, I have no money. We're in school. Like, shut the fuck up. And from that moment on, I knew people were very, very stupid when it came to the whole investing thing. You can't invest money you don't have, really. Like, if I'm a brokey and I have no connections, I have no nothing, where am I going to get 200 grand from? So I don't believe too much in investing in property. And anyway, even if I invested in property, how, what percentage returns is it going to give me? It's like, in the UK, it's really low. Like, 5% or less, 6% or less. Like, I went from making £100 a week a lot of weeks and selling boilers, or £200 a week, or 300 or 400 in some weeks, to making you know, like more than 99% of footballers. It's like, and when I was younger, I wanted to be a Premier League footballer and now I make more than footballers. So it's funny how it works. But what is that in terms of an investment? A hundred pound to like a bunch of money a week. That's like, a, that's like, let's say 150K a week, average week. What's that? hundred pounds to 150 grand. It's 1,500 X, right? Yeah. No, wait. It's way more. No, no, it is. It is that 1,500x. Yeah. 1,500x. 1, I didn't 2x my income. I didn't 10x my income. A one point, 
That sounds so crazy to even. It sounds fucking. Weird. It doesn't sound. I feel like I fucked the massa, but no, I'm no, very sure. Fuck, but it's crazy different. No, that is difference. right. You're never. I've like one thousand five. Investing your cash back in the day is fucking pointless. Like you're investing a few hundred pounds is literally useless. Yeah. So if I invested all my money in stocks into crypto, when people were talking about the bull run, I'm happy to see all these crypto fucking geeks lose all their money. I've got a bunch of money in crypto, and I want all of them to lose all the money. Fuck them all. Fuck all the guys on Twitter like, yeah, man, my fucking Bitcoin's gone up today. Yeah, but for the last two years, you've been starving, my G. You've not made a single dollar. And now all of a sudden you're sat there thinking my, my Bitcoin this, my crypto this. So I'm happy as fuck to see these kids suffer because they don't deserve the supercars I have. Everyone in the bull run can buy supercars. I'm happy to see them suffer. So yeah, man, crypto and stocks ain't going to save you. Property ain't going to save you. That's why I don't believe in investing in these things early. As you get richer, then start investing in these things. Early on, completely yourself, completely who you know, traveling. I remember in 2020 February, I went to go meet Tate and I spent all my money, bruv, on that flight. Let me tell you guys a story to show you kind of the risks I was taking. Make it hundred pound a week, 200 pound a week with the whole boiler stuff, right? This was just before the whole COVID thing happened as we talked about earlier. I was thinking, okay, let me go to Romania to watch Tate fight. Cause one of my friends, you know, Vlad, we met him. So one of my friends, Vlad, he was like, oh, Tate's going to be fighting. I knew Tate was going to be fighting. I was like, fuck it. I'm just going to go to Romania. What, what? Like, fuck it. England's Romania. It's not far. But this was the night before. So let's say I was like one in the morning, two in the morning. I was just about to go to bed. It's like two in the morning. And the fight was like 6 p.m. tomorrow or whatever. I was like, let me look, let me look for flights now to Romania. There's no flights to Romania. That would get there in time. I was like, fuck it. I'll go to Bulgaria. And I have a friend in Bulgaria, power of connections. I have a friend in Bulgaria. He's going to drive me or we'll get a taxi somehow, to the fight. So what he did is he didn't have a car. He had a, his girlfriend though had a car. We used his girlfriend's car to drive from Bulgaria all the way to Romania. It took ages. We actually missed the fight. We missed, <laughs> <laughs> we missed Tate's fight. We missed it by like 15 minutes. Shows the power of speed. The motherfucker should have dri- driven faster. Anyway, we missed the fight by 15 minutes, but got to see Vlad, got to see Tate, got to see a bunch of people. And even though I didn't get to speak to Tate much, it was cool because later on, a year later, I got invited to his house and I got to spar him a little bit. It was fun to just talk to him. And I learned a few lessons. And it's like, I took a risk. I thought maybe something will come with this, you know? And then I got very close to Vlad. And then a year later as well, when I was in Romania again, I stayed at his house for two weeks. And then that opened my mind up to a lot of like other kind of lessons, not so much like business lessons in the sense of sales because I was already in sales, but more so business less, more so lessons about like, how to optimize your lifestyle, how to set up your life in a way where you're always, you know, just managing your time. Because at the time I was just working a lot and he had a very good setup in Romania. So you just learn different lessons meeting new people. So I spent all my money on that flight. And then in those three days I was in Bulgaria slash Romania, I obviously wasn't selling boilers because I was out. And my sales manager was blowing up my phone. Like, you should be knocking on doors. I was just thinking the whole time you're playing ping pong. So it's like, he didn't care anyway. He just wanted extra money. But like, I needed to do what was best for my life, my future. So I was always traveling, trying to meet people. I've, been, I've driven to like Cornwall, driven to Portsmouth, just trying to meet people, random people. Like, I just don't even know. Just doing anything to force a change. I just believe in doing anything. I don't believe in just sitting there waiting for the money to come in, the customers to come in, the phone calls to come in. I believe in just doing something to try and cause a change. Even if I learn one thing, it's worth it. Yeah, I think that's where we differ a lot. Like um, e-commerce is kind of setting it up, waiting, whereas your sales going out and fucking chasing it, taking the money rather than waiting for the money in a way. But it's just like, even with e-com, right? It's like, if your store's not making you sales, then you have to aggressively change the store, the website, yeah. your email campaign, yeah. you know, yeah. your packaging for the customer. So it's like, you're always changing something aggressively. Even if you're not risk averse, being aggressive is always gonna help you in business because the problems are never gonna fix themselves. You're never gonna have a business that has a problem and then you're like, yeah, give it two weeks, it'll be all right. You guys might think that, but it's not true. I'm telling you, it's not true. That's one of my best business lessons. Law 32 in my ebook called The 48 Laws of Money. It's free. Go check it out. I say in Law 32, I say fix the problem immediately. The problem is never going to fix itself. You have to fix it yourself. So if your PayPal's fucked up, if you're not getting customers, if your packaging's fucked up for your econ products, whatever the fuck. If you've got no money coming in, you have to fix it yourself. So you guys need to be more aggressive with whatever you're doing. You need to be the one selling. You need to be the one getting out there, making money happen, getting the money in. Switching it up a little bit, what are some of the biggest lessons or the biggest improvements you've seen in your life being in Dubai compared to, well, traveling a little bit and then the UK as well? Like, 
Why do you like Dubai? Is Dubai a very good place for you to live? Do you find it's very productive? Do you find it's more party-esque? Like what? I feel in Dubai, I like, so me personally, I like feeling like the small fish in a big pond. Like in England, if I was in England right now, back in uni with my, bro, I, I forget I have five supercars. Like I say it on Twitter a lot, like guys I have five supercars and I'm flexing on you guys. But I actually forget I do. Like it doesn't feel real yet. And the reason why it doesn't feel real yet is because one, I'm not partying too much. So I'm not seeing everyone go, whoa, like you come in a different car every day. And I'm very much like, I got my circle and like all my circle now is in new money. Like I'm only friends with guys in new money pretty much, like literally. Um, but if I was still in uni and I was pulling up to these parties with the Eurus and like insane. eight girls were in the back and like people that I used to know in uni were like, no way you got a Eurus. I'd be like, fucking hell, I got a Eurus, I'm, I'm a G. But I don't feel like that so much now because all my friends are rich. Like I have a friend making like crazy money, like just like 70, 80 grand a day consistently. And like, he's like my, one of my best, best friends. So it's like, when you see those kind of numbers, profit as well. It's like, what the fuck is a Eurus? Like, what the f this watch is 80K. Like I made last week, I had like a week where I made 70, I, made, I had a week last week where a day in that week, I made 79K profit in a day. So it's like, when you make 79K profit in a day, it's like, this watch actually cost 79K. No way, that's crazy. This watch cost 79,000 pounds. I made $79,000. So not the same, but it's crazy. So it's like, you just get exposed to more wealth. And today when I came out of the gym, I saw a Bugatti parked there. I had the Euros parked on the front. The other car at the front was the Bugatti. Oh, okay. And my friend who makes 80K a day knows that guy. And he told me, he's like, yeah, yeah, I know that guy. That's the guy who did XYZ. I can't say on this podcast, but. So you just get exposed to different levels. So being in Dubai is crazy. It opens your mind up. But what do you think? You've been in Dubai as well. I really like Dubai. I completely agree. It feels like a bit of a bubble because as you say, 23 five supercars like back in the uk you would control any town you'd be known across like any kind of small <laughs> medium size, size city like it'd be insane you'd be a massive target as well yeah. like huge target like you'd have to have 24 7 security back in the uk whereas here it's yeah it's just different. dubai is safe so what ends up happening is your subconscious mind right is always focused on the money and like doing things that are going to progress your businesses whereas in england right now i'll be thinking I can't wear this podcast. It's not worth it. Hopping in the car out the petrol station. Maybe someone sees me. They know who I am. They know the Euros. They see the number plate. They know who I am. Stabbing. Take the, take the watch. Whereas in Dubai, I never have to think like that. Because my friend, my friend and I the other day were talking about this. We said, we said that if we went back to England right now, we could easily pay for security 24-7 because we're balling. And it will be fun because everyone will be like, no way, you have a Euros, Euros, Lambo, this, this, this. But it's just like, Overall, you just make so much more progress in a city where you feel like home. And, and, and originally, I'm Arab, right? I'm originally from Lebanon. So I don't feel too English. My accent might be English, but I'm originally from Lebanon. I was born in England, but I feel Arab. So when I'm in Dubai, I feel like I've got oil money. When I'm in England, I just feel like it's got that crab in the bucket mentality. You know, it's like everyone's like just looking at everyone's pockets and like, it's different, man. I recommend you guys all move to Dubai, whether... You're in Miami right now, LA. I feel like Dubai is the best city in the world, but I feel like America is the best country in the world. I've said this many times. America is definitely the best country in the world. I don't think it's close. It's so diverse, As a country, yeah. it's the biggest. If you want to say which country is the most pussy, the most money, the most opportunity, it's America. America is the best country in the world by a mile. But if you're talking about what's the best city in the world, it's Dubai, not a question. It's so safe. Like I have five supercars and I park them anywhere with no fucks given. Like I can park it outside an apartment block, go see someone, get back in the Euros. Like nothing's come. ever gonna happen, yeah. Like ever. And like the other day, well not the other day, there was like a two, three week period like a couple months ago when you drove one up, was it the Lambo you had for a while? The Lambo, yeah, the Hurricane. Yeah. So I just gave Craig the Lambo for a while. It was basically his car for a while. And um, the car's insured in Dubai. In England, it's not the car that's insured, it's the person. It's the person on the car, yeah. So well, I can just give the car You wouldn't be able to insure it back in the UK. Like it'd be either crazy expensive or they'd just say no. And that's why I didn't buy a supercar for so long because I was in England and I had the money at one point when I was in England because I kept going back from my travels to England to travels to England. I was like, I can buy an Audi R8, I can buy this, I can buy a Lambo, but it's like, I couldn't get insured. And also it's like, I lost my driver's license in England. So I came to Dubai because I just kept speeding. I remember one day I was having an argument with some girl and I was saying to her, I can't get caught by cameras. I was like, I don't get caught by cameras. Look, have I ever been caught once? I speed all the time. You see me speed all the time. So you're going to get caught, you're going to get caught. Next day, caught, day after, caught, 
One week later, court, I think it was like, how many points is it in England to get banned? Nine? Twelve? I think it's Twelve, I think. Twelve. Okay, a month later, the fourth one, and then banned. So, England's just, it's difficult, man. It's difficult as a young guy to be living in England. I don't feel like it's set up to win. I feel like it's good for a girl. I feel like it's good if you're trying to work a nine-to-five job. I feel like it's good if you want to just... It's good if you like being taxed all your money and you like eating shit food and you like shit weather and you like shit... Yeah, just shit opportunities, I guess. London's good, but it's just like England just draining, man. The weather really fucks you. The weather does fuck you. Like, I've gone back to the UK a couple times. You've been in Dubai for a, for a while now. Like six months in a row. I went to Bali and Thailand for a little break, but besides that, just Dubai, Dubai, Dubai. Yeah, so. like the weather just fucks you, like completely and utterly. <laughs> You just have less energy when it's fucking cloudy, it's when fucked. it's raining, like fucking doesn't rain in Dubai. It doesn't rain. It's just like, I just believe in making the best move to give myself the best life. And I feel like in Dubai, like, look at my social circle, look at our you social circle. you think you'll be here for a very no. long time? I don't believe I'll be here in 45 years, but then I don't know if I'll be alive in 45 years. I don't know if I'll be here in 30 years, but I don't plan that far. I just plan like, right now, is, are things going well? Like, I could see myself moving to America in a couple of years when new money is, like, global and it's bigger than milk and bigger than all these things. Maybe we'll have a mansion in L.A., you know? Maybe we'll have a mansion in Miami. Not Miami. L.A., Los Angeles, Beverly Hills. Huge new money house, 40 people, right? Huge operation, huge headquarters, right? Assistants everywhere. We've got chefs, all of us working. Headquarters in Dubai. That's my vision for new money, by the way, guys. It's coming very soon. Mansion in Dubai, headquarters. Headquarters in the Netherlands. You have a very strong Dutch group. Headquarters in Canada, very strong Canadian section in your money. Headquarters in Australia. Headquarters in Miami, so what? So East Coast and headquarters in West Coast, LA and shit. So that's the next step with new money, having a headquarters in all these different places, having a base set up in all these different countries. So I don't know. I don't know where I'll be living in seven years, three years, two years. I don't plan that far. I plan the day. And when you just focus on the day, each day over and over again, the month, the year will be taken care of. If every day you make 20 grand, then in the month you'll make 600K. That's how I view money. I don't think, oh, I'm trying to make 600K this month. I'm trying to make a million this month. I think, all right, let's make 30K today. Yeah, that's completely true. That's it. <laughs> like out of our conversations, you always... And it's all fucking profit. I'm not like these broke fucking idiots on Twitter saying, I made 20K in a month and it's 3% profit. Because they have to pay all these people and they're just losers. So I just deal in profit. Give me 20K, 30K a day for me. And I'll be happy. For now. <laughs> you know, that's how I view money. But it's like, it's very easy to make money when you've got money coming in. Like we were saying about spending money. If, let's say, because I remember at one point I was making 3, 4K a day. I was like, 100K a month. It's pretty good. And then I was like, if I take this 3, 4K and invest it in this, invest it into Craig, invest it into this, invest it into that, I can start making 5K a day. Because let's say this operation is making me 1K a day. And then I'm making 10k a day, I'm making 20k a day, I'm making 30k a day, I'm making 40k a day. That's how I view money. That's how you guys got to view money. Let's say right now, you're making 2k a month, $80 a day, 80 pounds a day. You need to be sat there thinking, okay, I've got 80 pounds a day coming in. Where am I going to put this money? What can I spend 80 pounds a day on, which is going to give me 100 pounds a day in the future? Because let's say right now, you're making 80 pounds a day and you've got five grand in the bank. This is your situation. Two grand a month and you've got 5k in the bank. Who's more successful? The guy making... 2K a month with five grand in the bank or the guy with zero in the bank and he's making 40K a month. Who's more successful? The guy with 40K a month coming in because within one week, he's got 10K in the bank if he, if, he so cho- if he so chose to. So it's all about cash flow. But yeah, man, I think Dubai is awesome. I think the weather is amazing. I think the people are amazing. I think it's just about how you use the city. So many people say, oh, Dubai is not good for certain things or Dubai, you know, it's too hot. But then just go to Europe in the summer. Everyone does that, yeah, mate. Everyone complains Why are you complaining? about certain things. And and people, the UK is fucking freezing in the winter. It's like... and people say like Dubai is too hot. In the, like people say like Dubai is expensive. What do you think about the prices? I think it's cheaper. Than, it's, it has to be cheaper than living in like central London or something like this. Like if you think about this apartment... Like, amazing view. We've got a swimming pool downstairs, got a gym. It's a two-minute walk from a beach. Like, amazing views, right? How much would that cost in fucking central London? Well, like, double, triple the price? And you're living in London, with where you have to pay taxes. Yeah. And it's... London's certainly more expensive than Dubai. Canada, more expensive than yeah. Dubai. Obviously, like, Toronto and these places. These big cities in Canada, America, England, way more expensive than Dubai. Paris, more expensive than Dubai. 
I think especially for the tax benefits. Yeah, you save the money. So it's so certainly so cheaper. I'm talking about just the cost, forget tax. I'm saying just the actual, if you buy this, you buy this, you buy this. But one thing that's way more expensive in Dubai is like things like cigars, things like alcohol, like narcotics and shit. Alcohol, yeah. Very expensive. But cigar, like it's like 80 pounds in the cigar lounge we go to. But in Bulgaria and London, it's 30 pounds. Well, like- it's Substantially different. Double gin and tonic or something like this, like a vodka and coke is- Nice place, it's like 25, 30 pounds, up to like 50 sometimes. Yeah, in England might be like 15 even. Yeah. Like it's like just like very, different. very different. But then again, it's just Dubai doesn't promote drinking too much, so it's just different. But it's a good thing, right? Yeah. I, the one thing that I really like about Dubai that's very different to London, and we were talking with um, a couple of guys the other day about this, is like, here you understand the rules, and you know the rules, and you know if you break the rules, you're gonna get punished, right? If you do drugs here or something bad here, you're gonna get punished, and it's very, it's very, makes sense right it's very ordered here whereas back in the uk you can do you can do drugs you might get done for it you might not get done for it or you can fucking kill someone you can i don't know catch a case with gbh or something like this you might get done for it might not whereas here you're going to prison yeah i like ordered. that it just makes you respect the law more yeah and also it's just like i remember in england i mean everyone in england in the university was quite aggressive right I remember the reason why I actually got into this fight is because it's just ego, right? You pushing me, I'm pushing this guy. And then that's how the fight kind of happened, just pushing, pushing, pushing. Then we just like started punching, I just whacked him. And in Dubai, I could just never imagine that happening. I can't imagine getting into a fight because I know, I mean, also because I've learned my lesson because I had to go to court and everything. I'll explain that story in a second. But I remember just thinking to myself, like, I punched that guy, four of his teeth came out. Imagine he fell and hit his head and he died. I'd be fucked. So it kind of just humbles you in a bit because it's like, I've only been in two street fights in my life. I'm not gonna go into the second one at the moment. But, actually I can, fuck it. But both street fights, I won, but I actually kind of lost because I lost something. So it's still a, it was still an L. Yeah. So in uni, although I got kicked out of uni, it was the best decision, it was the best thing that ever happened to me. In the moment, it was an L. I didn't plan on being kicked out of uni. I didn't plan on being banned from the student uni and missing out on a lot of fun. I still went out and partied in the other clubs, but in the student union, I was banned. So I missed out on a lot of fun because I got kicked out. So I didn't plan it, you know? So how did the kind of court case go down? How did you actually end up getting kicked out? What was that? So it's actually kind of funny. And also it shows you why nothing actually matters that much. I remember one day I just sat there in my room chilling. Chilling, just listening to music, thinking I'm the fucking man, listening to 50 Cent, thinking I'm so much better than all these kids in uni fucking broke losers. And then I got a phone call. I was like, who wants problems? And I joke, and I answered the phone call. Someone was like, hello, is this Hassan? I was like, serious? I was like, hello? Like, hello, Hassan, you were supposed to be in the magistrate court today about the incident that happened on October. The... I was like, what the fuck? Like, this is legit. I was like, hello, like, what? I never got told about this. No one let me know. I was like, actually, like, worried. Like, what the fuck? I was like, who let me know? They're like, yeah, your uni should have let you know. I was thinking, shit. In the moment, I was like, no one let me know, no one let me know. As I was speaking to him, I was thinking, it was probably through my mail that I never checked in uni because they always sent me mail and they always told me, Hassan, you have mail. I was like, I don't give a fuck. If they want to come speak to me, they can't speak to me in person. I was like, I don't care. Like, in, in, in uni, you guys might think I have an ego now. In uni, I was just a bit, I had a very big ego because, yeah, I just had a big ego. I was young. So I didn't give a fuck about anything. And I wasn't trying to make money. And when you make money, it kind of humbles you because you realize how big the world is and all this shit. So I was just in uni, I was thinking, yeah, I'm not checking my mail. So I was like, oh shit, okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. Like, what do I do? Like, he's like, make sure you're here tomorrow morning. So March the 14th. And actually, what day is it? Is it March the 14th? It's the 15th. Well, no, it is the 14th. Yeah. It's the 14th. It just went past 12 o'clock. It's actually the 14th. So four years ago today, I went to court. Oh. That's actually very good for the story. Because I remember the date. It was March the 13th, I think I was supposed to go. And then March the 14th, I ended up going. Or it might have been March the 15th. It was definitely one of those two days. Doesn't matter. The point is, is, I missed the court hearing the first time. I went the second day. They basically said to me, the incident's too serious. It's like GBH. And I remember, I saw, again, power of connections. This Indian guy was at the magistrate court. He's like, super nice. Like, oh, bro, like, what are you here for? I was like, gee, like, just a fight in uni, some bullshit. The guy snitched on me, pussy, like, dickhead. He's like, yeah, man, I've been here like 10 times. Like, it's normal. I was like, all right, bro, good. He's like, you got a, you got a barrister? I was like, no. I like, I don't need one, do I? He's like, bro, bro, you need a barrister, you need a barrister. I was like, bro, give me a, give me a number, like, quickly plug me, G. It's about to be 10 minutes, they're coming. He's like, all right, all right. I, I remember the name, I don't want to say it just in case it has implications. 
So I called them, this guy came, this guy came. Started speaking to him. He, anyway, we're in the room. I was explaining the case and all this stuff. And he looked at the files or whatever. I can't remember exactly. He was just telling me, Hassan, you know there's a chance you might go jail. I was like, what the fuck? Because I thought magistrate court was literally, they were going to ch- fine me 50 pounds. And they were going to tell me, don't do it again. Because I still have that school mindset of like, life's not serious, no consequences. I like, it's a 50 pound fine. He was like, there's a chance of jail. And like, when you're 19, I was like, jail? What do you mean? I'm at like, one of the top unis in the country. I'm studying accounting and finance. I've always been academically smart. I've never really got into trouble. I was like, jail. So like, yeah, there's a very good chance you go to jail because this is looking like GBH case. I was like, what's GBH, bro? It's like grievous bodily harm. I was like, well, okay, well, what's that mean? He's like, this is like serious damage you've done to this guy. Like, look, four of his teeth. He's had to hit, he's had to get surgery on his mouth. So it was like a 30,000 pound operation for his family. They went private and all this shit. But I think he, he came from a very rich family because they paid it. Yeah. We'll get into that story later. And he was like, oh, okay, lad, I'm sorry. Like, is there anything? I was, I was about to say to the guy, I was like, is there anything I can do? He was like, no, bro. You just have to see how the hearing goes. Like, bro, like, I was like, you're a fucking barrister. You should save me. Motherfucker. Anyway, go into the room. There's like three judges at the top of the room, right? And then I'm like, I'm actually shitting myself a bit because now he said I'm going to jail. Like, the fuck? So they went in the back after they reviewed the case. And I think, if I remember correctly, they showed me on the TV in the room, I'm pretty sure, a picture of his mouth. I'd like to say, don't quote me on it, but like 80% likely, I remember they showed me a picture of his mouth. It was the first time I'd seen a picture. I looked at it, I was like, it's bad. Also, it goes on to another point about how it humbled me as well in terms of like how dangerous like street fighting is. It's like, that's why I never said I'll get into another fight again. I had another fight after, I'll explain that situation. They started on me this time. But what ended up happening was, it just, rem- it just taught me like, you don't want to get into street fights because anyone can do damage to anyone because this guy was a lot bigger than me. Back then, I was a lot bigger than now. Now, I'm skinny than I used to be. I was a lot bigger than now, but still, he was much bigger than me. He's like, your height, but like very, very built. He was a rugby player, but I was a bit drunk and he was a bit drunk and I backed yeah, myself in a fight. Luck, you can accidentally hit him in the wrong way, kill him, then you are Yeah, so I was like, and also, I'm humble enough to know, like, yeah, I caught this guy, but what about if I slipped? I backed myself in a fight against him. What about if I slipped and he caught me and just stumped on my face and grappled me? In grappling, he'd win. He's much, much bigger, and I'm not good at grappling. So I was like, shit, like, this is very dangerous. Like, he could have smashed my teeth out. Right? I was aware, aware enough to realize that. So it kind of made me think, I'd never get into a fight again. Anyway, back to the story. They said, yeah, sorry, we can't give you the verdict now. You're going to have to come to Crown Court. I was like, shit, Crown Court's more serious, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they're like, come back a month later. It was literally a month later. In the Easter holiday, I was thinking, fuck sake, like, this is fuck, I'm actually gonna go to jail. And then I went home, as soon as I went home, my friend picked me up from court. I remember going home and they were saying to me like, yeah, grievous bodily harm is serious. I remember asking people, they're like, yeah, serious. I remember searching online, minimum three years to 18 years in jail. I was like, 18 years, like, nah, it can't be that. But three years minimum, like, fuck. And I didn't tell anyone in terms of my family. My mom didn't know, my brother didn't know. I was like, I'd rather just go find out, worst case scenario, go to jail. I guess I'll call him from jail. I was like, jail. like, God, please, man, like, help me. So that month was a very stressful month. And I remember I was just thinking, this is shit. I remember just listening to loads of Tupac songs, thinking I'm a G, like, worst case scenario, I'll just handle jail, I'll be okay. So I was listening to a lot of 50 Cent. <laughs> I was listening to a Tupac song. What was it like? Ambitions as a Rider, all these songs. Like, he's talking about the penitentiary and all these things. I was like, I'm not going to jail, fuck it. So yeah, anyway, the court thing happened and it's super scary. Like no matter what someone says about court, it's super scary. That actually shaped my life a lot. You know, people always say, what made you, you? That actually changed my mind a lot because I come from a good background, not a rich background, not a rich family, not a poor family, just a standard, like normal kid in England. Obviously England's a privileged country. And I've always not really gotten into much trouble like with the law anyway, never. So it was like opening my eyes up a bit. I was like, shit, this is scary. I actually could go jail here. And like the way it works in court is like in Crown Court, you're behind a glass box. So the judge is where you're sitting. I'm in the glass box facing him like this. And then everyone else in the room, a couple of my friends and my friend's mom, and then the guy I punch and his family are facing the judge as well. So I'm here, I'm, the, I'm like at the back of the classroom. You're the teacher, you're the judge. So this is actually, I don't know how much detail I can give. I'm gonna leave out certain detail. Don't say names. No, I'm not gonna say names, but I don't know if I can say so. Anyway. I remember just being in that glass box thinking, I'm actually like fucked a bit. Like this guy, this judge can completely dictate how my life goes. And back then I didn't, I wasn't making money. So me being kicked out of uni was a very big deal because I knew if I went to jail, I'd be kicked out of uni effectively, right? I was like, this is very bad. 
in the end, what saved me from going to jail was because I was at a good uni and I never had any previous offenses and I only punched the guy once. Now, I remember the judge, he had a line in the court hearing. He said, Hassan, he paused for a second. I was like, fuck. So it made me very, 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 very happy to send you to jail today. I was like, fuck, you know, like, like fuck, you know. So I was like, shit on myself at that point. But anyway, long story short, I was okay. They gave me like suspended sentence for one and a half years. So if I did any other offense one and a half years ago, jail, and community service for 300 hours. So the maximum you can get in England is 300 hours. The minimum is 40 hours, right? So I was like, 300 hours, that's fine. Like, it's just unpaid work. I'll do it in the summer. So yeah, and then obviously I got a restraining order from going to the uni. I could never see that guy again. Like if I saw him, I have to just walk past him. But I was kind of scared because like this guy sees me in person. I can't hit him. He's just going to be like, he's just going to punch me. So it's kind of a weird situation. But anyway, yeah, when I went back to uni, those next two months, May and June, after me going to Easter holiday to court was probably the best two months of my life because that was such a low and that whole Easter holiday was like, shit, I'm going to jail for sure. And then that was such a high because I felt like the man and, you know, I didn't get kicked out of uni and I was still in uni. I just felt so grateful and it was summer. The weather was getting better in England and blah, blah, blah. So they were like the best two months of my life. But those two months, that whole court experience and I thought I was going to jail and the community service and everything just kind of taught me how like in the real world, certain things do have big consequences. And it's like most things aren't scary because that was pretty fucking scary because calling your mom from jail would have been very scary. And my mom's a pussy. I say this in the nicest, most respectful way. She's not like a lot of your moms where she's kind of like, she can handle something. She's just a pussy. So she would have been like devastated. So that kind of shaped up my mind a lot, my mindset. It just made me think like, you have to just make the most of now. Things can change quickly. Life is short. Things can happen quickly in the flick of a switch and all that kind of stuff. Guys, we took a bit of a break. Hassan was doing some weird stuff. So we're Pray with smoking straight. cigarettes. <laughs> we're hopping straight back in. But the first question is, why is network so important? And I think, our relationship is a very good example of why network is so important. Yeah, so you are the sum of the five people you hang around with the most. Everybody knows that, everyone's heard it. I remember hearing it as a young kid, but I remember never actually acting on it. I remember thinking, yeah, yeah, whatever, but I'm friends with these people from school. And this is the thing that's very, very interesting. When you're friends with people from school, it deludes you into thinking like you're gonna be friends forever because of proximity. Because I see you every day in class, you're now my best friend. But in the real world, it's like you can become friends with anyone. In real life, in day-to-day -day life, you can meet people in the gym, you can meet people out and about and playing basketball, you can meet people at cigar lounges, at conferences, at like a million places, so literally anywhere, right? At the hotel, swimming pool, wherever the fuck. So you literally can become way more selective in which kind of friends you want because when you actually think about it, a lot of the friends you had in school weren't really your friends. When you really think about it, they were your friends in some ways, they were funny, but they wouldn't be people you would actually wanna hang around with in real life if you had unlimited options on people who you spent time with. It's like in school, there was limited people so you had limited options. Whereas in the real world, in real life, you have unlimited options. Now, here's another interesting point. Before, people used to just date each other in real life. Like they used to just meet each other in real life. Now, online dating became a huge, huge thing. And then I feel like people are still like five, 10 years almost behind the whole online communities thing. Like the reason why new money is so powerful, we know why it's so powerful. And all the guys in new money find it so powerful. But other people like the masses, they don't realize how powerful this is. They understand why dating is now online. Tinder, swipe, swipe, Instagram, message, message, DM. But it's like online communities are now the new way to make friends. We're like best friends now, we hang around all the fucking time and it's like we met through new money. I'm good friends with Fahim, I'm good friends with Louis, Hans, Dylan, ha Abs, all these people I met through new money. So it's like, besides meeting people through online communities, how else are you gonna meet like-minded people? It's very, very hard to just find someone in the gym who also is very good at making money, also cool, also you get along with, also has free time, also you're gonna have the right conversation at the right day. It's like, it's hard to bump into people in, the, in real life, right? You don't just bump into them in, on the street. Whereas online communities, you know, everyone in this community all thinks a certain way. And the reason why new money is so powerful is because every single person inside of new money well, 95% of the group is between the ages of like 17 to 27, 28. Most of the group is in Europe or America or Canada or Australia or Dubai, right? That's pretty much it. That's the majority of the group are in these countries and they're between these ages. So if you know all the people are between those ages and from those countries, you're gonna get along well, right? Like if Craig was from Zimbabwe, right, and he was 74, we wouldn't get along as well. It's like in Tinder, if you're swiping, you kind of choose your friendships with the online communities, right? And also like, if you're from Zimbabwe, well, we're just from a different culture, you know? And you're 74, I can't relate to you as much. Maybe what you want is different than what I want in life. 
But now we're all focused on making money. We're improved. We, you know, we're focused on having fun in the buy. It's just we get along well. So I think network is super important, man. And you don't know the value of a network until you have one. That's yeah. what you were telling me this morning. Yeah, like you wouldn't have known the business that we could do together without meeting me. Like if you don't have a network, you don't have like business friends or friends that are related in that. You don't, you can't really comprehend on what you're missing out on, right? You just have no idea what you're missing out on completely and utterly. It's the same like you meet your best friend ever or like you meet your wife or something like this. Like if you just never met her, you would never know what you're missing out on. But then you did, and you found happiness, you found fucking whatever the fuck, right? Yeah, and people, it's just people think that dating online is so normal, meeting people online is so normal. They think it's so normal swiping on Tinder. When you think about it, they're a stranger. What's not normal about meeting people in online communities who all want the same things as you? Money, going to gym, improving their life, all these kind of things. So, and that leads on to another point. Like a lot of people kind of get this impression that new money is, you know, just random people talking to random people. It's like, it's literally a brotherhood at this point. There's so many people who have moved in together Right? There's a bunch of guys right now in Miami together. There's a bunch of guys right now in the Netherlands living together. There's a bunch of guys in Colombia living together. There's a bunch of guys in England living together. And we have different groups for different topics. So if you're a Dutch guy, if you're an English guy, we'll obviously add you in all the main rooms as well within your money, but you're also gonna be added into the separate group just for the Dutch people. Like, think about how powerful that is. It's crazy. It's crazy powerful. What are the biggest, most common questions you get asked about new money? Obviously, you answer a lot of questions. What are the biggest ones that you get asked over and over again? People say to me, like, is new money a sales room? Is it an e-com room? Is it a trading room? Is it about OnlyFans? Is it about this? Is it about that? It's about all these topics we've just mentioned, right? New money is a private network. That's like the main focus of the group. It's a network. But we have a ton of video materials on all these things. So new money is good for someone who's between the ages of 17, 28, 17, 27, 18, 27, around those ages, right? I'm 23, so I attract a lot of people around my age. You're 23, right? 22. Just done 22. Craig's 22, I'm 23. So people around our age, it's best for those kind of people, right? Obviously you can be a bit younger, you can be a bit older, no problem. But it's mainly, mainly for people who are ambitious. If you're ambitious, you're gonna do well in the group, right? That's it. There are daily live calls, there are unlimited video materials. You have like, what, 40 video, 40 hours of videos. It's like fucking ridiculous. So there's tons of video materials inside of the group. So it's for anyone who's ambitious trying to make money, but the main focus of the group is making money online. Because if you make money online, you can be in Dubai with us. You can be in Africa doing a safari tour. You can be in Colombia dating Latinas if you're into that, <laughs> right? You can, be in, you can be in Iceland. We had, we had a meetup in Iceland like a few weeks ago. It was just like a few guys there. I wasn't there, but they're just in the fucking water, like, like tensing. I don't know, like the cold Icelandic waters. Yeah, the blue, yeah. The blue lagoon. Like, yeah, or, blue no, lagoon. that's the hot one, isn't it? Or the, yeah, yeah, that's the hot one. Somewhere else in Iceland, some fucking place, I don't know. The point is, is like you have all these people you can travel with, make money with, learn from. Like I know nothing about e-com, now I have e-com stores. Like I can say I'm an e-com, well, kind of. Yeah. E-com store owner or whatever. So it's like, you don't know what you don't know. That's why networks are so powerful. So on that point, what is the biggest misconception? So what is something that people just don't understand about new money? People just think that new money is just a random group of random people talking and people, and you're just gonna kind of join the group and you're gonna be left alone. There's one-on-one -on -one coaches when you join new money. There are daily live calls, so it's literally impossible not to succeed. Like you do two, three live calls a week, right? People can just DM you about e-com. They can just DM me about sales. They can DM this guy about fitness. They can DM that guy about OnlyFans. They can DM this guy about OnlyFans. They can DM this guy about trading. All these different things. It's very, very, excuse me. It's very, very hard to fail if you join your money because there are so many avenues. There are so many materials. There are so many resources. The people inside of the group is fucking amazing. It's literally impossible to fail. As long as you're humble and you're supportive and you're likable and you try your best to just yeah, just do your best. You're gonna get along very well with everyone else. It's not for people who are kind of just thinking, yeah, this is gonna be my easy ticket to wealth because there's no such thing. This is a network and we will show you how to make money. You will make more money, but it's not like you're gonna join the group, you've paid the money, now you're a millionaire. Of course not, it doesn't work like that. So the biggest, mis the biggest, the biggest misconception it's probably people just think it's a certain thing, like it's only a sales thing or it's only an e-com thing. It's everything and it's a network and we have lots of meetups in real life. People think it's just an online thing. It's very, very heavily focused in real life. We have a meetup in Warsaw in two, three days time. 
hundred and hundred hundred and ten people in the US, in the UK, I literally every country. Yeah. That's that's a super interesting thing. That's like one of the big reasons that I joined is to make friends in real life, right? You can make friends online, but when you meet people actually in real life, it's very, very different. So what are the major countries and like what is the country demographic of people that are inside of New Money? Europe, Canada, America, Australia. These are hundred percent the main place. I mean, obviously Europe's a big ass place, right? It covers a lot of the countries, but yeah, America, Europe, Canada, Australia. These are the main places for sure. That's good. That's good. Is there any countries that you want more people from, or do you like the way the group is right now? So obviously, a lot of Western kind of first world countries, a lot of very interesting, valuable. People. I like it that way because if someone from Canada joins the group now, I know they're going to get so much value because all you need to do is just meet one person, and then the group is worth. Millions. Like me and you meeting is now gonna, is like in the future gonna make us millions, right? So it's like, all you need to do is meet one person. So if you're from Canada, you're from Australia, you're from America, you're from Europe, especially England. If you're from England, there's so many guys from the group in England. Like we had that meetup in five guys, 10 guys just turned up to that restaurant. Yeah. And then we had another meetup somewhere else, the Gar Lounge here, the Bulgari Hotel, this restaurant in Mani in Nottingham, all these places. If you're from England, you're in luck because England is the most popular country in the group, I'd say, alongside America now. Yeah, America is going very big. Switching the topic up a little bit. Okay. You've got a reasonable following on Twitter, especially on the kind of money Twitter side of things, right? Yeah. Reasonable following. How have you achieved that? Like, there's not, there's loads of people that try Twitter, but how have you actually achieved to get to the level of following you're at like 60, 61,000 followers right now? I mean, someone asked me this question the other day and I said, who else has five supercars at 23 on Twitter? And it's actually very true. I mean, you guys, you guys let me know if you find anyone. But there isn't really anyone. So that obviously helps. That boosted up my following a lot. But even before, I was just... I think people just fucked with what I said because they can tell it was just real. Like, I know what I'm talking about. And also, a lot of times people say to me things like, especially with my voice notes, they say like, Hassan, I feel like I can actually... Like, you seem like you know what you're talking about. I'm like, really? Like, no, like, of course, you know? So it's like, when people listen to me, it's a lot different than when they, you know, when they see me write. And obviously on Twitter, people see you write, but sometimes I put a few videos out there and also it's because of a Telegram channel, I develop like a bunch of people who actually really like what I'm saying. So then they end up liking a lot of my tweets. If you only just post words, then you're limited, right? Because you like everyone else. There's no competition with you and someone else. I could copy your whole Twitter account tomorrow if it was just words. I could write all your e-com tweets. Yeah. Guys, Etsy this, Etsy that. I don't know anything about Etsy, right? But when you have videos and you have you speaking and you have, and you show lifestyle like the cars, it gives you a certain level of credibility which a lot of people don't have because a lot of people are just trying to give advice when they're 18, they know nothing. Yeah. I'm not judging, but I'm saying, actually, I'm kind of judging. I feel like you shouldn't give advice at 18 or not even if you're 18 because I know millionaires at 18. It's more so a case of like, just talk about things you're going through. Like if I was to start my Twitter account again at 18, when I was in my gap year, I would have just said, yo guys, another big day in the gym. Time to drink this 2,000 and a half, 2,500 calorie shake. It's probably gonna make me feel sick. It tastes like cement, but fuck it, we're gonna drink it. Likes. I've seen loads of young guys build a following on Twitter. And the thing is, is even if you haven't got anything to sell right now on social media, Instagram, YouTube, or Twitter, I feel like you should still build a personal brand because you can sell something in the future. As long as you have attention, you can always make money. And law, law number one of the 48 laws of money is called attention, aka traffic. If you get a traffic on any business, you'll make money. How do all these fucking Pornhub, Pornhub websites and fucking all these porn websites, how do they sell so many dick pills and all these things, right? It's a scam of a product, right? You can sell a scam if you just mass market it. So sheer traffic, sheer volume does pay. Like, ideally you wanna sell something good, and I always say long-term you wanna sell something good, but these fucking, like, dick pill websites and stuff, they just promote mass market advertising, right? I remember my friend told me about this once. He was the one who told me about this. I was like, that's the fucking smartest thing I've ever heard. Again, power of the network. I heard my friend say, yo, these dick pill companies, like how, like, because everyone knows those kind of stuff don't work. Yeah, everyone knows. Yeah. Everyone knows it doesn't work because every, yeah, everyone just would know, right? It would be common knowledge that like, dick pills work, buy this pill for X number of dollars, now your dick is 12 inches, right? Everyone knows those things don't work. So why do they work then? Because they're targeting an insecurity and they're pure volume, pure attention, pure traffic. And if you can get traffic on any product, you'll make money. A lot of you guys online have a decent product, a decent service, you're a good copywriter. But you're, ge you're getting beaten by the guy who's not a good copywriter. 
So I am not a good copywriter. I've never claimed to be a good copywriter, but I guarantee I could become a better, better as in make more money. I can make more money as a copywriter than any of you guys watching this because I have more followers. If I said tomorrow, guys, I'm a copywriter, I'm gonna start writing your emails. People will trust me just because I've got followers. 1,000%, I know I'd make millions. Like, it's not even a question because I have the attention, I have the volume. So it's not really about who's necessarily the best. That helps get to the next, next level, but it's mainly just about pure attention. That's why it's law number one in the 40 loads of money. So how did I build a following? I feel like I was credible and I tweeted a lot and I can speak well and all these things, so. Was there anything that like boosted it a lot? Was there any like couple tweets that you really did that just took off your account? You gained a couple thousand followers from right, right in the beginning. It was just or like was it just a slow growth. A slow. I had a couple tweets here and there, but nothing crazy. Just like someone saw a picture of me having fun in Mexico or something. You know, nothing particular. Um, Obviously, you've got a bit of a following on Twitter for sixty thousand. It's crazy for money. It's big for money. Twitter, still small, very small compared. I mean, to I'm that. starting to be recognised now more. So yeah. you know, your boy's getting some clout. But um, no, I'm not trying to get clout so much so quickly. I know that's going to come. I mean, even if we chopped up this podcast here, we could get loads of clips. Get the new money guys pump it everywhere. It's not the biggest goal. Just clout, traffic, clout. Like there are other parts in business that are important. There are other areas of life that are super important. But yeah, today I was in the gym. Someone recognised me when I was in the Euros. Um, I was just on the Twitter space actually. Oh really? It's like like you like you put his hand like this like you wanted a handshake. Open the card, I'm like yo G, what's up, bro? Like he's like yeah, I'm this free Telegram channel. I was like my G. I feel that's cool. Why aren't you need money? <laughs> and he's like yeah, bro, I'm gonna join in one or two months. I've just been super busy relocating to Dubai. I was like you motherfucker, fuck off, I'm blocking you. I'm joking, I didn't block him. He seems super cool, but um, yeah, it's cool. You know, at the end of the day, that's how powerful Twitter is. That's how powerful connections are, right? This guy he trains every day in Benus Gym, the gym we go to. And he said he's there every day and we go a lot. So, you know, we can see him. Like let's say right now I was lonely in Dubai, Craig wasn't here, Fahim wasn't here, my brother wasn't here, no one was here. I can just make a bunch of friends just from the guys in New Money, just from people who know me from Twitter. Like it's so powerful. And so many times I've asked questions on Twitter, like guys, who has a plug for Dubai residency? Guys, who knows, who's got a fake vaccine for how, like going to Bali? Who's got this, who's got that? You just get the paperwork done, people DM you things, people can, People are useful, you know, people are useful. Yeah. I'm so bad at so many things. That's what you guys might not realize. You might be like, this guy's got five supercars. How does he have this? Like, I'm good at only a couple things. Like there's so many of you know so much more than me about so many things. Like I'm so bad when it comes to basic things like crypto wallets, cameras, lights. What the, like mic, what the, how do I set up this microphone? I don't even know where this is attached to. I don't give a fuck. Craig just says start speaking in it, right? So you don't need to be good at a lot of things. I couldn't even imagine setting this up. I don't know how you did it. I don't know, I don't care either. So a lot of people just try and learn how everything works. How does crypto work? How does Bitcoin work? Mm, how does Bitcoin work? Who cares? Just buy it. Like, yeah, okay. Well, don't buy it if you're a brokey, but buy it when you have a bit more money. Buy property. Who cares why property holds value, really? Just buy a house and buy. It's going to do pretty well. Done. That's my opinion on life. I think people think too much, and then they ask me these questions like, Hassan, how do you not think? How do you just take action? It's like, by not asking those questions. Like, you know what to do. You know that if you had a better network, you'd make more money. Do you think that if you were friends with me or not, you'd make more money? You'd make more money. Do you not think that if you work three hours a day instead of one, you'd be more successful? Like people always say on Twitter, like, deep work, deep work, deep focus. What does that deep focus mean? I understand it. It's more sellable. Like if I told you guys all the time, yeah, all I do is work two hours a day, but deep work, buy my course on deep work. Yeah, I know it's sell because you guys in general, not necessarily you guys, I trust that you guys are smart enough to understand you have to work hard in life, but it's more of a case of, People want to be sold a lie almost. Like they want to be sold a dream. It's easy, it's easy. I don't like reporting that message because it's not true. Like you have to work very, very hard. Get to work. Like that's it. Stop trying to think so much. Stop trying to think your way into success. I always say that people try to think their way into success. Just work your way into success. Just out, like volume your way into success. Input your way into success. Just pure input, pure volume, pure traffic, whatever you're selling, right? Boilers, just pure knocking on doors, pure phone calls, pure follow-ups, pure referrals. So that's that. As you gain more and more followers, obviously you're gonna get more and more people inside and new money. Is there gonna be a cap for the group? How do you see the group progressing as it gets bigger and bigger and bigger? Yeah, um, I see it progressing like, there's just gonna be more and more harsh challenges to stay in the group. The quality of members inside the group are just gonna get better and better. And also like, I'm very long-term thinking with this group, like, it's gonna be crazy. But the guys at the moment who are like 21, when I was 21, I wasn't doing that well. You know, I was like starting to get into everything. 
So when I'm 23 now, I'm doing very well. It's like things can change quick in two years. So all the guys in your money right now who are hopping on the live calls every single day, they're 21, they're 20, they're 24. By the time they're 23, 24, 26, 27, think about how powerful everyone will be, how strong everyone will be. Like so many people will be out here in Dubai living on the palm with us. It's gonna be crazy, so. In terms of a cap, I don't think so much like that. I just take things one day at a time. But what I do understand, there will be way more strict challenges to stay in the group. That's good, that's good. That's how I see it. In terms of, obviously you got a couple of followers on Twitter, right? But in terms of kind of wider popularity and fame, is that something that you want? Do you want kind of, obviously, huge name recognition like someone like Tate, for example? Do you want that kind of fame and the kind of downfalls, and obviously the positives that come with it? Yes, it's, it's an interesting question because I always feel like humans want to be recognized for something or appreciated for something. But I don't know if I want like as much fame as possible. But then again, like it's not that I want the fame, but I feel like it's almost kind of be, going to be inevitable because of the way I view the world. The way I view the world is just constant progress. And like naturally, if you're progressing so much in businesses, I feel like it will happen. But then again, I don't need to be on camera. I could just grow a brand that kind of revolves without me being shown. So I don't know too much on the whole fame thing, but I, if I was to put money on it, yeah, I think I will become very, very known. But it's not something I like think I have to get that, if that makes sense. Like it's not something I, I, I could die having never been famous and I'll be okay. But then again, I couldn't die not being rich. Like I couldn't die having never experienced just turning up to a hotel with a girl, driving whatever car you want, buying your mom whatever she wants, eating where you want. Like we just go to a restaurant, you pay, sometimes I pay, like okay, like just, yeah, like imagine just like checking the bill, like oh, 16, 24, and like, it's just like, I couldn't imagine that life. So I understand, like I remember everyone did it when they were younger, and like when you were younger, like money's more, you know, it's hard, like, I get it. Well, it's but more it, hard to come by, you don't know how to make it. Yeah. yeah, and it's like if you're getting paid seven pounds an hour, your friend who owes you 22 pounds for dinner, it's three hours of your life, like it's, oh. it's more of a big deal, of course, I understand it. But it's just like, I couldn't not experience a life of riches, but I could ex not experience a life of fame. Like sometimes, because I have friends who are more famous, like I'm not famous at all, I'm saying, I have friends who are actually famous and like they tell me some stories of things that have happened. It's like, there are a lot of pros, but there are also a lot of cons. But also what I believe in general is like a lot of you guys are scared to write an email. Like, don't worry, G, you're not gonna become famous from an email. You know, you know like you need to relax. You're just writing an email. But yeah, if you're putting yourself out there like crazy amounts, like, I'm not putting myself out there crazy amounts at the moment, but you know, as time goes on, thing, you know, we'll see. But look at Mr. Beast. I don't think he has really any downfall, does he? Is no. there any cons of Mr. Beast's fame? I mean, maybe you can't walk in a fucking, you can't walk into anywhere. You can't just pop into a supermarket when you're Mr. Beast. But is that good? Is that is that bad? Sorry. I think that's bad, right? Like, what if you just wanted to go to a restaurant with your boys or with your girl? But you just, you just go just to the most. You get interrupted. You just go to the most exclusive restaurants on the planet. Yeah, true. Like out here in Dubai, I feel like people are very respectful of fame. I've seen very famous people in Dubai on the, on the, in the mall and I haven't interrupted them. I saw professional footballers, I've seen Ame Khan. I've seen, uh, who else did we see? We've seen some people, I can't remember their fucking names. Whatever, like, it's not important, but no, I saw a tweet about someone seeing Roger Federer in Dubai, not me. Um, but we saw someone who arguably, I think, plays tennis. That's why I said Federer. But yeah, it's not important. The point is in Dubai, I feel like no one really interrupts you so much. Oh, it's pissing me off now. I know, I've seen a few people as well. Like, I've seen Mike Thurston. I don't know if he counts as famous, does he? I would say. Okay, then I've seen Mike Thurston. I've seen... I've seen like a very professional, very famous bodybuilder in the gym. Two of them in Benus. Yeah, I've seen a few people. There's more I've just forgotten, guys. Well, fuck it. But yeah, people don't really interrupt them. Again, that's why I've forgotten because I didn't stop and interrupt. Whereas in England, like you'd be bombarded. Yeah. Someone like Fredo or Central Sea or these rappers. Yeah. I don't know, we'll see. I don't think about that so much. I just think about the daily and then we see where life takes us. Because if you're always focused on like, do I want this, do I want that? It's like, bro, you're 37 and then like these years are behind you. You might as well focus on maximizing these years and then in the future, you just see where you end up. And like in the middle of you doing certain things, then you can see like, do I like this, do I not? Because you're not just gonna accidentally one day wake up as fucking Christian. Yeah, you go from zero to a hundred. It's a, there's a bit of a process to it. Yeah. Like you just don't go straight to a fucking A-class celebrity level kind of thing you start way fucking lower and build it up so i don't think about it yeah okay what what are your thoughts on actually girl? actually i want to quickly revisit that Definitely. and then we'll get into that i want to quickly say i that was me talking about like fame fame 
I think Clout is very, very good. I want to make that point clear. I don't think I made, I didn't mention that point. Clout, I think, is very, very good. If you have, like, my following now on Twitter, or just, like, even five times the following, like, just a bit of clout. Actually, 300k on Twitter is a lot. I think influence is very good. Right, you can have, like, a couple hundred k followers, but if you're extremely well-connected with yeah, the yeah, community, yeah. that's worth way more than millions. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. There's some Instagram fucking thoughts that make fucking, like, 5k a month, 10k a month. Like, and they charge for their story promo $200 <laughs> yeah, for a day, because yeah, I've yeah. DM'd them for, like... And they have zero influence. Whereas there's some big accounts that have 100, 200, 300K and they have crazy influence and earn crazy respect within the community and have crazy perks from it, right? So yeah, I feel like, I feel like clout is good. I feel like if you have clout, you're gonna be all right because you have enough connections. People also respect you more if you have clout. Like I said, if you wanna be a copyright, people respect you more if you have a few followers. Even if you have 3,000 followers, it's better than 100. But if you have 3 million versus 300,000, you could argue there's big, big differences. You could argue there's a big difference between 3 million and 30K. But 30K and followers, let's say you have 30K followers versus 100. Like 30K is still nothing. Like you're not recognized on the street all the time. I've been recognized like what? Nine times in, my, in the whole of Twitter. Nine, 10 times. It's nothing. In two years. A couple times recently. Yeah, but it's been, <laughs> actually yeah, very, actually yeah, that's two, no, that's two days. Yeah, three times I think. But yeah, it's because the supercar flex is getting crazy. Yeah, what was the next question about girls, what? Girls and relationships. What is your own kind of mindset on that? Are you, is that going to be a huge focus for you? Are you going to get kids very soon? Wives, things like this? Yeah, so I was talking to Fahim about this. So he wants, he wants to get married. He does, yeah, he doesn't mind me saying that. He wants to get married at the end of this year, I think. I don't know if I want to get married at the end of this year, but I feel like I will have kids at a young age because I feel like the earlier you start, like we talked about this earlier, the better. Yeah. Right, I feel like if I'm 40, and if I'm worth hundreds and hundreds of millions, or whatever, a few million, whatever, if I just keep the same wealth, no matter what the situation is, I'm at 40, and my kid is 14, 15, like that's sick, that's 15. Because so cool. some people have kids at 40 when they're a dad. Their wife gives birth to their son when, or their daughter when he's 40. And if you're 40, then when you're 60, 63, your son's my age. You might not even make it to 63. So that's kind of how I feel. I feel like I'm gonna have kids at a very young age, maybe yeah, one or two years. In terms of girls though, yeah, I don't know, because I've seen a lot of people on Twitter recently say like cheating is bad, cheating is this. I just think there's nothing wrong with just banging a bunch of hoes, all right? Like, I just don't think there's anything wrong with it. I feel like if you're just saying to the chick that if you're saying to your girlfriend, yeah, I'm not seeing anyone else but you, and then all you've been doing is just sleeping with all her friends, everyone she's ever known. That is fucked up. Like that is completely fucked up. But if you're just sat there and like when you get caught, you're kind of honest about it. I think that's I think that's okay. Do you want to have multiple wives in term kind of? Yeah, I mean even Islam. even in Islam they say like four wives is like okay as long as you can provide for them. And I think that's again why it goes back to money because a lot of guys on Twitter I see all these accounts popping up like how to date, red pill this, red pill that. It's like. If you're a millionaire and if you're in reasonable shape and if you can speak English, no, I don't mean like speaking English, you can speak whatever language. I'm saying if you can speak reasonable of any language, if you can actually just speak some words, you're gonna be okay with women, right? So I feel like as a guy, you should be focusing on all the other things you need to get your chicks anyway. Like bro, I've seen, like I've just seen so many girls in uni like that had nothing, you know? It's like, and I've seen other people who are absolute losers, they were getting with a bunch of girls in uni and it's like, they had nothing going for them. So it's like, you don't even need much going for you. Girls, I think, are the easiest out of all the things we've mentioned before. Like, I'd much rather focus on money, gym, connections. Those things will get you unlimited pussy anyway. You know, it's like, if you're out in Dubai living in the palm, you have some supercars, and you have good friends, and you go to nice places, and you go out once a week, you're gonna get girls, so that's what I believe. Yeah, that makes sense. Who's the most trustworthy person in your life? My brother, for sure. Definitely my brother. It's lucky having a brother because you can just say to him anything and you know he's gonna be in your life forever. Whereas when you have other people in your life, sometimes you can't tell them certain things because you don't know how long they're gonna be in your life for. But when you have a brother, you know they're gonna be in your life forever so you can say everything, so you can invest so much time into that person. It's almost like a project. You're investing time into each other because it's almost like if he's more smart and wiser, like whenever I tell my brother something, I think, okay, in the future, he's gonna be wiser and smarter. That'll help us make more money. And vice versa, if he tells me something. You're investing into that relationship. Look at someone like Tristan and Andrew, how much time they spend together. That's massively paid off now in all their businesses. So 
that's super, super important. Whereas if you're talking to someone you kind of half like, the value is not, it's not compounding. That's what's so powerful about something like New Money. The value compounds every single day. If you're a guy called John, you join New Money and you start giving value to me. I'm gonna be like, yo, great. This guy called John, he's fucking like, he's crazy. He's just giving me so much help. He's helping me so much. That's how I became friends with Hans. I'm not sure if my friend Hans will watch this, but probably not because he talks to me every day. But Hans is a good friend of mine. He joined New Money. He used to take, actually I'll give a plug to a lot of people here. Hans, Ronaldo, Hasimran, Evan, I mean, you've taken a bunch of payments for me as well. But like a lot of these names I've just mentioned, they've owed me like 20, 25,000 American dollars at one point. And besides Craig, like all these people I'd never met in real life. I mean, I've met a couple of them now in the New Money events and stuff. But up until that point, they were just random guys who joined New Money and they'd owed me like 25K. Like looking back on it, that was kind of crazy. I've never met these people. They could have easily, easily just blocked me on Telegram. Like, bro, fuck New Money. I've taken your money. What are you going to come do about it? You know, but it's like, you just don't even think about it because when you, someone has the same mindset as you, you just believe that they will make the same rational decision as you would. Yeah. And my mind says, why the fuck would you rob someone for 20K when long-term you can make so much more money together or the connection's worth so much more? And also, I feel like that's what's cool about becoming more successful. I feel like people want to wrong you less. I feel like now people wouldn't really want to betray me or fuck with me too much because they know I'm doing well and they know that in the future I can become even more successful and I can help them. I can help them more than the 20K of like, and then you're just gonna have a headache. I'm gonna be looking for you. And it's like, it's just, it's a headache. I feel like rich people don't want to deal with headaches over 20K. It's just stupid. So I feel like, what was even your question? Yeah. Most trustworthy person in your life. Most trustworthy, yeah, my brother for sure. Obviously I can trust my brother with everything. We share money, we just, like he works with me. He used to be at uni and now he's just helping me in business. He lives with me. So yeah, 100% my brother. But um, I trust a lot of people, man. I'm in a blessed position, but all of them are, besides my brother, are from New Money. Like every single person. Because, why, and that's another thing. Why would they want to lose access to all the 900 people in the group? Think about it. Let's say your name's Sam. You join New Money. You provide value to a bunch of people. Craig likes you. Fahim likes you. Hans likes you. Evan likes you. Steven likes you. Ronaldo likes you. Hasimra likes you. Leo likes you. Oh yeah, Leo as well. Shout out to Leo. He's taking a bunch of fucking money. Right? Why would you want to lose connection to all those people? You not only lost access to me, if you snake me for 20K, then you can lose access to all these people and your money. And no one wants to do that because then you lose access to the brotherhood. So it's powerful. I'm just going to switch to Stacey. Oh, it's fucking crazy. Next question is, at any point in your life, did you feel lost? If so, how did you try and, how did you get out of that? And how did you choose the route to go down? Yeah, I never really felt lost in life because I kind of thought like, I always wanted to be rich and I always knew I was going to be rich. That's just the truthful answer. A lot of people say, oh, I never knew if this day was going to happen. I never knew if that was going to happen. I always knew I was going to become rich. I just didn't know when. I always told people in, in school, well, not always. During my economics classes, I always would tell people that I would make $5 million in a year in my peak. And I don't know who's watching this podcast. So I can't say exactly how much I'm making, but yeah, like, oh, that's really not that much money. I'll just leave it at that. So... It's crazy, like I've surpassed certain goals I had in the past, which I thought I'd make in my peak in business. And it's like, and I've done it quick at 23. And I remember two years ago, people were laughing at me like, oh, you got kicked out of uni. Like, what have you done? You fucked up your life. My mom was saying you have to go back to uni, blah, blah, blah. So it's like things can change so quickly if you just apply yourself. How would you brainwash yourself into never being complacent? I think this is a really important question. Yeah, a lot of the guys in New Money ask me, how do you brainwash yourself from being complacent? And I'm thinking like, a lot of you aren't even in a position to be complacent in. You're still living with your parents. Like you haven't even got your own place to bring people back. Like friends back, family, you know, parties, girls, like. You well, it's not complacent, it's more about like comfortable. Okay, okay, I respect that, I respect that. If you're comfortable. Because one guy, Anthony, I'll just say his name is Anthony, his name was Anthony. Um, he's a super cool guy, he's in new money. He was saying, Hassan, how do you stop being complacent? I'm making like 7K a month right now and I'm living in Greece. I was like, good, Greece is a very nice country. I know the girls are very nice and like 7K a month, like you're gonna have a good life in Greece. That's like $250 a day, right? How do I push to the 10K a month, 15K a month and all these things? And I was saying, spend more money. How can you be more, how can you be complacent if you're spending all your money? So spend more money, go to nicer places. Go to the nicest hotel in the city. Just go to the nicest, oh, thought I'd drop this. Go to the nicest hotel in the city. Go to the nice cigar lounges. Go to nice, 
just resorts in general. Go to nice restaurants, eat the nicest food, take a picture on your Instagram story of the nicest place in town. Stick on your Instagram story, flex on the broke boys. Let them think, oh, like, wow, like Anthony's flexing on me. Get the energy of people like, yo, G, you're doing good these days. Like, yeah, man, come on. Then you're gonna wanna like act, you know, you're gonna wanna bring that to life. You're gonna wanna actually be that guy. And it kind of it kind of ties into another point that I get asked this a lot all the time. I don't know the questions on there, but I get asked this point all the fucking time. People say to me, Hassan, are you the kind of guy who like lets everyone know your plans or do you just, you know, do you just make things happen and say, look, I'm the kind of guy I like telling people what I'm doing. Like I was always the biggest talker in school. Oh, you don't know that, mate. I used to, you don't understand how much shit I'll talk in school to people. I'll just be like, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do that. And even in the Telegram channel, I told you guys we're just gonna keep buying more supercars and we just keep buying more supercars, like all these things. It's like, I like telling people I'm gonna do this and that and then actually make it happen. And also people respect you a lot more when you keep saying you're gonna do things and then you actually do them. But also the other way around, they lose respect for you if you say you're gonna do something and then you don't. So the best thing you can do is if you're a broke boy right now, say, yo, I'm gonna become fucking rich. You guys to help me become rich and then actually become rich. The reason why people respect me now from like school and uni and stuff is just because I told everyone I was gonna be rich. Like no one could say, oh, Hassan, you change with money. Like I was that dickhead telling all of you, like, listen, you fuckers, like I'll make 5 million USD in a year in my peak, easy. I'm gonna be CEO, economics teacher. You were saying about jobs earlier, I think. Um, about replaceability and all that kind of stuff. Like my, my economics teacher was saying to me, what do you want to be when you're older? And I said, CEO. And he looked around at the class and looked at me again. I was like, CEO. I, was like, I kind of was like a bit like angry. Like, why is he looking at me? Like, why does he think I'm not going to be? He's like, no, but be serious. I was like, I'm going to be the CEO of like a big company. Well, I didn't say big, I think. I just said CEO. I'm going to make millions. He's like, okay. He kind of just, oh, okay, Hassan. Next person. I was like, you fucking cunt. I'm joking. <laughs> But the point is, I was like, what the fuck? Who the fuck does this guy think he is? Who, who does he think he's talking to? And then you, you gotta use that, those things in life. You gotta use that energy and then apply it to like actually getting rich, actually making money, right? So I remember thinking to myself, fuck this guy, fuck this teacher. He was actually super nice. But still, I can like someone and think, fuck this piece of shit. I'm gonna flex on you. That's what you gotta do. Men with the highest testosterone like to flex on others. You can say it's low testosterone, it's the highest testosterone men. Why do you think Ronaldo is so good at football? Because he likes being the best. Do you think he doesn't like, do you think he only cares, he's passionate about football? Or do you think he also likes the status that comes with it? Be honest. It's definitely status, yeah. Why do you think Tiger Woods trained so hard? Why do you think Rory McIlroy, all these people, why do you think Roger Federer and Rafa Nadal, like, they like being the man when they walk in the club that they're the best tennis player. They like being rich, they like pulling up in the LaFerrari. Look at Jake Paul, all these people. Yeah, he lost the other day, but he has such an ego because he wanted to prove to all these guys he's not just the Disney guy. So it's ego that pushes you to the highest levels. When I got kicked out of uni, everyone thought I was just an idiot for getting kicked out. Like, oh, you threw away your life. So I thought I had to flex on them. I told myself like, I'll buy that uni one day. I reckon I could. So you got to flex on people, man. You got to flex. Like, so to go back to the question, because all this is tied into the question, to summarize it, how do you avoid being complacent? And how do you brainwash yourself into success? Well, you go to nice places, you talk to winners. If you talk to me, you'd realize that making 50K a month, 100K a month, 200K a month, 300K a month is all fucking bullshit. You're gonna be like, we need to make loads more. We need to make double that. So if you're making, what, 7K a month, you're making $200 a day, you're just not hanging around the right people. You're not hanging around the right people and you're not going to nice places because if you stayed at a hotel that costs $700 a night, $2,000 a night, you're gonna be like, what the fuck? It took me 10 days of my life to pay for one room. That like super relates to my kind of story as well. Like I was somewhat comfortable, somewhat complacent when I joined New Money. Like I was obviously earning very considerable, very good amount of money. I joined New Money, obviously met you, spoke with you. That leveled me up massively and then just spending more money being in Dubai, places like this. I like guess it's, it's such an easy way And to yeah, if you live in your hometown. Yeah. Right, you gotta move out your hometown. Like I really do believe in that. Like move out your hometown, Leave your uni town, leave. Like people always say, Hassan, do you really think you should leave everyone behind? Like, no, I still have my day one friend that I'm really close with, well, a couple of day one friends. And one of them just came out to Dubai now, right? To see us, you met him as well. And it's like, of course I'm still friends with them. Yeah, the relationships change in certain ways because you don't see them as much in school. That's normal. If he was in Dubai, I'd see him every day just like I see Craig every day. But you have to leave the majority of people behind. I don't really have any friends from uni because they were all on partying. So when I was partying, I was friends with them, but now I'm not friends with them. So you need to find new friends. You need to put, surround yourself with the right people and you'll make money. If you start surrounding yourself with the money makers, you'll become a money maker. When I was in uni, I was 
good at partying. I was very good at just being an idiot because I was around idiots. I was around people who'd find it funny to just carry seven cones on their fucking fucking head and just like, uh, just like walking around with seven cones on their head. Like, why is that funny? Stupid. It is funny, but why is it funny? Because we're all idiots. But now, I wouldn't find it funny because I'm not an idiot. So I'd be like, what are you doing, guys? Like, where's the money? Where's the ROI? And my friend, my, one of my friends and I have this like saying where we say to each other, like, where the fuck is the ROI in that? You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Probably. Anyway, like, he, we're always like, where the fuck is the ROI? Like, there needs to be some ROI. Whatever it is, whether you're going this place, going that place, like we were saying the other day, like, I couldn't even imagine just going, you know, on a jet ski for two hours without no ROI. Like, at least let me get a picture on Twitter, I think. At least an Instagram story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you're just going on a jet ski and saying, yo, man, it was fun. Like, I've been on a jet ski. I think it depends on your experience as well because I've traveled the world for a while. So I've had a lot of fun as well. So that's why I don't like giving advice that's just like one size fits all because a lot of you guys, you might want to travel the world. So how do you stay complacent? Okay, here's an answer for you. Take your 7K a month, bro, and just start traveling. Spend it all. Go to a strip club. Go to the fucking, go to the nicest hotel in town. Go to the nicest restaurant. Try and pick up some foreign bitch. Spend all your money. Fucking who cares? Like just do more things. Go, go to a foreign country. I don't know, just have fun. Rent a car, rent a fucking BMW in Colombia and just drive around like a psycho. Try and sell some drugs. You know, get involved in the coke game. Do something, do action. I just believe in action, things that just change the situation. I don't believe in staying there. How do, you be, how do I avoid complacency? By not staying in the same position all the fucking time. You guys are just staying in the same position all the time and then you're saying, Hassan, how do I avoid complacency? By moving. I always had the mindset of I'd rather improve or get worse than stay in the same. I know it sounds a bit fucked up. I've not heard really anyone say that before, but I really believe in that. Because movement creates movement. Momentum creates momentum. It's basic physics. If something's stationary, it's very hard to move it. If something's moving down, you can still move it up. If something's moving up, it's easy to keep moving up or fall down. But when something's stuck, let's say your car is stuck in the ground, the tires aren't moving, you're stuck, you're fucked. And that's like a lot of you guys, you're sat in your parents' house, your tires are stuck. You've been in the same bedroom, staring at the ceiling, jerking off like a loser for your whole life. You need to actually go out and just meet new people. Join your money, get stuck in, meet new people, hop on the live calls, learn new information. Even if you do nothing, but just listen to other people, you don't say a word in the chat. Because some people join the group and they're kind of quiet for the first couple months. And then they put a screenshot, like, I made 40K. Like, fuck you know, where does that come from? But they were just listening and learning and absorbing information. I spoke to one guy who joined your money and he's a gamer, like he's in the gaming industry. He does like the whole like, I'm not even gonna try and pretend I know. He was talking to me, I took a couple of lessons, but most of us are like, what the fuck's he on about? I don't know what he's on about. The point is, he's in this weird industry, this ne weird niche. And he told me that like, a couple things he heard in the new money group, like literally Forex is business. Just from hearing a couple of points, I was like, how did those points make you more money? He's like, yeah, because the, uh, I was like, what? The point is, is like information is that powerful. Like I always used to sit there and think, all I need to do is hear one cool sentence today and it'll teach me so much. Like one simple one line, it can open your mind up so much. And you guys don't think like that, but you should. Is there a big experience that has changed your perspective drastically your life? Is there one like sentence, one experience? Obviously we touched on the kind of court case and stuff like this, but. Not really. I mean, like I've got so many, I've got so many situations in my life which have definitely impacted me. Like, all right, okay, let me give you guys a very, I'm gonna give you a couple stories. I can speak forever, right? I have a story, I'll try and keep this one quick. When I was like eight years old, I love football. Champions League final, 2008, so I was like eight or nine. Chelsea versus Manchester United, many of you guys will know this final. I was a big, big fan of football, okay? Now, the next day, I had an exam, it was an RS exam, religious studies, religious education. My parents said, you cannot watch the football game. So me hearing this was like, like a big, big deal. I was like, no, 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 like, I have to watch it. Like, no. Couldn't watch the football game. No arguing, I was just only eight or whatever. I couldn't win. They were like, no, you can't watch it. You have an exam the next day. You can watch the highlights. I was like, no, like, like, no, you, like, you, I love football as a kid. I just love watching, like, just football. Like, I just loved it. And so I was studying with my mum in the kitchen the, the, for the exam. She was helping me go over certain things. And my brother and my dad were watching the football. And I could hear it from the other room. So like whenever there was something excited, I'd quickly run over then I had to run back. My mum was like, come, revise for the exam. Anyway. Did the exam, thought it went all right. Next week, we got the results back, 100%. And it was one of those exams where it was 100 marks. So it's like 100 questions right, not like 
Six questions right is 100%. 100 fucking questions right. Everything right. No one else in the class did near me. Everyone else got like 70, 80, whatever. Broke, like fucking losers, broke boys. Right? I got 100%. Now, that I always will remember. It's been like fucking 15 years since then. Because it showed me like I sacrificed one amazing fucking Champions League final in my mind, which I really wanted to watch. Now I got 100% in this exam. And I have so many stories like that where I just worked hard on an exam and I got extra. I did this or I, you know? Or for example, in GCSEs, I got an A in physics. I got like pretty much all A stars and A's, right? I got five A stars, three A's and two B's. The two B's were in English. I'm not the best writer, right? As I've said before. Anyway, in physics, I got an A instead of an A star. I should have got an A star. But I was one mark off an A star because you can pay to basically see how many marks you're off. I was one mark off an A star. And when, my, when I got home, my dad was like very strict on me. He was like, he's like, very disappointed when I got those results. He's like, you... you well, he wasn't saying I was an embarrassment to the family, but he was basically saying, oh, some, you just like, did you feel like you did your best? And I was just like, no. He's like, that's the point. That's the point. So it kind of all these things, all these lessons as I've grown up have just been drilled into my head of like, you need to do your best. There's no time for mistakes. You shouldn't make silly mistakes. Like that one mark I got under in physics, could I have got the extra one mark? Yes. So why didn't I get it? Because on the paper, it shows A, a, a not A star. Like, it's like you guys saying, oh, I could have got that car. I could have got this. I could have got that. It's like, okay, you didn't. You could have had that successful business, but your friend fucked you over and betrayed you. But he betrayed you. It's your fault. Somewhere at some point, you fucked up. So it's kind of like that. It kind of just taught me about, I need to have personal responsibility and accountability and all these things. I can name a million stories like that. But yeah, just loads of little things, man. My family just raised me always to like, they always, my dad would always say that we were going really poor. Even though we weren't, it was like middle class. We're like, we're doing okay. Like. But he would always just say like, like things are going very bad. Like, you know, to always kind of keep me scared and worried. I was always like, no, like mom, you need to get like a second job. Like you need to, I was like trying to figure out a solution for like, it's like mom, you need to get this job and this job. Cause my mom would always, she was like my assistant um, to my dad. And like, I'd always be telling my mom like, no mom, you need to get like a proper job. I tell dad, like, dad, like, can't you do more hours at work? Can't you do this? Like, yes, like, I'm trying. I'm, you know, he'd like make it seem like he's doing worse than he was. He was doing all right. It's just the case. And it was, what that did was it always made me think like, shit, we have to work hard. Otherwise, like, our life's going to be fucked when we're older. So all these things, I got raised very well. I think having a good parent is a very big advantage, especially if you have a strict dad. My mom was a nice one. My dad was the strict one. But all these things just raise you into being just aggressive towards life. Like, if you work hard, you can get anything. So I've always had insane self-belief. You know, not in terms of talking to people. I, was, I wasn't always the most like outgoing. I was when I knew people, I was, very, I was always the class clown, but I wasn't just confident in talking to strangers when I was 10 or 15 even. Because, I mean, I just stuck to my circle. But as I got older and became better at sales, it just naturally I became more confident. But I was always believed in myself. I could not say a word. And I was still in my head thinking, I'm the fucking, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. Do you think being the class clown was like a good trait to... Understand how people interpret information and how to kind of speak to people? No, I don't think you can like, no, not really. I just think I was the class clown because naturally I like talking and yeah, that's kind of it. But I feel like, I feel like the people who talk a lot in life, the people who just talk a lot, a lot, a lot, they either end up very, very successful or they're the people who are the most laughed about. Because... With the way I was talking in uni and school, it's like, if I didn't become successful, everyone would have been like, what the <laughs> yeah, fuck? Yeah. Everyone would be like, do you remember that fucking Hassan dicker? You know, so like, even let's say in the physics exam, I got A instead of A star, I was one mark off. Like, people could kind of laugh because it's like, oh, I'd get 10 A stars, easy, it's fucking piss. And then you have to revise, I'll get 10. Then I got five and three A's and two B's. It's like, you can't really take the piss out of me because they're still good results. So I kind of always did enough where people couldn't really take the piss. Oh, as, as popular, I wasn't like, I wasn't the most popular, but I wasn't the least popular. I was just having a decent experience in school. But yeah, man, it's just like, yeah. I just think, I think I don't have a certain event in my life that completely changed the way I think. I think that my whole life I've just believed in myself. Like even, okay, for example, when I was six or seven, I did karate, just some bullshit kicking. I didn't, I learned nothing really. They gave me a red belt. I went to this exam and got a red belt. Like the first belt you get in karate or whatever. It was the red belt at the time. And um, I remember going home thinking, all right, like, I, I'm a karate red belt. So like, you might be thinking, what the fuck? I was like seven. I can't beat up anyone because you're seven. 
But the point is, is, I remember thinking, okay, that's cool. So all these things, I worked hard in karate. I went two, three times a week, my mom taught me. Now I'm successful at, successful at karate. For another example, when I moved to school, my mom, she's like, oh, your, your friend in school, his mom's so like family friend. Um, they say you have to learn to do this typing course. I had to do a typing course. So my mom made me sign up to this course, typing course called Chico. It's like, you put stickers on the keyboard so you can't see the keyboard and then you just learn how to type. It's a hundred days in a row, one day, two day, three day, every day after school, hundred days, three months of my life. But now I'm an amazingly quick typer. So it's a very useful skill. Things like that, again, discipline. I saw the value, I saw the power of just sticking something for three months. How amazing typer. Same thing with Arabic school. They used to send me to Arabic school on Saturdays. Fucking bullshit, bro. I can make a whole podcast about Arabic school. You don't understand, bro. That is honestly the worst time of my life. Like, worst time of my life. And like I said, I like football. And it was on Saturday when all the football was on. So I used to just sneak out to the toilet and just... Fucking bullshit. But like, so yeah, I basically went to school six times a week for a lot of my younger years. Not five times, because I went to Arabic school 10 till three. So yeah, all these things, man, it adds up. It kind of like, you might be thinking, kind of what's your point? But it's just all these things kind of... If you just gave me an edge over a lot of people, like it's, it's such small basic things like karate, red belt at seven, it's nothing. Like everyone can do it if they went to, I think they gave the belts to everyone properly. Who knows? The point is, is that going to just turning up, just doing more, 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 you become a better person than other people. And all these things lead to more belief. And I say to people like, if someone believes in themselves more than you, technically it makes them a better person than you. To a degree, I believe that, right? Like people say like, oh, skin color this, height this, muscle this, brain intelligence this, that. It's like, you can pretty much do anything if you believe in yourself enough, which means I think if you're, if you're believing in yourself more than other people, you're better than those people. You believe in yourselves more. To a degree, you're a better person. That's how I view the world. So if you do more, you're gonna believe in yourself more and accomplish more. Next question I have is, in your free telegram, you talk a lot about how you think less than others and act more than others. How can someone do this? Like, I think a lot of people overthink a lot of things, but how, I how think do you just act more? Definitely helps having friends like that. Like a lot of my friends now, they are the same. Like, you know, yeah, I don't have to say their names, but you know one of them, like for example, he's a bit of a nutter in a good way. Like he just attacks life. It's good. It makes you want to attack life harder, right? So yeah, just by hanging around better people, by hanging around people who don't think. If all your friends are like, you know, they're smoking a joint late in the evening, like, yeah, bro. I don't know about that business idea is going to fail. You're going to fucking be a pussy. The thing is, do you know what's so soul crushing about hanging around with people who don't reciprocate your energy is because if you're out here, you're saying, yo, bro, let's do this. Let's do that. I'm going to have all these business ideas. And then none of them actually ever come to fruition. It's very, very draining mentally. If you say, yo, we're going to do this idea. And then your friend's like, yeah, yeah, we can do it. And then they talk to the girlfriend in the evening and then tomorrow morning, by tomorrow morning, they're like, oh, sorry, bro, I have to hang out with Sarah. We've got to go take the dog to the vet. We've got to go for a walk. It's like, bro, yesterday evening, you said well, you were gonna, you're willing to do anything to make this business work. And now you're saying that, I don't know, Sarah is saying that I've got to take the dog out more often. It's like, what the fuck? It's very draining. So that's kind of what pissed me off that and that made me seek out better people and just people who thought less but yeah how to think less spend time around people who think less also realize that all the things you're overthinking don't matter you're not wanted you're not El fucking Chapo you're not fucking Tony Montana and Scarface you're a fucking broke boy with nothing going on for them that is completely liberating it gives you all the freedom in the world and a broke boy I think if you're making 50k a month 100k a month you're still a broke boy so it's like good like you have all the freedom in the world if you're making 100k a month bro, do you think anyone in Dubai even like opens their eyes. Yeah, it's cool. You still live in an amazing lifestyle. It's fucking 1.2 million a year. It's amazing. I'm saying like, do you think anyone's like, no way, like John, he just, he's wanted. Like no one thinks about you. Like you're just a broke boy. You're unimportant. So it's like, who cares? Including me, I'm a nobody. I'm not saying I'm, you know, I just want to make it clear. It's like, you're all nobodies. It's like, you're sat there thinking, oh no, Hassan, how do I write this email? How do I get the sales job? How do I say this on the sales interview? What do I say when they're asking me this about sales, that about sales? Write that down as well. Like, remind me to talk about sales in a minute. I want to extend on that point massively. I'm going to give you guys a free sales course right now on this podcast. I don't know how long this is going to be, but fuck it. Should I just start talking quicker? Because I feel like a lot of people say, Hassan, you talk too quickly. Then I have to slow it down. Compensate for the brokies. Do I talk slower or just quicker? I think the way you're doing is good. Because this takes forever. I like talking really quickly like this and then just not interrupting. Yeah, some people, English yeah. is in the first language. So it's, it's way harder for them to understand. Right, okay. 
So what was the point I was just making before I went on a side tangent? Well, you were just relating it back to sales. Yeah, but what was the but point? How right, you're nobody, you're nobody, right? Nobody. So I you're know. sat there thinking like, oh no, Hassan, like, how do I think less? But by asking that question, you're not understanding something because you wouldn't ask that question if you understood the situation. What you're really, what you really need to understand or what you really need to find out is that all the things you do aren't that important. There are 8 billion people in the world. Whenever I'm having a slow day or I'm feeling a bit like, I'm just a bit slow compared to my usual, I say to myself, there are 8 billion people in the world. For some reason, that always motivates me. If someone around me says, yo, bro, there are 8 billion people in the world, it just always gets me fired up. I don't know. It's like, you're a fucking nobody. Like when you actually think about it, that conquers all nerves. I'm nervous about this. I'm nervous about that. There are 8 billion people. Like no one's going to remember you. No one's going to... Remember you, no one's even watching you, right? Like, how many people watch this podcast? Fuck knows. Even if it's watched by 4 million people, it won't, but. It's still tiny compared to 8 billion. It's yeah. like, it's no one really. Do you, you know? care what, like, someone's- And, and now all those 4 million people, how many were absolute losers? They didn't, they didn't even know you. They watched three seconds and switched it off and they just judge you on one line. It's like all the things you overthink mean nothing. And some of you are concerned about words on a page. Bro, I wrote this email and this guy didn't reply to me. What do I say to him? Do I say that, yo, bro, have you checked in with your wife yet? Yo, bro, have you asked your wife if you can go ahead with the business? Yo, bro, I, bro, Hassan, should I say bro or should I say sir at the top of the email? You're never going to get a gold AP if you ask these questions. That's my answer. The consequences don't matter that much. Like... You could literally stop living your life where you live, England, America, wherever, move, go random country, give a country, give me the name of the country. Belgium. Belgium. You can go Belgium, find a local gym, book an apartment, download Tinder, post a picture in Belgium of you in some restaurant, nice restaurant in Belgium, start meeting some new girls, meet some guys in the gym who are cool, say, yo, we're gonna go party, fuck a bunch of bitches, start a new life in Belgium, talk to people online, Cut most of your loser friends, only keep in touch with the real ones at home. New life in Belgium. No one from home is gonna give a fuck. Who's gonna care? Oh no, Hassan left. Oh no, John left. Oh no, Peter left. They'll be like, yo bro, how you doing? The girl's hot in Belgium? Yeah, gee, it's good. Yeah, that's it. Who cares, man? Who cares? Like when you when you like came to Dubai, you don't see, for example, um, Ola's a good friend of Craig. Like he's known him forever. I, I've now got to know him, Ola's super cool. But it's like, Oleg has come a couple times to Dubai and we've seen him, obviously. It's like, yeah, but you're still very close with him and he still works with you and all that stuff. But besides that, like, who do you really like? You have a couple friends, actually, but who do you really miss from England? Most people, like, you just, you don't care. Life moves quickly as well. Just, no one gives a fuck, yeah. And it's not a personal thing. A lot of people think, oh, no, like, no, Hassan, like, my friends do care about me. Maybe you just have bad friends. Obviously, I'm saying you're close, close friends, cool. But I'm saying, like, the people who... A lot of you have people in your life that you think you're cool with or close with, but it's just because of proximity. It's just because you literally go to the same co lecture. You work in the same location. I think it's especially relevant if you're in school or university, yeah. Yeah. Touching back on the sales point, what are, like, what is the number one thing with sales? Like, what are the most, like, mistakes you've made, the biggest lessons you've learned? Yeah, the biggest... You touched on it a bit before. Yeah, I touched on it a bit before. The biggest mistake... There's so many mistakes. What is something you've fucked up with and you've lost out on a big commission? A big I think it just always goes back to that same... Okay, I'll tell you one of the biggest lessons. And this is something I super believe in. Buy or die. I've seen a couple of people on Twitter nick the same. I definitely invented it 1 million percent. No, 100% I did. Because I remember saying it out loud to myself when I was in door to door. So I was like, buy or die, motherfucker. Like when, I was saying, like when I was walking to the next door, I was like, fucking fuck this guy. Buy or die. And what that basically means is either the motherfucker buys from you or they die. So like you guys are all watching this. You might be getting a lot of game. If you made it this far on the podcast, you've probably got a lot of game. I don't care. Like if you've got a lot of value from this, that's great. But if you've not got a lot of value and you hate this podcast, then the podcast wasn't meant for you. And it's not personal. I respect that person. Like good for you. All right? Like do what you want. But I'm saying then they're kind of dead to me. Not like a, I want you to die. You know? They are now like metaphorically dead to me because then I'm probably never gonna, they're probably never going to join you money. I'm never going to speak to them. You know, if they don't like this podcast, then they're probably not going to DM me on Twitter and like ask to meet me or ask to do business with me or ask me a question on business or my advice because they don't care about my opinion. 
And then the people who it's meant for, the people who actually like it, it builds more trust with them. They're probably going to end up joining new money because they realize you're on new money. They realize we made a bunch of money together. They realize all these amazing connections you have inside the group. It's fucking 2 a.m. in Dubai right now. We're, at, we're in your apartment right now. What day is it? Sunday, Monday? Tuesday. I literally on my mom's life. I don't know right now. If I think about it, I'll know. I think it's Wednesday if I think about it's it. Wednesday. When, yeah, Wednesday. Yeah, Tuesday, yeah. Wednesday. Wednesday morning or Thursday morning? I don't know that. I don't, I, I don't even know, to be honest. I think it's Wednesday morning. <laughs> I don't know. I don't the know point, the point is, that's actually my point. The point is, I don't know. I think it's Wednesday morning. Um, yeah, I don't even know what day of the week is. And we're just sat here in Dubai, 2 a.m., no job tomorrow, we can wake up when we want. Like, that's the power of the group. So the people who relate with that, like, yo, these guys are living a cool life. I want to join them. I want to be part of the community. I want to be part of this group. I want to come to the next New Money event with 110 people. By the way, there's 900 people in the group. Quick plug, 900 people in the group. One ninth of all members in the group. Guys living in Dubai, guys living in America, guys living in Canada, guys living in Australia. All are making their way to a fucking Warsaw, Poland, bruv. Eastern Europe. Eastern fucking Europe. 110 people. Who did that? Me. Anyway, next point. <laughs> the people who fuck with it, they'll fuck with it. The people who don't fuck with it, they don't fuck with it. So my mindset is buy or die. Same thing with boilers. That guy was saying, get off my property. I tried explaining, I was like, sir, it's not me who's selling this with some weird company. We're actually here representing the council, blah, 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 blah. Get off my property, get off my property. You know, get off my property, go. You can't sell to him. Some people are unsellable. And when people are unsellable, which they are, you can't sell to everyone, they now become dead. Put them in the dead folder. That's why I believe in like following up with people. That's why I believe with all this kind of stuff. Even when I have time, I'll message someone. It's not really to do with following up to sell. It's more to do with following up to like, making sure they're okay. When I have time, I'll just message like 20 new money members. Like, yo, G, update me on your progress. And you can get a lot done just by attacking. But yeah, a lot of people, they think too much. Because I don't think, I get more done. And it's kind of related to the whole buy and die point. Which is, a lot of you guys are thinking, I don't know if this guy will buy or not. I just do loads of things and it leads to loads of other things. You know? So because I'm just doing loads, I want a definite yes or a definite no. Right? That's why I'm very aggressive with the way I market new money. Sometimes people say, yo, Hassan, you're quite, you really believe in new money. Like you talk about it a lot on Telegram. I'm like, yeah, motherfucker. It's like, that's why 900 people have joined and the people who haven't joined, they were never going to join anyway. Do you think if I started selling it more humbly, like, yeah, I don't think it's that good and please join and maybe you should join, it might help you. Like those people were never going to buy anyway. If I explain to an old lady who's 88 trying to sell boilers to, would please like, Understand what I'm saying, madam. Like, we're not a scam. This is a legit company. We're here representing the council. And this boiler is a Wusterbosch boiler. It's a brand new boiler. It comes with a guarantee. You get underfloor insulation. You just need to fit these three criteria. Sign the paperwork. I'm not the sales, I'm not the surveyor or the installer. I'm just a salesman. I'm just a kid getting my commission. Super honest up front. I can say all the things in the world. Get off my la get off my lawn. Get off, I'm gonna to wanna to call the police, right? Some people are unsellable. So that's probably the biggest lesson, one of the biggest lessons I can give you guys with sales. Buy or die, whatever you're selling, you don't need that many people to buy from you to become rich. How many boilers have we sold? Don't fucking know. But it's not that many. It's not that many. Like, there's millions of people in England. You don't need to sell to all the motherfuckers. You need to sell to this much, make a decent amount of money. Right? Let's say you're selling watches. You wanna be a lux, you know, you wanna sell luxury watches, you wanna own a watch dealership. How many, watch, how many APs do you need to sell at like £80,000 a pop? Not many. Not many. My, my car salesman, the guy who sold me all five supercars, how many cars has he sold me? Five. What's his commission on each car? I don't know. 1%. Is it 1%? Yeah, I think it'll be a couple. Yeah, a couple. So. That's decent. So I bought that oh, Euros for 305000 He made about six bags on that. He's eating. So how many cars does he have to sell in a month to like make a good good amount of money per month. Not that many. No, not not many, many, like, not so I don't think it's a couple percent. I think that's quite high. It might be a, I don't know. It doesn't matter. I don't know much. I might even ask him because I'm close to him now. And I don't know if that's, we're cool, we're cool. He's asked me about business and stuff. But yeah, it's interesting. It's always interesting to analyze the money. And this is what my brother and I were talking about the other day. We were in the car driving. We're like, how much money is this guy getting per car? Is it 25%? No, he's not getting 75 grand on a car, is he? Okay, we start there. Is it 25? Is it 15%? No. But is it zero? No. So it's between zero and 15. Okay, we have a rough, okay. Is it 10? No, it's not 30 grand for a car. The where's the profit for the company? So you just start narrowing and get down. And then you start, okay, it can't be 8% and it can't be nine and it can't be 7% for a car. 
It's not going to be 7%. No way. He's not making, what, 21 grand on a car. So then you look at it and like, okay, it's between this, what is between 1% to 2%, really. Okay, now I know how much a car sales not makes in Dubai. Now I have another avenue to explore. Now I have another potential business opportunity if everything goes wrong. Now if someone in new money asks me, Hassan, how do I move in Dubai? How do I have enough money to move in Dubai? Bro, become a car salesman. Yeah, but how's it, how, how do I do it? I can say, yo, I'll tell you because I have a friend who's a car salesman. He sold me five cars and he's told me how he gets clients. Here you go. Done, easy. How do you get clients? Well, he just goes out quite a lot in Dubai. He meets a lot of people. So he met um, my, one of my friends and then he referred me to this guy. Again, power of referrals. That's another very, very important sales lesson. The power of referrals is crazy. Even new money. So many people, the reason why new money grows so quickly is because so many people tell their friends. You told Ola and Ola joined new money. Yeah. Right? Fahim told his cousin, Abs. And then Abs joined. And do you know what's funny? I remember doing, Abs wanted to do a call before he joined New Money. He's like, yo, bro, I want to make the payment, blah, blah, blah. I was on a call with Fahim, his cousin, talking about other things. It's like, oh shit, Fahim, what are you doing? They're cousins. So yeah, man, referral game is crazy. Referral game in every business is crazy, right? So yeah, these are some very, very important lessons I learned in sales, but the buy and die one is so important because buy and die eliminates thinking. Because you only think when you're analyzing why the people who were never going to buy didn't buy. Because I used to do that. I was like, fucking bitch, grandma, like a stupid idiot. Like, why didn't she buy my boiler? Why didn't she sign the paperwork? And then I thought about it like, I'm a 20 year old guy at the time. She was 79. She's this tall. Like, I could just come in the house, kidnap, like, like I could, yeah. you could just do anything. Like, you could kill her. She's just some old innocent lady. Of course she's gonna be scared and vulnerable, right? But, some people are unsellable. Maybe some grandmas, you have to talk to them nicely and more soft and how are you? And we're just here representing the council. But then sometimes you have to say like, whatever you say, it's just not gonna work. Like you couldn't sell to my mum on the door. She just wouldn't even open the door. Like, Who the fuck's this guy on the door? So some people are unsellable. And when you learn, learn that people are unsellable, when they reject you, it's not even a rejection. It's like, oh, it's like an NPC. It's like a bot. It, it almost didn't happen. They're not real. Like you shouldn't even register it in your brain. Like I said, law of averages, 30 doors. Right? I've got 30 doors to knock on and I get a sale. All right, seven grandmas in a row who are never gonna buy. Bots, NPCs, they're seven out of 30, idiots. Fuck them. Buy, it's already dead. 23 more people. Next one, it's gonna be someone who wants to buy. Now, if it's someone who should have bought and they fit the criteria and everything was fine. Okay, let's say it's online sales. I don't wanna keep talking about boilers because they apply. Um, you guys aren't selling boilers. Let's say you're selling personal training, right? I always use that example. If someone's in phenomenal shape, you're not gonna sell them personal training. Like if they're in phenomenal shape and they look better than you, you're not gonna sell them personal training. So then they're unsellable. You can't get offended, you can't get angry that they didn't buy. They're just dead, fuck them, they're dead to you. You're never gonna sell to them. There's no point sending them more emails saying, hey, do you wanna buy this? But what you could do, you could say, hey bro, you're in phenomenal shape. Why don't you promote some of our supplements? We'll give you free supplements forever. You're in fantastic shape. I'm sure a lot of the guys in the gym look up to you and they ask you questions. Next time they ask you questions, say that, yo, you've been using this chocolate whey protein. It's very, very good. Why don't you start wearing this gym equipment, bro? Tell me what, how you want me to design the equipment. Not equipment, the clothing. Tell me how you want me to design the clothing. I'll make the clothing in your image, how you want it. Because you're in very good shape, I want you to help me promote it. That's why I don't believe people's excuses when they say they're broke. I can literally talk for hours, by the way. But this is why I don't be, believe people's excuses when they say they're broke, because Every one of you has a friend who's in shape. Every one of you has a friend who's good at e-com. Every one of you has a friend who, you know, maybe has a podcast. Maybe one of you has a friend who's like really good at singing or dancing or got a lot of followers on TikTok or they have something. You can just help that friend make more money and then you have a business. Anyway, to go back to the point, right? Let's say you're a personal trainer. That guy's a personal trainer. You can just go talk to him. He can promote your stuff for you. That's a start, that's a kickstart. Maybe he has 25K followers on Instagram. Then you can set up a referral system. Then you can get more followers. There's so many things you can do just to get more sales. But in general, man, selling is just about your conviction in yourself. That's why it's so important as well not to be a fat idiot. Because if you're just a fat, unhealthy idiot, then people, you're not gonna feel good about yourself and you're not gonna sell in the same way, right? If you're in a certain kind of shape and you look a certain kind of way and you have good friends around you, you're gonna be able to be way more confident in a pitch. And ultimately sales is just about that extra difference, that 1%. Sometimes people are on the edge like, do I trust this person? But yeah, I do trust him because he believes in himself that much. I've had people message me about joining New Money and they say, bro, I joined New Money because you were just so confident in it. I was like, yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> and they're like, 
They'd be like, it's just your confidence just gives me energy. And I was like, yeah, good. I'm happy to hear that, bro. Like, nice. And the point I'm trying to make is that your confidence will sell people alone. Like, that will take you far in life. I remember Tate had this story once. He was saying that if you're on a date with a chick and you have 20 pounds left to your name, not 20, because now inflation has got more, 100 pounds to your name, right? And you're on a date with a chick and the bill's 87 pounds. Get your 100 pound cash out. Throw it on the table like a G. 87 pound bill, 13 pound tip. Fuck it. Why do you need that 13 pound anyway? Do you see what I'm saying? It's like, it's just a mindset. It's a conviction in yourself. And if you know you're going to make more money, who cares about going back to your last money? Like, I haven't even told this story, but like in my daughter all days, like a month before I started the whole, well, the whole COVID thing happened when I was in the middle of daughter law. This is actually a very important lesson. Oh boy, this podcast is going to be about eight hours long. So before COVID, what happened is I got into Forex and I got into Forex and everything was going great. I thought I was the fucking man making a bunch of money. My ego was growing by the day. I thought I was a genius. I thought I'd crack the code. This was six months after I got kicked out of uni. So this is where I still feel like I had something to prove. Right? Did you feel like that when you first were trying to make money, like you had more to prove? Then when you're already doing well, it's like, then it's kind of mainly for you. Honestly, no. No? No. <laughs> Guys, Craig's a fucking <laughs> humble guy. No. I just, <laughs> I liked learning and then money came with that. No, I didn't really do that. Craig's a good guy, boy. Guys. But for me, it was just like, initially I wanted to flex some people and kind of just tell them I'm doing well because everyone just laughed at me a, a, like a minute late earlier it was a normal natural thing to do so I remember going to this house party once February 2020 February 2020 and it was a big big house party and I remember thinking to myself I've just made like three grand this week on trading right three grand British pounds I was like if anyone asks me how things have been going <laughs> I'm just gonna let them know I'm rich because I remember turning up to the fucking party with like four bottles of booze. I know you might be thinking it's only four bottles, but like, yeah, to some random party where I don't know the guy that well. I kind of knew him, but like everyone else was going to bring one bottle. I brought four, like full bottles, like the big ones. It's like I spent 200 pounds in Tesco buying all the bottles. I remember turning up like, here you go, mate, here you go, here you go, fucking, he, you want this? Pull the alcohol down people's throats, just being a menace. And I remember thinking to myself, like, I'm so rich, I made 3K this week. So anyway, I go back to door to door on Monday. Um, because I was like a bit drunk on the Sunday morning and all that stuff. I remember going back to door to door on Monday. I remember thinking to myself, all right, the trading markets are back open. Because the reason why I was so happy is because the trading markets were closed on that Saturday. I was like stress free, yeah, made the profit. Yeah. Monday, everything's going great. Making an, I was like 1K up for the day. Then I got greedy because what I did is instead of actually focusing on knocking on doors, I just focused on the trading. So I sat in the car. Like looking at the phone, like, I want more trades. Like, let me create more profit. Because what I was doing was I bought the trades. I bought gold. I didn't know anything about trading. I had no stop loss. I just bought gold. And then what I did is I just left them on until they made me profit. There was no, there was no stop loss. <laughs> there was no strategy. There was no, there was no strategy. The only strategy was taking profit, TP, just taking the profit. So when I hit a certain profit number, I just take it. So, I, so like one day I woke up, it was like 700 pound profit. I was like, take, 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 went back to sleep. So anyway, what ended up happening is it just got me in this mindset of like, I don't need to work door to door because I was only making 100 pounds, 200 pounds a week. I fucked that, I'll just make 700 pounds in my sleep, like a G. Anyway, that Monday, it all went wrong. It all went in red. I remember telling my brother like, look, I need you to borrow like a couple K, like I need you to get a couple K from your girlfriend or like, do you have a couple K left in your ISA account or just whatever, get me 2,000. I need this 2,000 to pump back into Forex because because I have no stop loss because I, I don't know what I'm doing. I just need 2K more to like give me more I don't know what you call it in trading, but like just room to like go down before it goes back up. Because I know it'll go back up because I'm always right. That was my mindset. If I need 2K, someone get me 2K. My brother got me 2K. I lost all the money. I lost all the money. And it taught me a very valuable lesson. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so depressing. It was so depressing. You guys don't realize that I actually have PTSD talking about it. I might be laughing now. It's just cope to kind of cover, try and cover up the situation. Like, I honestly lost a lot of sleep over that shit because I actually thought I was rich. And when you thought you've made it and then you just get instantly put back, you feel like a prick. I felt like a prick. Like, I, and when people ask me, are you still doing that trading thing? I was like, no, no, no. Because I remember I was trying to tell all my friends to get into trading. Yeah, that's another story. I remember one guy from uni blocked me because I tried to get him into trading. I was like, bro, sign up with this broker. It's where I signed up. Now, obviously I know more now about this. I mean, he thought I was just trying to scam him, like sell him a course, because I was actually trying to tell people like, yo, bro, I can help you with trading. Like there are good people out there with trading for sure. Of course there are, but I didn't know nothing. 
But I wanted to get into trading because what I was doing was working, but I didn't know it was gonna stop working. So he actually ended up blocking me because he thought I was trying to scam him. Anyway, I remember trying to like convince everyone, all my friends to get into trading. They're all like, nah, man, trading's risky, trading's risky. I was like, bro, I'm making money. <laughs> anyway, like a couple of weeks later, I went to shit. But yeah, man, they just taught me there's no free lunch. Like there's no free way, easy way to make money. You have to work hard. And then I just really doubled down on sales. So yeah, man, it's just, when you're good at sales, you have a skill to fall back on. When you're not good at sales, you don't have anything to fall back on. What do I have to fall back on if, if I lose everything? At least I can fall back on my connections. I can fall back on what I know, who I know, the information I've consumed. Like you said, learning. But if I'm just making money from this short-term business model, what about if I lose in the future? You know, There's no free lunch. That's what I learned. What are some like objections like that you have different methods to the typical kind of responses to that? Yeah, so the first thing about objections, like you're always gonna get objections in sales anyway. Like that's something that people don't realize. It's not that often people are like, yeah, I wanna buy. Like whether it's boilers, if you're gonna sell them high ticket personal training, whether you wanna be their copywriter, people have questions, people are curious, like why should I choose you when I can choose all these people? So people have a lot of objections in sales. People wanna know, why they should buy your product. And you have to just count, you just have to solve the problems. You have to answer their questions. And one thing you can do really, really well in sales is like when you're answering like one question or one objection, answer multiple points in one go. So for example, why why is the boiler fully funded? Like why is it free? I'll be like, yeah, because you know what it's like with the environment. Like they're trying to make the environment more renewable, all this bullshit. They don't want all these bad emissions going into the air, all this nonsense. But before I finish that sentence, I'd then say another point. Look, like also, by the way, like, I'm not saying I'm like part of the fucking government, I'm part of the fucking this and that. I'm just some 20 year old kid at uni. I wasn't at uni, I got kicked out, but I say I'm just some 20 year old kid at uni. I don't know what I'm talking about. You no, know, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just here to be honest for you to sign the paperwork because then what happens is the surveyors come around the next day, and then the installers come around. They're the actual professionals who know what they're doing, who've been in the industry many, many years. I've just been here for like two months. Even if I've been in for four months, I say I've only been here a couple months, like I'm new to the industry. That would build so much more trust because they'll be like, oh, this guy's just, yeah, that makes so much sense. He's just a kid trying to make money. And I'll say like, it's just a part-time job. I'm trying to save up money because I want to go on holiday with my friends at the end of the year. Like it makes me more human, right? So I'd answer all their objections in one go. I'd answer like three or four, like a fucking machine gun. Instead of just letting them ask question, ask question, ask question, because then they control the frame of the whole situation. Then it's almost like I'm trying to prove myself to them. They ask me a question, answer. Wait for the next question, answer. Wait for the next question, answer. I might as well just address all the things they might be thinking because then it shows that I'm more professional as well. It shows that I've ha been answered these, it shows I've been asked these questions before, all right? If someone's asked me about how can I trust that this and that and I answer it very confidently and then I make the next point that she might have in her mind and then the next point that she's thinking as well. She's like, okay, he's dealt with these things before. And then also what I do, I like have pictures on my phone of like all the people that we'd sold boilers to. A picture like me next to these people. <laughs> you know, so it's like all these pictures just gives you so much more credibility. I'm like, yo, you know your neighbor, Sarah? Here's a picture. You know your picture, not picture, you know your neighbor, Mark? Here's a picture. He's like four doors down from me. Yeah, I know Mark, of course, Mark Roberts. Yeah, yeah, Mark Roberts. Picture. You can call Mark if you want. Like, let's go. We can go knock on Mark's door. We, got, we installed their boiler. It was three days ago. We just didn't get down to your door because we had to go. We didn't visit this area again for the last couple of days. We're coming back because we didn't finish the street. We go through every street at one at a time, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Um, let's go talk to Mark. Oh, no, it's okay. I believe you. You got the picture. Done. Oh, okay. Let's go talk to Mark. Sometimes I like go with that one person to four other people. So but anything to get the sale, right? Because if you know what you're giving people is good, why wouldn't, you, why wouldn't you be like that? And also they can feel that. It's like, why would you take a stranger to another stranger's house? Because I obviously know this person, but they're not a stranger, but it's obviously legit if I'm taking one stranger to another person who potentially could be a stranger. I won't do that. And then Mark would just say, who the fuck are you? But Mark would be like, yeah, Susan, he's fucking amazing. Like, I didn't believe it as well, but fuck it. What's the worst that could happen? Yeah, and then you just get two sales and then you'd be like, all right, guys, what I need you to do for me is just give me referrals, blah, blah, blah. But yeah, in general, man, in sales, you're always gonna have objections. A lot of guys panic when they're selling something because they get an objection and then they get stuck. I remember once, we got an obje well, not once, it happens all the time. People have objections when it comes to joining new money. One guy asked me, Hassan, be honest. I was like, yeah, of course, what's the problem? He's like, am I gonna get access to like loads of new information? 
And like, is new money very different than everything else? I said, look, bro, I'm going to be completely honest with you. There's no such thing as completely new information on this planet, right? Because everything's in books, isn't it? Like books, yeah, forums, yeah. blogs, videos, fucking some other course, some other product, whatever. Everything's somewhere out there if you look hard enough. Like I'm sure, like I could talk to you about Etsy, but I'm sure if I looked hard enough, it might take me 25 times as long, but I'm sure I can eventually learn it all. But I'd rather just pay you, tell me. You know, tell me what to do. Get the information, apply it. So that's what you're really paying for in general in life. You're paying for speed, you're paying for convenience, you're paying for it all in one place. So I was like, I mean, technically you will be learning a lot of new information. Yes, of course, you're gonna be talking to people every single day, but is there new information? Well, there's no new information under the sun. So no, technically it's all the same. It's just what you're really paying for is the access to all the people in the group, the support, the fact that you can ask a question at any time of the day, get instant responses, all these things. You're paying for one-on-one -on -one access to me, you're paying for all the meetups in real life, you're paying for all these things. And obviously lots of new information, answers to your business, potential business partners, all that stuff, meetups in your country, blah, blah, blah. But are you gonna find new information under the sun? No. He's like, bro, I was about on the edge, but like, that, 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 that's good. Because I was like, yeah, he didn't try and say, yeah, bro, we're gonna teach you the six secrets to make a million dollars. Like, no, there ain't no six secrets. So I just built a lot of trust with him because it made me seem like a real person who's actually giving him an honest answer. And when you do that, people are overall like, okay. Another thing, sometimes we're selling, man. Sometimes, especially if you've been selling something for a long time, like you can be too smooth, if that makes sense. Like a lot of the times with the whole boiler stuff, I was just becoming too smooth. Like I don't sell them myself. Like now we have a guy, we have a bunch of guys selling them for me. But like when I was doing it myself, I just became too smooth. So it's like, someone would ask me a question, I'll make one point, one point, lead it to this point. Like I knew every small, tiny micro detail. But then I realized like, I'm sounding like I'm a fucking scammer almost because I'm sounding too good. Yeah. Why would I be that smooth? Like, do I not have a bit of pausing, um, stuttering? So I kind of just ended up like developing this strategy where sometimes I just stutter more kind of go, um, more when I knew the answer, just to make myself seem more human. Sometimes I'd call my sales manager in the middle of a, in the middle of a conversation with a guy at the door. And I'm like, excuse me, bro, like, you're just on speaker at the moment, man. I'm just at the door right now with Sarah and she's telling us, she's asking like, why is the boiler new? Or how does, what, how many years of a guarantee does it come with? Or what material is the underfloor insulation made of? Blah, 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 blah. Yeah, so blah, 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 blah. Then you'd answer the question. I was like, oh, look. And then the reason why it was good is because then Sarah would be like, oh, wow, like they solved the problem. Right, you solve the problem, you called someone, you got an instant response. Then the guy on the phone could say, yep, I'm the manager, I'm just in the office. Hassan's a good salesman, he's only been here for like a few weeks though, that's why he didn't know the answer to this. And then after the call, yeah, sorry, I didn't know that, it's just I'm still learning on the job. Um, I'm kind of new to this, I've only been doing a few shifts a week, but these are all the pictures I got on my phone. You know, just tie it back, tie everything back together. It just builds so much trust because at the end of the day, if you have a product that's worth buying, you should be doing anything it takes to get people to buy it, anything, because it's amazing. You see what I'm saying? So it's your duty to sell things because I see a lot of times people are very like scared to promote something. They're scared to sell a certain thing. Why? If it's gonna help people, why? People are like, bro, you talk about new money a lot. It's helped 900 people. <laughs> like we make business, like we have businesses together now. Like Fahim as well, I've invested in Fahim. I don't think I mentioned, did I mention that? I don't think so. Not this time. Not this podcast. But um, I've invested in Veeam as well. He has an e-com store as well. Suave Essences, like a fragrance company. So, you know, it's just, there's so many ways you can just make money talking to other people. That's like, of course I'm gonna promote it all the time. I had a hundred, oh, we had like 110 people come to Warsaw, but 75 people came to the Dubai event, 75. 75 people. A lot of people messaged me after the event, like, bro, that was so fucking amazing. Like, I learned a lot. Thank you for hosting it. I appreciate your time. I'm happy you got to answer these questions. Because even seeing someone in life, in real life, like when I pulled up in the Lambo to the yacht, people got to see the Lambo. Like, oh shit, Hassan does have a Lambo. And a McLaren, and a Euros, and a Harab. I'm joking, I'm joking, I'm joking. But um, when you see it in real life, it just hits different, it feels different. When you get to speak to someone who's got all these things that you want, it's like, shit, Hassan's just a normal guy. Like, I am a normal guy. Just I worked hard for a few years and very aggressively, and now I'm in this position. So I think it just humanizes you as well when you just meet people in real life, but. Yeah, completely. Like if you've spoken to someone online, watched a video of someone doing X or whatever, it's, it's cool, but then you meet them in person, it makes it seem much more achievable, like way more achievable. If you met Cristiano Ronaldo, 
in real life and you spoke to him for 10 seconds, you'd be like, whoa, Ronaldo. If you spoke to him for 10 minutes, you'd be like, Ronaldo, he's a nice guy. He's fucking, he's, that was cool. An hour. All right, a day. A week. So, oh, Ronaldo's cool, but like, I've seen how hard he works. If I worked that hard, I could do that. Like, it humanizes them. Even Ronaldo, arguably the greatest footballer ever. You know? And that's Ronaldo. Like, familiar, familiarity, you know, just kind of makes you feel like, I can do that as well. So you want to expose yourself to all these things. When you see a Bugatti outside the gym, I can completely imagine myself in a few months not having a Bugatti. I've seen it in the gym. Like, someone else had it, and I heard the guy was young. Like, I'm going to have one. It's just so normal, a Bugatti. What's a Bugatti, bro? It's nothing. I know another guy in Dubai called Mooncarl. He's a crypto guy. Yeah. He has a Bugatti. What the fuck's a Bugatti? So I'm not even a one of one. Everyone's got a Bugatti. You're broke if you don't got a Bugatti. But that's how I feel now. Like we're in Dubai. In Obviously, Dubai. I'm exaggerating a little bit, guys. I'm just saying that, you know, you just got to expose yourself to certain things. Do you want me to ask you more sales questions? Because I feel like you have a lot of... Yeah, ask a couple of other ones. There's a lot of sales stuff. Ask me more sales questions. I was going to say you guys asked me one. I thought I was on a live stream for one second, but nah. Like, ask me something else. Like, what? Because remember, I was... I was teaching Craig actually how to sell a little bit for another kind of business we have. And at the beginning, you weren't the best. But then you very quickly became much better, right? Like, you're much, much better now. Because for so long, like, Craig's just been doing e-com. Like, I'm, I don't know nothing about e-com, so Craig at least can do both, which is great. But I'm saying, like, he was just focused on that building skill set of, like, just building, like, builder, and they kind of come to you. He's not used to kind of, like, attacking the customer, if that makes sense. But now he's become very, very good. So, you, well, you certainly made a lot of progress. So, what do you think is like the biggest things you've learned in sales? And then maybe that can lead to another question for me after. A lot of the confidence stuff works super well. It's like just believing in your own ability, believing in, um, believing in your own ability and speaking, speaking well. And then I think it's just kind of maneuvering around the certain situations that you're put in, right? The certain questions, just thinking on the fly. I think a lot of it's experience, right? As, as long as you get the experience within it, that's what's helped me a lot, personally. Everything's experience, man. Everything. I remember in, I had a part-time job in my gap year in Debenhams, like a retail store. And I remember the, the manager thought I was a dickhead. She didn't like, like, we just didn't get along well. We were always arguing, like, shut up. Like, uh. Anyway, because she always, she put me in, like, the women's change room. It's some bullshit job. I was always on my phone. She's like, you can't go on your phone. I was like, fuck, there's no one here. It's not, it's not nice if a customer sees you. So one day, I was like, I'm a genius. I'm going to go at the back of the change room. Lock myself in the room. Or not even lock myself in the room, just close the door. I'm fine. And then what obviously ended up happening is she came through the change room. I was like, where's Hassan? Went to the back of the change room. Saw me on my phone. Oh, I was like, fuck, like, it's not what it looks like. I had to call my mom, but she, there's an emergency. Like, uh. <laughs> chat shit, chat shit. She's like, Hassan, just stop being an idiot. Go back, just go to the chain room. Anyway, we kind of had this dynamic for a while. She just didn't really like me. I didn't really like her. And then one day she was like, Hassan, just start handing out these credit cards in real life. It's like these store cards. Get people to sign up to these store cards. Tell people why they should buy these store cards. And then it's just basic sales stuff going to talk to people. And she was like, yeah, because you talk a lot and because you're confident, you're gonna do well at this. And like, even that, that was like technically a sales job. I was just trying to hand out these cards and get people to sign up and all these things. So it's like, yeah, experience. The more things you sell, the better you're gonna become at sales. It's really not rocket science, you know? So I think experience trumps everything. So I've done that as well. But I've never had a nine to five job. A lot of people might be thinking, Hassan, like, what's your story and shit? Because we haven't, it's hard to say everything in one podcast. I'm trying to say like so many things, but like, I've got a million stories, that's why. I'm doing well, it's just I've just done a lot of things, but I've never had a nine to five job. I never thought I wanted a nine to five job. I always thought to myself like, that's fucking shit. Like, I don't want one, so I'm not gonna have one. Because a lot of people, they say, oh, I don't want a nine to five job, but you still work nine to five jobs. Well, then you're lying, you don't, you, you, you are okay with a nine to five job. Because if you didn't want a nine to five job, you couldn't, no, 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 let me rephrase that. You guys don't want nine to five jobs, I agree with that. I couldn't have a nine to five job. There's a difference. I couldn't have it. So the retail job, that was a nine to five, part-time. Door-to-door sales job, part-time. Yeah, it was a lot of hours, but I could choose the hours. I could choose the hours. I could be in bed till two in the afternoon. Sometimes I just get out of bed, hop in the Volkswagen, go to work. 2.30 till 7.30 shift. In the winter, it'd be raining, windy, whatever, got it done. 
was an idea or should have done in the daylight. The point is, I could choose my own, so I had freedom. I felt like I was winning. So even though I got kicked out of uni, I always felt like I was, I kind of felt rich before I had money because even when I was working the sales job, although I was broke, I kind of felt like I got my own freedom. I can do what I want to a degree. I could just turn up when I want. Like I always liked the idea of freedom. I just never had a 95 job. I always thought I don't need one. Because you can get almost the same amount of money working a pretty high amount of hours, zero, like you can choose your contract. Zero hour contract, I think they're called. Did you always want to not have a 95 yeah, job? Yeah, always. Even when I like, wanted to be a doctor when I was younger, I wanted to be a doctor at one point, I just thought I would be a doctor, be the best doctor and just do what the fuck I want. Yeah, yeah, G, I'll fix you a heart surgery. Like fucking, like, like let's cut you up, G. Like cut, 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 put a new heart in you. Fixed. How much? 50 G. Yeah, yeah, I'll take that. 50 G is what? Six hours work, 50 G? Good. That's kind of how I thought. I was always like, I don't need to do a 9 to 5. And then people would always say to me, be realistic. Like, yeah, it's easy to say that when you're in school and you're in uni because life's good for you now. And I was always like, no, like, what are you? Oh, you're a retard. I always used to just think. It's interesting because I've made this point so many times in my Telegram channel. In school, everyone's basically the same. Do you agree? Basically the same. Maybe you like playing with Yu-Gi-Oh cards. I like playing Xbox. Everyone kind of wants to be similar, I suppose. Not just that, but it's like you go to school at nine, whatever. You finish school at like three or four. We have the same homework. We have parents telling us that you shouldn't do crazy things in the middle of the week. You should focus on school. We have parents saying, like, go to bed. And we have parents saying, wake up. Or we have to catch a bus, we have to catch a train, or we're getting taken to school. We have a similar life, right, in school. But then when you leave school, the gap starts widening. Because after school, some people go to uni. Some people have a job. Some people do an apprenticeship. The gap gets wider. Certain people's good habits start compounding, compounding, compounding. Some people are still smoking weed, smoking loads of cigarettes a day. Like, they're not compounding much. But the people like me who just work and work and work, and the gap just got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And it's like, now the gap's like this. But then at 30, the gap's even bigger. At 30, the gap's huge. Because think about like how successful you're gonna be at 30. Yeah, it's crazy. Like, it's eight years. And like a lot of your friends, or a lot of your old friends from school, they'll be making the same amount as now. Just maybe a 5K increase. Yeah, maybe like 10, 20% if they're well, fortunate. To counter the inflation, which will even be higher. Yeah, so they're actually, poor, they're actually poorer, yeah. which is very crazy to think. But that's just the reality. So I always kind of just thought, that's all bullshit, man. I knew a 95 wasn't for me. But when I said 95 wasn't for me, I meant like, I would rather be homeless than have a 95. And I said this many times on Twitter. I've retweeted this a lot. And people say, no, you're joking. Like, you don't actually mean that. You should see how homeless people live. And I say like, no, you don't understand what I'm saying. I'm saying, if I was homeless, I'd say to Craig, give me some money. <laughs> I need to book a flight to Thailand. Or I mean, it's obviously a bad example now because Craig just let me sleep around his fucking apartment, whatever. But I'm saying, say I lost everything. I didn't have any friends. I'd somehow get a few hundred pound book a flight. I have a passport, I'm lucky I live in England, the passport's strong, whatever, whatever. Book a flight to Thailand, just get to Thailand. I mean, you can be homeless and still have a little bit of money, right? I'm saying like, nowhere to live, I ain't got much going for me, right? A lot of you guys have a few hundred pounds in your bank. I would rather just go to Thailand and Bali, live somewhere cheap, than just work a nine to five job. Now, there's nothing really wrong with a nine to five job if you have a very big plan what you're gonna do with it. The reason why I never, the reason why I never wanted to get into nine to five was because I didn't know like, I don't want to be stuck there. Like, I just felt like it was a trap. So I just told myself, like, you know, I'm not going to work the job. I'm just going to learn sales. I'm just going to get that experience. I mean, actually, no, let me, I guess you could say that when I was going to, when I was applying for that supermarket job, I guess that would have been 95 or maybe it would have been night shift. I don't know. But then even though, like, that was very short term. So maybe I was going to actually work at night. Nine to five for a very, very short period of time, maybe. I mean, I never really had a proper nine to five. The nine to five I did have, I was still 17 and it was an apprenticeship, so. I, That's when you're doing the videos for the. Yeah. Like I, well, that was a bit after, cause that was like after my 18th birthday, I could leave education in the UK because you have to stay in education till you're 18. So rather than sixth form, I just did that instead. But it's interesting that you haven't had any of that kind of thing. You have that mentality. Just yeah, because a lot of people say to me, like, a lot of people say to me that, like, oh, if you haven't had, like, a proper job, you're kind of stuck up. You know what I mean? You, haven't, you don't know what it's like to work. 
But it's like I did a door to door sales job, but I think that's like the hardest job I, I think can door to door sales because it's commission only as well. Like if you're just dicking around in fucking Debenhams, like you're still getting paid per yeah. hour. Whereas if you're dicking that around in door to door, like you're just not getting anything at all. But I always try and look at the pros of each situation. Like I remember in Debenhams, there was this girl uh, that I started dating, and then she had like a twin sister as well. So they were pretty cool. You know, it's like. It just made it fun. Like just talking to some girl, then we just started dating. It's like, all right, there's a small pro out of that. And I was in the gap here, it was fun. But it's like, if I just sat there like, okay, my situation's shit. Cause they put me in the women's section, the women's change room. So I was just on that side of the saw, the women's side. Like I was like the only guy. It was like the manager was just a cunt because she hated me. She said fucking women's. But it actually turned out good because I was just talking to all the chicks. Fucking bitch. So yeah, man, you just gotta always look at the pros, man. That's what I think. But yeah, I think we've extended that point like a million times. <laughs> yeah. To not even on about now, but I next, just don't want to. Next five. question, we can change change it up a bit. Um, obviously. Also, can they can they see the Rolex? Rolex. I mean, AP. AP. Guys, can you see that? Like, are you understanding what you're looking at right now? Put some respect on this. <laughs> so we're on to the last couple questions now. What makes you? trust me over other guys that you've met obviously old friends from school or just any people in general obviously we've done a lot of business together doing a lot of future business lots of future plans yeah i think it's a combination of things like even you coming to that the first meetup in london with the new money boys that helped for sure because you got the train down for three hours and it was a short meetup for only one hour you know you were saying some good things there and i remember like fahim spoke to you more at that meetup than me and he was saying, yeah, he seems super smart and all that kind of stuff. So that was cool. And then obviously you were messaging about the Dubai residency before you joined your money. So that shows that you were planning on living in Dubai. I was planning on living in Dubai, so that's cool as well. But yeah, it's just a combination of lots of little things as well. Obviously, like you're always trying to help out in your money as well. That helps out a lot. You, you know, you're trying to give everyone in the group game on e-com, Etsy, all these kind of things. So all these things massively helped. And then, yeah we met in Dubai and then actually when you start talking to people all the time, you're just going to start trusting them more. But it was mainly like the fact that you knew what you're actually talking about. Like so many econ guys out there, are like those fake gurus that like know nothing. But you obviously knew what you were talking about. And like you showed me certain things from 2018 when you're like, what was it? Phase what? I don't want to say the wrong thing. Like, Oh, like influencers like Bella Thorne and Phase. You get, yeah. Like a super people, famous yeah. influence, like buying his, what was it? Um, you can't say that one. Can't say that one. <laughs> yeah. So you, yeah. So he was just selling some products, super famous influencers bought his product, he was showing me the pictures of it and all that kind of stuff. And he said like that hustler energy, it was good. I think that. Yeah. It's just a combination of little things. Yeah, it's hard to say, it's, it's a hard question things, to answer. Yeah. It's a very hard question to answer. Yeah. Next question I have is, you have very strong beliefs around certain things, you have very strong opinions around certain things. If someone doesn't have many strong beliefs or strong opinions, how do you, kind of achieve this how do you kind of get this you can't think you can't you can't. <laughs> you can't you need you need self-belief for sure because i remember hearing this one someone said if someone doesn't buy from you in business it's not only because they don't trust you or the product it's also that they might not trust themselves and i remember thinking to myself wow that's actually super smart if you have bought from three personal trainers before a product on a program on how to get in shape and you've never followed it through and i say i'm gonna help you get in shape is the fourth program you're going to be like, oh, I like Hassan. I feel like here we'll have a good workout program, but I'm not sure if I'm going to stick to it, right? So that will be the objection. And then I need to work out how do I handle that objection? Listen, Mark, the reason why, you know, you might have failed with workout programs before, but the reason why this workout program is different is because we have three accountability coaches every single Friday. There's like a two hour accountability call. They're going to help you. Any complaint, any problem you have will be personally addressed by me, blah, 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 blah. We'll also make sure that you're eating the right foods because every Monday we have a live call on Zoom where we run over what foods you should be buying for the week. We go over how to make them tasty because I'm guessing, Mark, your problem in the past is you've not been able to eat clean food. That's why you've not made gains or you're not eating the right food. You've put on too much weight because you reverted back to pizza because you didn't like the food that you're eating. You didn't like the chicken and rice, the salmon, the broccoli, this and that. But we have very good recipes. We're gonna give those recipes to you included in the program so then you're gonna stick with the diet. Mark's going to be thinking, okay, that's right. The other three programs I bought didn't have much about diet. I couldn't eat tasty food. That's why I, I couldn't keep up. I was training, I was going to gym, but I wasn't seeing gains and that's what made me stop. It was just the diet. I know it was the diet. This guy's saying he's going to help me with the diet because they're going to keep me accountable. And yeah, exactly, Mark. Of course, we're going to keep you accountable. And also what's going to happen is that there are going to be cash prizes for the person who makes the best gains. The person who sticks to his diet the best is going to be 
publicly noted inside of the the group or inside of the community or inside of whatever, depending on if it's whatever, you know? All these kind of things are gonna make Mark think, okay, I can stick to the diet more. Because he doesn't trust himself. It's not a problem with what you're selling. A lot of the times, like even within New Money, people say me, send me messages saying, Hassan, I, knew, I know New Money is amazing, but it's just, I'm very busy right now. I don't have the time. I'm like, bro, you don't need that much time because you can spend half an hour a day on the group, going through the materials, listening to a few minutes of the live call, all these kind of things. And then as time goes on and you start, and you start seeing like tangible results, tangible improvements, then you can just start spending more time on the group and less time on your uni degree, less time on things that don't matter, your job, because you're making more money online now. So it's just about handling different objections, but yeah, you have to have self-belief. Like, because a lot of the times, like people just don't believe in themselves and don't get anywhere. That's obviously self-belief in regards to selling, but self-belief in terms of making money and becoming successful yourself. Bro, if you don't have self-belief, you have nothing. You have literally nothing. You have zero chance of becoming successful, zero. And again, the best thing you can do is hang around people who believe in themselves. If you hung around me and Craig all the time, you're gonna be like, all right, it's not that hard to make someone. Yeah, yeah. It's really not, is it? No, it's not. I think I see a lot of people online, they have this crazy ego just making a bit of money. Like, you guys should realize by now after this podcast, like a lot of the stuff I do on Twitter is just for show, it's a joke, you know? I mean, I do own the supercars, I do own the watches, I do actually have money, but I'm saying it's for show in the sense of like, I don't actually speak like that in real life to be like, hey, I have five supercars. You know, it's for show, it's to get attention online. At the end of the day, it's like people like Craig join you money because I was a bit showy. Yeah. Even Craig's friend, uh, Ola, you were telling me that Ola asked, like, is he actually quite showy? And yeah, yeah, people always ask that. Yeah. Like, is Hassan actually showy in real life? Of course not. Like, offline, I'll never mention it to anyone. Like, if you ask me, I'll tell you. But yeah. I don't just go around telling people, putting it in their face. So. That'd be fucking weird, yeah. Like, you see very humble, weird. very different, yeah. So... Yeah, you just have to believe in you just have to believe in yourself to sum it up. Yeah. But I think it helps if you have a good upbringing. Like if everyone in your life has always been poor and always been a loser and no one's ever accomplished anything, it's hard to just tell yourself like, I'm gonna be. Rich. I'm able to do something. I'm able to break out of it. Yeah. You know. Super super difficult. Next question I have, a little bit of a different one. If you could live in any time period, which time period and why? Now for sure. Now is the best time period. A lot of people say, yeah, Hassan, like, it'd be so cool to live in this time period and that time period. Because people say that to me, like, bro, do you actually think it's the best time to live? Because you, I see your tweet about, yes, bro, if I tweeted it, I'm like, I, I meant it, bro, like I said it. Yes, of course, because nowadays you have so many opportunities. Like, right now, you're one DM away from anybody on the planet. We just said there's 8 billion people on the planet earlier. You can speak to anybody of those 8 billion people. Like that. That's pretty cool. Like, why would I want to go see some dinosaurs that probably yeah. didn't exist? And fuck that shit. <laughs> dinosaurs that probably didn't exist. Dinosaurs didn't exist. <laughs> okay. Fuck. <laughs> okay. I'm going to gloss straight over that one. I'm I'll make a video on Twitch I'm about like, that one. I'm going to gloss straight over fucking that one. Okay. The last question. The last question. What's the best advice you've ever received? The best advice I ever received was from the big G. Tate, and Tate said, make it real. Whenever you had an idea, Tate would just say, make it real. Oh, bro, I want to start a podcast, make it real. Oh, bro, I want to buy a new car, make it real. Oh, I want to talk to this girl, make it real. Whatever you say, whatever fucking idea you have, make it real. And I respect that a lot. That's a sick, sick piece of advice. Oh, I want to get into real estate. Make it real. Turn it from here into actual reality. Make it real. I love that quote. It actually gets me pumped up a bit. It's like, it's so fucking true. Like, I had a vision. I wanted to do all these things. Now I'm in Dubai with all these things. People say, oh, how does it feel? It feels exactly how I thought it'd feel. Like, I knew I was going to have them, so I already had them. How does it feel buying the Lambo? I already had the Lambo in my mind. I just made it real. It was in my, it was in my mind, but now I just made it real. All right? That's it. All you're doing is just bringing things from your imagination into real life. You're just making it real. That's it. You might be like, Hassan, what are you on about? Like, just making it real. You had an idea, you wanted to drop out of college. You had, an, you, had, like, you had a vision that you wanted to get into e make money online. You made it real. Yeah, Instead of talking about it, saying, I want to do it. I maybe want to do it. You just made it, you started working towards making it real. And it's like, that's a good thing to say to your friends whenever they're saying something like, I want to do this, just say, make it real. Like, you're either going to do it or you're not, right? Guys. If you're trying to join new money, you know where to find me. DM me on Telegram or DM me on Twitter even. 
it's very, very easy to get a response from me. Don't message me on Instagram because there's hoes and there's other people and it's just mixed in. Like I'd rather it just, Telegram is completely for dudes. Twitter is completely for dudes. Right? Message me there. Don't message me on fucking Instagram. Be like, yo, gee, I was just wondering about your life story and life opinion. Fuck off, man. Message me on Telegram. Message me on Twitter. If you say, if you ask me about new money, I'm going to reply to you. I'm going to talk to you. That's all I'm interested in. I've said this many, many times. The reason why I'm on social media is to grow my private community. It's going to get crazy. This is just the beginning. This is my first podcast I've done. It's kind of weird doing a podcast compared to a voice note because Craig's just asking me shit questions. Obviously, his fault. But on my voice note, I can just speak about what's in my mind. It's just off the top of my head. But here it's like fucking random questions. It's like weird just talking about all these different topics. I like doing 45 minutes on one topic, no interruptions. Craig obviously cut me off too many times. I didn't fucking interrupt. I'm joking. <laughs> one. I'm joking. But yeah, that's basically it, man. Um, DM me if you're trying to join your money. To sum it up, it's my private community. Craig's in it. A bunch of other cool people are in it. It's so easy to meet potential future business partners inside of New Money, especially if you're from Europe, you're from Canada, America, and Australia. These are the best countries to be in. Obviously, Europe's not a country. These are the best places to be in if you're trying to join New Money because there's so many people in these countries. It's so easy to network with the people inside the group. It's so easy to hop on the live calls every single day. It's so easy to do all that kind of stuff. Right? It's so easy. Sorry, guys. I have to reply to New Money Guy. I'll look at New Money's guy's message. See, look. Look what this guy said. Further proof about how smart I am. This guy said, I appreciate you taking the time to listen to my situation, bro, even though I'm one out of 900 in the group. Business lesson. Let's extend this podcast. Business lesson is the following. People want to feel appreciated. People want to feel special. The reason why nobody can ever compete with me with the group we have is because I understand these business lessons on a completely different level. I understand them on a fundamental level that people don't understand them. People are lazy. They're like, oh, I have a group or I have a course, or I have this product, or I'm a personal trainer, I have this, I have this e-com store, oh, customer's complaining, customer's a bit confused, fuck them, we have a loads of customers, oh, fuck them, uh, like, who cares? I take the time to personally Zoom call people, I'm a multi-millionaire, I'm on a Zoom, what time is it? It's 4.45 in the morning, so when I must have spoken to that guy, it must have been 4.30 in the morning. Pause the podcast to talk to this guy. You know, so it's like, that's the difference. If you want to actually make it to the top, you have to take everything seriously. You can't fuck around. So I'm always on my phone. I'm always responding to messages. That's how you get to the top. Anyway, to go back to the new money point. The reason why new money is so strong is you've just seen it. If you have any criticism for the group, constructive criticism, I'll work on improving it. We're already going to make more improvements to help this guy out further. I already feel like we've done enough, but fuck it. If he wants a bit more help, fuck it. What does it cost me? A bit of time and energy? Maybe there's other people in the group who want more help in that certain area. Always look to improve things. Always look to just get better and better and better. That's kind of my mindset in business and that's how I've got to this position. But yeah, man, to sum up new money, Europe, Canada, America, all these places for sure. And Australia for sure is a big group. But yeah, if you're trying to make money online and you're a young guy, there's no other, there's no other product or community on the planet that gets remotely fucking close. Not even remotely close. Because... The level of access you get is ridiculous. It's 4.30 when that guy messaged, 4.30. And now it's like 4.50 in the evening, in the morning. And I'm replying to him like this. Like this, like this, like this, like this. If you have any question about anything, you're gonna get helped. If you have a question about e-com, Craig will help you. If you have a question about sales, I'll help you. If you have a question about copywriting, Ronaldo will help you. If you have a question about this, this person will help you. A lot of people say as well, like, how is it different than the real world and all this kind of stuff? I don't think you can compare it to the real world because the real world, it's got like 200 something times the people, two, 300 times the people. It's very different. That's like a Discord server. This is like a private community. It's very, very different. Discord is like more general information and kind of like you have less access. Whereas New Money, you literally have access to the guy who runs the group, right? So it's very, very different. And what other, what other questions do I get usually about it? That's pretty much it, I feel. If you guys want to join, you can send me a DM. That's basically, I hope you guys enjoyed. I'm going to start doing way more podcasts. And then Craig, do you have anything to say, G? Um, follow me on Twitter. That's a good place to reach me. I talk a lot about e-commerce, things like that as well. And that's about it. I think this podcast has been very long. Lo so much value inside of it. And if you guys have any recommendations for the podcast, any recommendations for extra questions, any recommendations for absolutely anything, put them in the comments on this YouTube video right here or put them on Twitch or something less. Best place is the YouTube comment section. And yeah, 
hope everyone is doing well and I'll we'll see everyone later. That's it, boys.